Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the RSC's Islands Past event today. And thank you for joining us at Salma Rostig. And welcome also to those joining online. Today's event is the first instalment of RSC activity, which is planned for the Highlands and Islands in partnership with UHI and HIE. Just a few housekeeping points before I hand over to Professor Chris Watley to introduce today's event. So for attendees here at Salma Rostig, we're not expecting any fire alarms. Therefore, if it does occur, please follow the fire exit signs in the room and um, assemble in Block C car park. Also, a reminder that today's event is being live streamed and recorded and will be available on the RSC website in due course. And finally, if anyone has any questions about any of the event today, please just ask a member of the RSC's public engagement team and we'll be happy to help you. And I'll just hand over to Chris to let you know about what's actually going to be happening today. Thank you. Thanks, Kate, um, and welcome to everybody. This is, a, this is a really significant event for the RSE. I don't know how many of you know what the RSE is, but the Royal Society of Edinburgh is the Scotland's National Academy, basically. Um, it was founded um, many years ago in the late 18th century, uh, 240 years ago, for the, and its purpose was the advancement of learning and useful knowledge. And the modern mission of the RSE remains uh, just that, and in fact, to provide independent advice, um, expert advice to policymakers and to inspire the next generation of uh, innovative thinkers. And that, in fact, is this, that mission, reflect, or this event today reflects very much that mission, um, because we put this program together, this, this, this idea of islands past, present and future, um, because A, the RSE, as you can see from today, is trying to get out of Edinburgh and out of the central belt and develop relationships with other organisations, including UHI and SMO here. And I should say, should I not, that it's the 50th anniversary, is it not, of this college this year. So ca congratulations, happy birthday and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and that. But, but the, the idea behind this um, session, to this, this, this series of past, present and future in terms of islands is that what was distinctive about the northwest region of Scotland, which we're trying to develop relations with and we are effectively developing relations with, um, the, the, islands, the islands of course are central to that part of Scotland and we thought we could build a useful program which looked at the past, which looked at the problems and issues concerned with the islands right now and look at the future and perhaps inform policy um, for the future because I, I know there's a whole lot of work going on in terms of islands, in terms of research. The Scottish Government has a, has, a, has a policy or a strategy, but we thought we could maybe contribute to all of that. So that's why we're here today and uh, I hope you do enjoy the day. Um, Becky and Kate have worked very, very hard on putting the programme together. Looks a great programme um, and I hope it, it manifests as such. Okay, I'll hand over to Becky. Thank you. Thank you. So our first speaker today is Professor Chris Watley, uh, Emeritus Professor of Scottish History at the University of Dundee. Chris has written on a wide range of Scottish historical, uh, sorry, historical topics. These include book-length histories of the salt industry and Scotland's Industrial Revolution, as well as challenging studies of Scottish society during this period. He is best known for his award-winning book and papers on the Union of 1707 and for his study of the legacy of the national poet Robert Burns. His most recent book is his acclaimed Pabay, an Island Odyssey, which is in part of a, a personal account, but also a serious history of a small island where he spent much of his boyhood. And today, Chris will talk about his book. Thank you. Thanks very much, Becky. Um, okay, um, I thought that as we're kicking off uh, what's going to be a series of three events, I should begin small and modestly and informally. Um, that is, I don't have a serious, heavy-duty academic paper in front of me. I have some pictures, and I'm going to talk my way through those pictures. It's, this is a very small island, Pabby. Um, you, you, you will see it, if you, those of you who drive north. Well, you all have to drive north unless you're going back via Armadale, but um, up into Broadford and on the bay, in the bay there, you will see the island of Pabby. It's a very small island, um, but I think it, uh, it's a way into talking and thinking about islands, past, present, and, and future. And I'll, so I'm going to begin um, very modestly, and by the end of the talk, I hope to try and draw some conclusions which might be of greater significance. So, um, why write about Pabby? Well, 
I have always been reluctant to, as Becky kindly talked about some of my publications, I've always been reluctant to write Highland Islands history um, for a variety of reasons. One, because I don't know if you have read Hugh McDermott on, on this, but he uh, said he had no patience, talking about island history, no patience with the Ola Hodridra of old wives' tales, day trippers, ecstasies, and trite moralizings, mawkish sentimentality, supernatural fancies, factual spinach, and outrageous banality, which fills most books on this subject. That's Hebridean islands. Um, and uh, actually, there's some truth in that, and I do read books of that nature still, but I'm hoping the one I did is a bit different, but, 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 but maybe not. And of course, I was concerned too with, with Roger Hutchison's um, comment in the West Highland Free Press some, some two or three years, or maybe four or five years ago, that there was little more to be discovered on Scotland's islands. So I thought, I wonder if there really is. Anyway, you'll see uh, if I can, t today, if I can tell you something new. Now, at one level, too, there's huge similarities with, in, in terms of Scotland's islands. In terms of the trajectories through history, there's the Mesolites, there's early Christians. You know, most islands will have seen, or many islands will have seen, Mesolithic um, settlers, if you like, and travellers. Many islands will have been associated with early Christianity. There's the Norse invasions, there's the Lords of the Isles and the clans, there's transition to landlordism, there's clearance, there's rich men's playgrounds, population loss, especially of the smaller islands. And, and you know, you can, you can see that in many, many places. But despite this, um, the fact is that islands aren't the same. Um, they're different in all sorts of respects, geologies, geographies, locations, and so on. And the and islands have long fascinated me. As you'll see in a minute, I, I've been fascinated by islands since I was three years of age. Um, and so what Pabby I've written about, and it's unique. It's very, very different from, the, from, from many of the other Scottish uh, islands. It's flat, it's low lying. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Long fascinated me. And it does reveal some universal issues about islands. But I have to confess that my way into this book was not through serious academic inquiry, but it was because of a promise I made to my late Auntie Margaret. Now, my Auntie Margaret, um, Margaret Whatley, Margaret McKinnon, because she, she, she married Charlie McKinnon up in, in Waternish. Uh, my Auntie Margaret, uh, as you'll see on the left there, was a, was a knitter, uh, made knit, knitting uh, up in, up in Waternish, up in Dunhallen, and there's where she did her knitting. That's sadly the cottage that she worked in uh, as it is nowadays. However, my aunt um, was not always a Waternish lady. She came from the Midlands of England as a very young woman with her husband and two young children uh, and settled on the then uninhabited island of Pabby. Um, now, it was a fascinating and amazing life she had. Uh, what a transformation. But towards the end of her life, I would talk to her as she was knitting away, and she had me convinced about what a wonderful story she had to tell in terms of her own life. And I was con convinced, and I s promised her that I would write a book about her. But I couldn't write a book about her because I was a full-time academic, and I was had to respond to things like the research assessment exercises and all the rest of it and do serious academic work, which only 12 people would read. But nevertheless, I was committed to that kind of thing because the institution insisted. But once I took uh, reti retirement, I began to work on uh, making or bringing to life this promise, if you like. And so, in a sense, we wouldn't be here today without this woman because this woman got to Pabby I wrote the history of Pabby, and, it's in the, and that's one of the inspirations for running this, putting on this series. So, Margaret McKinnon, God bless you. Um, now, Pabby is on, in the Inner Sound, um, uh, as you all know. It's, uh, do, we have, do we find a pointer? No. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You, if you, could, you can see there that, that Pabby is in the lower, lower right-hand side of the picture there. It's a very small island off, um, off Sky. Um, and so there we are, and you can see there a picture of it low-lying, very low-lying, and 
That is the island from Ben Nakalich, or Ben Nakalich, um, which sits behind Broadford. And you will see there that, that, that it is an interesting location, um, and that, in a sense, tells, it, it reveals some of its history. Um, not so much the, the, um, the, uh, the early part of the history, but the, 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 the Viking part of it, if you like, because that island sits in the sound and was on the route which Norsemen, if you like, took uh, on their way south to through Kalakin and then down to the Isle of Man and Ireland and, and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it, it long had a, a strategic uh, location. Um, I should have probably said something about the, 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 the name Paddy, Papa, where the, the, that's a Gaelic, uh, Irish, Norse um, name for um, father, chief, um, mainly associated with priests or re re religious com communities. So there's a number of papas, there's a number of pa, uh, prefixes pa around the, around the Western Isles, and usually these denote Christian sites of some sort. And so Pabi was a place where pretty sure that, that at one time there were holy men and women and, or Emirates w w w w there. Now the point I wanted to make about these islands being different is this. There's, they, we've just shown you Pabi. There's a scalpy which sits next to Pabi. Um, and it's, 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 it's look, there's a, a, a tree-lined driveway up to the house. There's, there's high hills. Um, and there's another a very different uh, island, which is north of Pabi, nor north of Skye, actually, Lord MacDonald's Table, which is just simply a, a lump of rock, but a wonderful place to go because the bird life is quite in incredible. Um, so there is a, a, a Berlin, that's the sort of boat that was, that was, that was, that was used in these parts of the world uh, through certainly up to the end of the, the 17th century and perhaps beyond. But let me get to, back to Pabi. Um, there is a map of sky in, from 1776, and you can get a, this takes us into another aspect of the island's history. You'll see there that it's, it's, there's a lot of outcropping rocks there, and that, um, was, that is a feature of Pabi today. It's been a, a, a feature of Pabi, obviously, through all time, and it had advantages and it had disadvantages. In the 16th, 17th century, it was said that Pabi was uh, inhabited by robbers, thieves, uh, mercenaries who would come out to sea and um, take, take ships that were passing by um, and seize their goods and, and, and people and so forth. And then they would flee back onto the island. And the island at the time was fully wooded. Um, and the thing is that other seamen could not easily get back onto Pabi to, 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 to find these marauders because the, the, the rock systems round about Pabi are such that it's enormously difficult to get ashore there uh, safely. Um, and indeed some of the rocks around Pabi, as some of you will know, um, are not marked on, uh, on, on charts and so you can quickly, um, quickly get yourself into difficulties, as some people still do round about Pabi. Um, this is this is this is this is the remains of. So we've got we've got we've got we've got early Christians. We've got Norsemen. We've got um, we've got we've got um, marauders, if you want to call them that. And here we've got the remains of a settlement on Sky on Pabi, sorry, which um, was probably uh, deserted around the middle of the 19th century. On in the in 1851 census. There were four or five families on Sky, on, on Pabi, sorry, um, but ten years later there was only one family on, on, on Pabi, um, and in fact there was only one family on Pabi for a long, long time, and then the place was eventually uh, deserted in the Second World War when uh, two brothers um, were on the island. One of them was offered the job of um, factor on Scalpy, and the other brother wouldn't stay because you needed two men because he needed to help with the boat. So um, it became uninhabitable, as I say, or uninhabited. Now, um, as, as one of the th interesting and enduring themes about Pabi is this, that high hope. People thought it was a wonderful place to get to. And, and, I, and, and I know from, from my own family's uh, records, if you like, that my aunt and uncle were awfully excited when they saw Pabi. 
Um, and indeed, for many years, in many years in my life, it was an enticing place to, to look at from, from the shore because it always seemed to be green and fertile. And here's a, a map of the first, when the, 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 the island was owned, the, the clans, it was owned by Clan MacKinnon from the 15th century to the 18th century, it then went to the, the MacDonald clan. And Lords MacDonald at the end of the 18th century, as so many other landlords in this country did, uh, got involved in improving, the, improving their lands. Now, John Blackadder was a, a land surveyor from the Borders, and he uh, was asked to investigate or look at um, MacDonald lands on Sky and see the extent to which they could be improved. Now, Strath, which is the parish in which Pabby is part, he thought was the most improvable part of Sky, and Pabby, he thought, was the most improvable part of Strath. Um, and you'll see here, um, a, a very optimistic kind of plan. It says, you know, the middle section is improvable uh, moss. At the back, it's the, the top side is dry ground, already arable, some arable in the south. Um, uh, uh, but this main central bit he describes as being, um, as I say, improvable arable. Now, he said that in, in, in 1814. Um, and it's still improvable arable for reasons that I will explain. You'll see there some lines of, on, on, the, on, the, um, on the map. And those, there's some similar lines. This is a, this is a drawing from 1924. And Pabby is very low-lying. Um, it is very wet, therefore, and it is very, very hard, if not impossible, to drain. Blackadder, way back in 1814, said the only way in which this while this land is improvable, it is only improvable if you build or dig big ditches, deep ditches, 10 foot, 10 foot deep ditches, and keep them clean. Um, and that remained an issue, a challenge through all time, because keeping ditches and drains um, dry, or keeping them, keeping them clear of weeds and, and, and collapsing in on themselves is a labor-intensive task and there weren't ever many people on Pabby to do that work. And my uncle, um, who, as I, who we'll talk about in a little while, um, was similarly challenged by these ditches um, to the extent that eventually, the, 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 as, uh, this and a number of other factors broke his health. Um, he lost so many cows, cattle, who wandered into these ditches. And you may ask, well, why didn't you fence these ditches? Um, well, the reason, he did try, um, but the, the, the fact is that you cannot easily drive fence posts into deep peat. It's, 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 it's just very, very difficult. There's nothing to secure the things. And then there is hard rock on Pabby, some great basaltic dikes, but that's intense. That's equally difficult to, to, dr to drill through when you don't have drills, when you don't have electronic or pneumatic drills. Uh, to hand. So it's a very, very wet island, very, very difficult to drain, and that, 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 that um, was a problem through all times, I say. Um, now, Pabby appears on, on, on maps from the 16th century. It, it, well, it appears and it disappears. It's not of great consequence, I guess, at that period. But Pabby is discovered, uh, in inverted commas, by the outside world. Um, I, though it's obviously been discovered beforehand, but it was discovered and becomes part of, uh, becomes more prominent, uh, I guess, in, in British society, because in, in, the 1840, in 1844, the famous geologist Hugh Miller um, arrived on Pabby, uh, on the shores of Pabby, um, moored a boat and stayed there for a few hours, and he was stunned. And this, this was the golden age of of geological exploration. Geology was in its infancy as a discipline um, in the early 19th century, and Miller was one of the first of them. And he wrote this, that the petrifications on its shores would fill a museum. They rise by thousands and tens of thousands on the exposed places of its sea wash strata, standing out in bold relief like sculpturings on ancient tombstones. At once mummies and monuments, the dead and the carved memorials of the dead. Every rock is a tablet of hieroglyphics with an ascertained alphabet, every rolled pebble a casket, with old pictorial records locked up within. And it is true. When I was a boy on Pabby, um, my cousins and I would spend days, hours, days, collecting fossils. I don't know how much damage we did and whether, whether, whether modern-day um, academic uh, 
archaeologists and so forth would have approved our activities. We didn't mean any harm, but there was millions of them, and, and there still are, although you're, you're no longer allowed us to collect these things. Archibald Geeky fought, he was a, a, a pupil, if you like, of Miller, or Miller patronized him. He went to Pabby and described it as the most interesting square mile amongst the Western Isles skies, uh, Jurassic Island. In fact, I, I, I wrote this uh, piece a few, uh, a couple of years ago, claiming that Sky was, sorry, that Pabby was Sky's Jurassic Island, so rich in fossils, was it? Now, I'm not sure last night's speaker who, who was talking about Jurassic Sky and dinosaurs. I think, I think, I think Pabby's now been outshone by, by the dinosaurs. But, but, but at the time when, when, when we were exploring the, 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 the fossil, or sorry, when Miller and Geeky and all the rest, because every single major geologist in Britain in the 19th century went to Pabby at some time or other uh, and, and, and were basically knocked out. Um, the island was, uh, as I say, in the hands of the Lords Macdonald at this time, um, and that's, there's, there's Armadale Castle, called a castle, it's really not a castle, but um, the, the Macdonalds owned Pabby, and they used it, sorry, I've moved on, the, the Macdonalds used Pabby simply as a live larder. They, they grazed some sheep on it, they grazed some cattle on it, uh, they did something um, which, which, which I'll, I'll talk about, which was hugely regrettable, and that is they introduced rabbits to to, to the island, but they basically had one um, uh, family on it who provided at request, um, you know, we're, we're having guests next week, send us a cow from, 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 from Parry, please. So, so that was that. And then in 1895, Scalpy and Parry became, um, became something rather different. Now, I say Scalpy and Pabby, and I'm, con I'm conflating them because Pabby was part of what uh, McDonald, Lord MacDonald sold off as Scalpy Estate. And Scalpy Estate was basically Scalpy, um, Pabby, uh, Longy, and Gillamong, which were the four islands in a cluster uh, off, off, off Broadford Bay, really. Um, now, the first owner, uh, the first significant owner in terms of the modern period, if you like, was um, Sir Donald Curry. That's the, that's the family on the left. He's at the very back there. He was one of the most important men, one of the richest men in Britain. He was a major ship owner, did a lot of business, a whole lot of business with South Africa. Um, he was a friend of uh, Gladstone. He was, a, he was a liberal MP for Perthshire. And they bought Pub Scalpy Estate basically as uh, and this is not, there's no surprise here, as, as a hunting ground, basically. And Scalpy was to be set up with, he was going to grow, uh, raise Highland cattle on Scalpy, and he was going to um, turn the place over to shoot grouse and deer and all, all, all the rest of it. Pabby was to be used for shooting snipe, um, you know, when, 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 when they couldn't, when, well, Pabby was used for shooting snipe. They left um, just after the First World War, to the Curry family, as, as Sir Donald died. And then the island was taken over by Sir Henry Bell. Um, he's, the, he, he's, he's the character on the left here, and on the right, sorry. Sir Henry Bell was a major um, meat importer, ex, meat importer from Argentina, Argentina. And he, too, wanted to use the island for, um, for hunting purposes, although he had other interest in the sense that uh, he was very, very keen, uh, because he was in the meat business, to develop the rabbit business on Sky. And I'll come back to that in, in a minute. Now, um, I'm going to, this, this, is the, this, is the, this is Sir Donald Curry's uh, boat, um, the ILA, not the ILA that sank off Stornoway, but, but the, the predecessor of, of that ILA. This is their boat, this was the boat that sailed off Pabby and Scalpy in the, in, in the 1890s and early part of the 20th century. As you'll see uh, later on, we didn't use boats like that. But uh, there we are. Um, now, more modest arrivals are my lot. Um, that is my family, um, the, the, the Len, and, Len and Margaret Watley. My uncle um, 
In, they came to Skye in 1949, um, and in 1951, the local minister wrote his contribution to the old statistical account, the new statistical account of Scotland, the, the third statistical account. There's a, one in 1790s, another in 1840s, another in the 1950s. Basically, uh, from every part of Scotland, reports were sent in to, to, about the socioeconomic kind of conditions. And he uh, declared in 1951 that this uh, third statistical account writer that there are no, happily, there are no communists in this part of Scotland. Well, my uncle was called Lenin, and he had been, he had been born in 1919, and my folks who were very much on the, the Labour um, socialist side of things uh, named him Lenin, something he ran away from for the rest of his life because he found it was hard to be employed if you were called Lenin in Britain in the 1930s. Anyway, he, he um, to cut a long story short, um, my family came from, a, a, they, they were conscientious objectors in, in, in both wars. And um, my uncle had been sent to work on the land with German prisoner wars, prisoners of war during the, the, the Second World War. And he enjoyed that work. Uh, and he also, at the same time, wrote, read sorry, books by a dentist who had gone and settled on a very small island off Wales. And was kind of, we, we, we don't know this, and I wasn't able to interview my uncle because he died a long time ago. But we think that, or I think anyway, he was much influenced by that kind of idea. Anyway, he wanted to stay in, in, in land work, and he uh, took on a tenancy of a farm near Birmingham called Shawbrook. But it was a, a, a very, it was being, it was in very poor condition, as you can see here. They're trying to repair one of the one of the one of the buildings, and um, basically the the farm was being, you know, round the round the edges. It was being enclosed by by house building, basically, and it wasn't the sort of environment that he wanted to live in. Anyway, they went. He and my auntie went to uh, on a, it came to a holiday in, in Slate actually in 1949. They, they went. They saw Pabby, Went to see it. Um, he took us. Uh, uh, he dug uh, a, a bit of soil there, liked the look of it, and it was a very fine day, and it looked wonderful. It was green and sunny, green and grass looking, and all the rest of it. And um, it had been deserted um, since 1942. That didn't seem to matter to them. They were amazed at the state of the buildings, and so they decided they would go. They would come, and um, they did. Within months, they had up sticked and come. There were problems, they didn't have any money, um, it was a relatively poor, poor, poor background, um, but they came to Pabby in, the, in January 1950. Um, and there's a picture of them on, on their first crossing. Interestingly enough, uh, this, this is where the story I think is, it gets, it's fascinating, but it's also in, inspirational. He hadn't been on a boat other than he had done some uh, punting on, in Stratford. So he comes to Skye and has to, wants to live on an island and hadn't been to sea before. He came to Skye in January 1950 and that was just after a huge storm, which meant that, it, it, that there were no boats free on Skye. Those that, were, that had been around a few weeks earlier were wrecked. Uh, and those people who had boats weren't prepared to sell them, or if they were prepared to sell them, they were only prepared to sell them at high prices, and he didn't have any money. So basically, a long, a long story short, he um, found that Otto Swire in, in Orbost was, had a waterlogged boat, which was worth apparently £200, um, and he was prepared to sell it for £75, and my uncle thought he'll have that one, and because he was very good with his hands, and for £10 he can bring it up to his to its, uh, its, 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 all, its, its 200 pound value. Anyway, he got a boat called the Sea Otter and that was what they used to, that and a, and a dinghy called the Shearwater, which they used to get backwards and forwards to Pabby from Broadford. This is what Pabby looked like when they arrived. Um, this is 19, this is, this is, I won't tell you when this is because I'm in this picture and I'm age three. I'm the little lad on, 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 on the right there. But it's pretty bleak, um, but, the, but the, the buildings were there and in good condition. And those buildings had been built, erected, sorry, by, the, um, by Sir Donald Curry. And so what's very interesting is, or I find interesting, is you can go to Scalpy and you'll see the similar sorts of building. The same people built the buildings on Pabby as built them on, on, on Scalpy. Um, here's, well, I'm on the right-hand side there, a little laddie, um, and you'll notice that we, 
no, 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 no safety equipment in those days. Um, and that was the, the other, the, the thing about, I want to make, the point I want to make, a, well, I want to make a couple of points about boats, but before I do that, here's, there was no electricity, no hot water, no running water. That's my mother uh, doing, doing the washing and, and I'm the little lad on the left. So this was a very, very kind of, um, very basic way of, way, way, way of living. Ah, now, there's, there's a story I want to tell you about because there's a chat that I've talked to, talk to you about the, the waterlogged ground problem. The other problem was these things, which I said had been introduced probably in the 1880s by, 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 one of the, by Lord MacDonald. Well, the, and the reason that rabbits had been introduced because rabbit meat was very, very, um, very popular and the rabbit furs were, were used for, for, for um, ladies' clothes and, and, and so on. So there was, a, there was a high demand for rabbits. And in the, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, that was fine. But by the late 1920s, rabbits in these parts of the world had become a serious problem. We do not appreciate, but I've seen state records from Scalpy, which are frightening in the, in the sense of the what is being reported that every single living, growing thing is being eaten by these rabbits. They're even, even taking the bark of established trees. So that Scalpy um, was in, a, was, was in a, a pretty desperate position by this time. However, um, rather, than, rather, than, rather than tackling the problem, um, so um, the, the bell, Henry Bell, um, restocked his island with rabbits because he was, I say, in the meat business, he was sure that there was still a market for better quality fur and better quality rabbit meat. Anyway, it was, it was a disaster. Um, and, it, and ultimately, in, on Pabby, um, my, we spent, um, my, my, my uncle got there in the spring, or sorry, in the early part of 1950, he needed money, so he planted potatoes. That was the easiest thing to do. Um, he went to look at these potatoes as they were growing, but by the time they were fully grown, they were gone. Uh, he had been told a rabbit, um, rabbits don't eat spuds, but he discovered that they do. And he uh, was left with bereft, in a sense, because the, the, they had no money, no income, and that drove them to uh, spending the first um, autumn of their time on Pabby um, cal gathering uh, whelks or, or, or winkles for the London market. So rabbits are a problem um, and in fact Stuart my cousin and I spent a lot of one of our when you went to Pabby you always had a job to do and one of ours was to walk around the island every every morning and uh, reset snares to, 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 to try and catch some of these rabbits um, because the netting that Len my uncle had put up was, was, was extensive but it, he didn't have the time or the money to set it deeply enough into the soil to, so that the rabbits could still, still climb under it and through it and so forth. So it was a, it was a hard, hard job until myxomatosis. And myxomatosis um, didn't, you know, it, it spread, as you know, through the rest of Britain, but it wasn't getting to the islands. Um, and one of the sad things, I guess, um, in terms of living on Pabby or, or my experience of Pabby, was that um, my, my mother even was involved in, in and we live near Glasgow, um, finding, looking for dead rabbits on the road and then sending them to Pabby to try and spread myxomatosis onto them to try and um, eliminate the rabbit population. A horrible business, but nevertheless, because diet and myxomatosis is a horrible disease, um, but nevertheless, it was a matter of the rabbits or us, because without, if the rabbits were there, you couldn't grow crops, basically. Um, now, go back to the boats. This is the Sea Otter. This is, this is the boat that, 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 that Len, my uncle, bought from, from Otto Swire. Now, there it is, nicely tied up by the, the jetty um, and um, little children playing on it and so forth. And it was, it was, he, he was delighted with it because it had a cabin. My auntie uh, hated the sea and she <laughs> crossed as rarely as she could across the, across the, 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 the water. And there's the boat. That was, that was in 1951, I think it was. And this is about 1953. There's the sea otter. 
Um, and that was a problem on Pabi because of the, 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 there was only a jetty. It didn't have any, provide any shelter from the winds from the, from, from, the, from the south and the east. And during the course of the years my folks were on, on Pabi, they lost something like 14 boats, um, just wrecked like this because of the, 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 the you know, the, there's a problem. Um, and he couldn't afford more expensive boats. And he couldn't afford to do what was necessary at the jetty. To, to improve things. What's the time, Kate? I mean, I know what the time is. What time do I have? I'm, I have till 20 past. Right, goodness me. Okay, well, it, they resorted to various uh, ways of, of, of dealing with the sea passage, if you like, and they bought this uh, duck from uh, ex-army, ex-navy, or ex-army duck um, um, from somewhere down near Mali and tried that um, to, because it would be very useful for taking hay and so forth, cattle across to the island. Um, that did three trips and then it sank um, off, the, off near the perch that lies between Pabby and Broadford. Here's various aspects of, 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 of the operation, their operation in, that, in, the, in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, one of the, in the top right hand, you'll see um, a great pile of seaweed um, and that was one of, the, one of the advantages of Pabby, according to John Blackadder, way back in 1814, was that the island was blessed with rich supplies of seaweed uh, and, and shell marl, which, or, which, which, which produced um, basically fertilizer for, for, for the land. And I think one of the other interesting aspects of this sort of study is that these are, there are continuities in the history of some of these islands. I mean, that's the 1950s, but that could have been going on in the 1850s, could have been going on in, this, in the 1750s. Um, um, yeah, and interestingly enough, right now, um, in, in the last year or so, uh, a, a seaweed growing, a kelp growing business has been set up off Pabby. Um, so, you know, um, it's important. And there's just some pictures of, of, of trying to farm on Pabby. My uncle, in order to, to try and make a living, um, obviously potatoes weren't the answer, um, was to set up um, a, a chick rearing station. And he, for some time, he supplied the Western Isles with live chicks. Um, he would, he, in return for um, older hens, if you like, which he would then sell to hotels and so on. So that was a, another way of making a living. In other words, he had to put together um, a living from the various income streams. Here's another one. He got himself into, into, into knitting um, and was designing um, the jerseys of the sort he's wearing there and even had a, had a, a sort of interesting little card, 1963 fashion note, the best dressed Dominie will be wearing matching Shetland tie and socks this year and of course he would make them. Um, as well. So it turned his hands to many things, including painting. Um, all sorts of, there's, there's Stuart and I doing boat repairing, if you like. Um, down on the left hand side, you'll see there a Nissen hut, one Nissen hut, and one base for a Nissen hut. Um, they needed, he needed to um, storage room on the island, and that Nissen hut went on fire. The, 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 the other aspect of Nissen huts is that on the top end of the island, which is only 89 feet high, he had a couple of Nissen huts uh, erected one day. The men who were erecting it went off on the Friday. By the Sunday, there was no Nissen huts left. The wind had blown them uh, out to sea, and they were to be seen uh, somewhere off Apple Cross, uh, glinting in the sunshine. Um, so wind is another issue on an island uh, of, of that nature. That's my auntie just... Um, that's, that was a communication system. There was, no, there was no radio, there was no cell phones and, 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 and so forth. And so in order to, to, con to communicate with the, with the mainland or Broadford, um, you, you, you looked at the telescope and, and, and saw if a boat was coming. Um, if you needed something, she would put, um, put, it, put sheets out or something of that sort. Um, and in fact, when I was a boy, in my, in, in my early teens, I guess, 12, 13, and you could travel around at that age on your own in a way that you can't nowadays, my mother would put me on the train at Queen Street. Uh, I would go to, um, I would take the train to Armadale, cut a, get, get this boat across to, sorry, Mali, get the boat across to Armadale, get the bus up to Broadford. I'd go down to the pier on Broadford, stand there, and my auntie would spot me, and they'd send the boat across for me. So it was magical. I don't know how we... And we did it without cell phones, without mobile phones. 
Um, another problem for, for our challenge, sorry, I shouldn't make this, these problems. Another challenge was that the, that the tide went out, as it does everywhere, but the tide went out at, at, on at probably relatively quickly, and that meant that um, you could not sail at certain times of the day. Um, and that was important because if you were selling, dealing with live animals, you didn't want to be hanging around. Or even if you were dealing with dead, dead meat, you didn't want to be hanging around with stuff rotting on a jetty. Um, and that occasionally happened. That was another issue. The, the people who succeeded my uncle did this very sensible thing, and that they built, um, they, they, they blew a hole in the jetty and built this shelter for craft, but my folks couldn't afford to do such a thing. But, but, but life would have been very different had they been able to do that. Um, I'm, I'm whipping through this. Now, this is where we are. The, the present owners, and I don't want to be disrespectful of them, but the, the present owners have spent a lot of money on the island. They have, sorry, I should have said before getting to this, my folks left um, after about 20 years. My uncle, health uh, deteriorated very badly. He had a couple of heart attacks. My aunt wouldn't, didn't, wouldn't, ha wouldn't accept another one because of course, um, if you have a heart attack on a place like Pavi um, and it's rough, you can't get a doctor over. And so it was very, she had a very difficult three weeks when he had a heart attack and they couldn't, couldn't get across to see him. Um, so they left eventually and then, um, then uh, bought a run-down house at Eden Bain, um, which they turned into the Eden Bain Lodge Hotel. It's now very high-end. It wasn't very high-end in my aunt's day. Uh, in fact, it was very opposite, but it was great value for money. Um, she went into knitting. He set up Eden Bain Pottery, um, and my cousin still runs that, and indeed other um, of my relatives are still on the island working, working away at various things. So, um, in as much as their trip, their, their venture to Pabi was in part supported by government grants that were available at the time. The state was very interested in stemming the outflow of population from these parts of the world, and so they benefited to some degree from that. And you might, the, and, 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 you know, governments look for immediate returns, but this is a long-term return. There are still my family in this part of the country, making a living, contributing taxes and, and, and creating employment and so forth. So it's a, it's a, you know, governments should be patient. Things happen, but not necessarily overnight. The present owners um, have planted trees. So Pabby is beginning to look a little like it would have done in the, in the 16th century. Unfortun and, and, uh, unfortunately, however, um, the all of the cultivable land is no longer there. The, 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 I went back about three or four years ago, and as I say, well, as I don't say, it was heartbreaking because all of that effort, all of that human endeavor that had gone in over the centuries, actually, I'm not talking about just my people, but their predecessors, the, 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 the old church, the old settlement, um, all of the agricultural work that had been done over the years is, has been lost beneath these, this grass and and, and, and weeds and, and so forth. There aren't even any rabbits there. Although I understand some, they've, they, they, they've returned. Um, um, but, but, but they're having difficulty. We, in, in, when I was a boy, we could walk around this island in two or three hours. And we went back and we were, we, we, we'd arranged for a boat to come and collect us and we were late because we couldn't get around the island because it was so overgrown. Um, which is, it, it was kind of tr tragic. And, in, in the book I've, I've written about this, there's, there's I, I'm not the best writer in the world, but one of the most, one of a, a part of the a passage which I think is quite eloquent, talks about the, the, the vanity of man, if you like, and, um, and, and this, that um, there's, there's, there's a picture of, a, of one of my uncle's boats, his favorite boat actually, which is a varnished launch. Uh, and there you can see it, it's near the jetty, but it's broken and it's crumbling. And it's a kind of symbol of the beautiful things that men can build, but of their fragility too. And what, what, what still remains uh, on Pabi, and most obviously, um, are the fossils. So those things that were laid down millions of years ago are, in a sense, um, more prominent than the activities of human beings in the intervening millennia, basically. Um, so 
there we are, some reflections. I said I'd end up and try and build from the small, from the small, the personal into something bigger. So here's some reflections on island living, which I hope will inform not only some of our thinking today, but also these future occasions, the island's present and island's future. No two islands are the same, nor do they remain the same over time, um, that, you know, as you can see in Pabby's case. All who are dependent on sea travel and in that sense are vulnerable, safe, reliable means of crossing are critical. Tell that to CalMac. <laughs> um, which, um, and, and you can see from all the fuss about the, 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 the understandable furore about um, the shipping uh, or shipping facilities in and around the west coast of Scotland, just how important, how vital sea crossings are, say sea crossings. Islands to a great less extent weather dependent um, wind and rain have attracted comment for centuries. If I had read Thomas Tennant, who was, uh, who was writing, is it Thomas Tennant, who was writing in the 1770s about, uh, he came to Skye and he, and, he, and, he, and he commented on the wind and the rain and the damage they did to crops. If I had read that book before my uncle went to Skye and I'd been able to, I'd have said, don't do it because what happens is suddenly, you know, you have a, and my uncle got excited, he would see wheat crops, flourishing, how wonderful. People tell me I can't grow wheat on sky. Well, I can, but it couldn't because basically the next day it would be flattened because of a gale or something of that sort. So an island require, living requires enormous resilience, personal community. It's not for everybody, um, but it is for some people. Small islands are more difficult to places, more places to live in than larger islands. You need critical mass and they've seen higher levels of depopulation as, as, as Michael Anderson's book will today. Island ecologies can be fright, fragile. Human intervention can be catastrophic. Think rabbits. Um, sustainability often requires state support or that of other agencies. Um, certainly if, you're, if, you, if, 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 it's a, if it's a small island, but also in some of the bigger places, it's essential. Island living can be exhilarating. It was one of the happiest times, some of the happiest times of my life were spent on Pabby. But in smaller communities, they can also threaten physical and mental health. And it's, it's not only what happened to my uncle, but I've seen, I want to do a bit of work on, on Scalpy actually, because that's, a, that's a, a larger island, obviously, but there is in the Portree archives, a wonderful, a bundle of letters, which are called personal papers. And I've had a quick glance at them some years ago. And basically they are, uh, they are gossip. They're, they're, they're letters to the factor and between individuals on there and just saying, I don't like him, and I don't like her, and she does bad things. Uh, and it, 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 it's not an island idyll. These are people who are close together uh, and, and, and they can't stand each other. I think that's what this bundle of letters will reveal. Anyway, um, that's the end of my story for today. I've spent, uh, I've, I've used my allocated time, and so I shall stop. So thanks very much for listening. I should say that um, uh, my, a guy called Des Thompson from Nature Scotland and I were um, behind this project, um, past Ireland's past, present and future. Des unfortunately detached a retina and can't be here. So um, he was going to do much of this work that I'm going to do now. So I'm going to, I've finished talking, but I'm going to talk on by introducing some of our speakers. So it's a full time job today, um, which I couldn't do without Becky and Kate. So um, we have next speaker is Hugh Sheep, who is um, well a monumental figure in terms of uh, material cultural history in Scotland. Hugh was um, for a long time a stalwart at the National Museum of Scotland, um, and he's been where is he? Ah, he's just coming. He's he's been at the National Museum of Scotland for. He was at the National Museum of Scotland until 2007, doing all sorts of tremendous work on ethnology and other subjects. Um, uh, enormously well respected and knows what he's doing with IT. So, um, uh, well, I think, I think. I'm not so sure. Over to you, anyway. Thank you. 
Christopher a son Nambriar and Fieli, I guess, time to come and rego go nation a hide could untachtus son richer show er hosh and you. Thank you, Chris, for these kind words and thanks to the Royal Society of Edinburgh for putting today's event on um, on the map. This is uh, very enjoyable indeed. So, um, a well shave all the gamplowing, Jen. Let me, sorry, not time to. So, um, so um, my title draws on the words of Neil McVoodie, written in the manuscript Books of Clonranald, and here offers a Gallic perspective on the civil wars. Here we have an alternative view in words coming from a writer whom we should now call a professional historian. And in the context of Gaelic society, let's say a chronicler or a shanachi, who was at work in 17th century Uist, offering a view of the times from his own societal base from the Gaelic side. Neil McVoodie was a member of the remarkable Bardic dynasty that served the Lords of the Isles. Dooley, dooley. Pressing the buttons when I shouldn't be. Um, from the 13th to the 15th centuries, and then the Clanranald branch of Clondonald. They were living at Stilligree here in South Uist, where they had lands in return for their professional services to the chief of Clanranald. And in, in more detail, um, these are his words that I was drawing on. And um, the purists will have to forgive me for translating uh, this word, Munger as the folk, but I wanted to cut it down to something brisk, so the folk who did all the business is, um, is not an adequate translation for classical Gaelic, so forgive me, folks. Uh, I shouldn't say folks, should I? Here we are among scholars. Um, so learning about the past in the islands, what is available? One almost universal comment or complaint of the historian embarking on their study of the Highlands and Islands has been the absence of documentation for a satisfactory narrative and the lack of archival sources for any systematic analysis. The inference of this cry of despair has been no documents, no history. So this too prevalent excuse had tended to a default position in a Highland history of cultural and ideological stereotypes. From today's standpoint, what I see for our students in the schools and universities is a narrative that is well-worn, stayed, and compiled elsewhere. This isn't to suggest that it is other than a substantial body of scholarship in its own right, but it is not without its own crop of theories and dogmas and its own gaps in competencies. So, for example, uh, for a quick access into the past in Highland history. This was uh, a book that had deeply impressed me when I found it in my first year at university. In fact, it really uh, turned my uh, perception upside down. And um, you may be tickled to look at this first edition of Callum Maclean's The Highlands, uh, published by Batsford. The story is that when the publishers received his typescript, they were trying to refuse to publish it because it was quite um, conspicuous, quite um, <coughs> controversial. So these are um, two quotes from the, the Highlands and what Callum McLean was, uh, was doing. He, of course, at the time was the first researcher and recorder in the new School of Scottish Studies and was uh, in the 50s, had been sent by the Irish Folklore Commission to Scotland and was working in the islands. So um, the beginnings of this quote actually from the page say, a new culture had penetrated the rough bounds, Nagara Kriochen, of the Gael and was sweeping before it all traces, all memories of the past. Before it became too late, I had to recover something that would give our contemporaries and the generations of the future some picture of the past. And then he picks up with these words here. And just to note, for example, he, he sets off by putting his, um, 
commitment to write about Loch Harbour. He puts it in a specific geographical uh, location, which, if you like, is a very Gallic one, the Gara Kriochen, the rough bounds. So that idea of geographies is another um, aspect of the past in the Highlands, which you know, we should attend to. In other words, if we're here, we should look at the geography differently. You know, the mainland does look different from here than if you were in the mainland. At least that's what I feel, having been here for a while. For revisiting the past in the islands, it is important and even essential now to see how history has been written, to assemble a historiography. And we'll be aware that for the past in the islands, it is complicated by ever-changing academic and political fashions and growing out of a national history whose foundations were laid in the late 18th and 19th centuries, mainly in the kind of Oxbridge-London axis. axis. And um, so... I believe there's a tendency for now in our absorbing of history to write, to think history backwards from what is familiar to us today. And um, with that in mind, we uh, c can well take on board the uh, comment by the philosopher R.G. Collingwood, who proposed that every new generation must rewrite history in its own way. And this seems to apply compelling me to where we are today in revisiting the past in the islands. And we're not alone. We have the work of the last generation, and particularly I admire the, the, uh, the published work of Dr. John Bannerman, um, who was a great support to the college in its early years. It stands out. He stands out. Quiet and unassuming, but far-reaching influence began with his appointment to Edinburgh University in 1965. Professor Alan McInnes has followed more recently with his scrutiny of Jacobitism and Highland clanship, particularly in the historically complex 17th century, for vitally important insights into a Gallic perspective into the past, the work of Martin McGregor and Nurse McConaughey, both of Glasgow University, is at the forefront. Martin McGregor's highly detailed and forensic evaluation of the statutes of Iona, for example, has given us fresh understanding of them. With, a challenging, with his challenging conclusion that the statutes were balanced and sophisticated in the way they sought to cater for all interests and create something for everyone. Now, looking into the conventional books of Scottish history, you get uh, very little other than a view that the statutes of Iona were purely um, a stick of realpolitik of James VI, which he used to beat the Gales and, and Islanders with. Martin has put a completely new gloss on it. Nurse McConaughey, with his detailed research into the Mackenzies of Seaforth, has offered us the vital premise that Gallic society before the 45 was not uncommercial. And I use the double negative uh, uh, deliberately to strengthen the point. And it was certainly not purely patriarchal. In other words, it wasn't all about clans and tartans. So the, these are the words of the early historian John Afforden. So, and this is what Martin McGregor and Nurse McConaughey and others have in their sights. It's this lack of view from within the Gaeltoch and the baneful influence of the Highland, um, the Highland-Lowland divide, which of course has, emerges from Fordun's words here. Dating from the second half of the 14th century and the bold statement, uh, often quoted but probably little studied, written in the 1370s, this has been taken at face value. And the image of the Highlander and a Highland line separating two races, repeated with little or no qualification by all his successors, with its useful topos of civilized versus barbaric. Uh, we know where we stand. Well, speaking for myself anyway. And the proverbial saying of Mirun Mor Nangau, or the great ill will of the foreigner or the lowlander, is the considered reaction from this angle. And um, an interesting follow-on from this is that on the Gallic side, um, it's, it's been a matter of belief and history that the Gaels came from Spain and that they were descended from the son of a Greek prince, Gael Glass, and Scota, the daughter of Pharaoh. I'm sure you've all heard this uh, brief sentence, which uh, has never, of course, earned itself much repute amongst K 
conventional historians, but it is deeply embedded as um, a Gaelic tradition. And the origin legend, as we call it, was enshrined in Scottish Gaelic and emerges from time to time. For example, uh, at the inauguration of King Alexander III at Schoon in 1249, when the Shenachi of Fili, professional poet, recited the king's pedigree back to Gael Glass and Scota, Scota, the daughter of Pharaoh. And it comes out through um, Gallic verse from time to time. And my particular favorite is as late as the um, beginning of the 18th century, uh, the very learned uh, minister, the Reverend John McLean, produces a poem of praise to um, Edward Hluid, um, who was the early Celtic scholar, and uh, in which he rehearses the origin legend. And this is important too because um, these days the archaeological um, paradigm, if you like, of the, of the Celtic people coming from Central Europe and the Hallstatt and Latin cultures is also being challenged by um, linguistic and philological evidence, which suggested in, suggests to us, in fact, that that Spanish bridgehead or step of the, of the move, the, the emergence, if you like, of the Gales uh, in history, in long-term history, is, in fact, through Spain. So the origin legend, which has been just treated far too lightly, I would say, in conventional histories, um, has this wonderful uh, germ of truth in it. So the assembling and writing of uh, Highland history has been subject to sometimes dramatic changes of fashion. And um, an alternative or an insider view, which I'm trying to assemble, uh, might um, insist today that it had been blighted by this not least because it could be assumed that this history has been composed and articulated and consumed and regurgitated outside the region. Surely we can mount a challenge to conventional Highland and Island history with the sources we have to hand, and adopting an innovative and open approach will, with multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary studies, drawing on sociology, history, human geography, cultural anthropology, and of course, language and literature, and this is where I, I can rec recommend the extraordinary richness of the Toporandolhish sound archive, which we have to hand as typical of the new sources that we might draw into this view of the past from this region. So what guides us into the Highlands in British or Scottish history? I believe we tend to think back the way with more recent episodes as familiar starting points. The Jacobite Wars and their final strategic and political solution in the Battle of Culloden in 1746. An army of occupation and a confused society in relative economic decline, but trying to rebuild itself. And um, then we have rise in rents, um, social and economic collapse, the move into large-scale sheep farming, theories of improvement uh, in, imposed on, on the highlands and islands. So we, we have to say, well, of course, we would prefer the, the, the neat dwelling place on the right and just look at the, the, the dwelling place on the left and how important it was to put that behind us, as it were. So this is the uh, philosophy of improvement, as Chris was saying, um, this uh, uh, theme of optimism. And um, the move into large-scale sheep farming and uh, emigration, increasing government intervention with royal commissions and legislation and their concomitant documentation. These themes are, of course, important and shouldn't be abandoned. Without further theorizing, however, they have formed the baseline of what has been, an, what I would say, is an economic determinist model and a story of decline seems to be the currency of Highland history. But history today, and I will make the boast that this is the, the ability of the UHI and the role of the UHI, the University of Highlands and Islands, a more critical and omnivorous discipline, looking with enthusiasm beyond the history of kings and queens, wars and governments and their bureaucracies, and capable of recognizing and turning to good effect national and regional diversity, social and cultural history, 
local history and an interest of mine drawing on material culture. This can bring us down to ground level and can move out to situate Scotland's past in a wider European and global contest. These new directions form the underlying paradigm of our MSc programme in Solmor Ostate on Kultur Dugesoch, or traditional culture. So let's revisit the past in the islands for a short while, and I'd like to make revisiting an opportunity for a bit of rebalancing with what we have to hand. Well, the informed view tells that the islands are less remote than places deep in land. From, this is from our from our island perspective, and that the Hebrides have always been connected to a wider European culture, and especially throughout prehistoric and early historic times. Connectivity is demonstrated spectacularly through megaliths such as the Kalanish stones and the evidence of mobility and migrations. My contention is that such con connectivity has been neglected for the long post-Roman period. And purely on my own fancy, I've, I'm representing um, how more in South Uist as a, a very good example of con connectivity and of a completely different perspective on Highland and Island history, particularly Hebridean history. And um, I first discovered, as it were, for myself, how more I was uh, in South Uist in about 1980, and I uh, was walking. I'd been told that there's a very interesting site, and I was walking down the road towards Hamor, and a man came towards me the other way, and he stopped me, and he began to talk. He said, Kosa Harshev, where are you from? And so I thought, well, this is a great op opportunity for a chat. And he said, um, I said, I'm interested in the, the, re the building remains here. He said, ah, oh, well, you must understand, this is the site of an ancient university, and that people came from all over the world to it. So here was this notion of connectivity entirely built into a Hebridean mindset. And if, if we look around in the islands, we find um, similar sites. For us in Skye, here we have uh, the church at Skabost, or the, site, the remains of the church at Skabost, which um, is a, a rather unremarkable site when, when you look at Skabost Island. But um, here we had the cathedral church of the diocese of the, the, the Western Isles and the Isle of Man. Uh, first of all, under the jurisdiction of Trondheim, Nidaros, and then um, under the jurisdiction, literally, of the papacy, after the proper arguments have been gone through to shrug off the superiority of the archbishop, archdiocese of York and Canterbury for a more Scottish identity. So, um, here we have in the islands, um, the conceptual cliche of periphery or remote is applied and loved by marketing in the media. In a Eurocentric and Anglocentric culture, cities have been at the center and islands uh, at the edge. In a Gallic context of language and culture, periphery or edge is imo, and a phrase like imo me geltoch, or the edge of the geltoch, is a standard colloquialism. But it's always been perceived that Imo Nagelthoch was never the Outer Hebrides, but centres such as Blairgowrie and Braemar or Dumbarton, Dunkeld and places further south. Of course, places seen, seen conventionally as peripheral might be linked by seas to the rest of the world, which is the case here, of course, on the west coast of Uist. Uh, this is, has a, a very strong personal detail in it. In the, these are two of my grandchildren on, on the beach in South Uist. So, what have we got to offer? What, 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 can, what can we look at? Um, I'm just going to look at one or two items here um, to part of the rebalancing. First of all, when we think of sea power and, and maritime uh, culture, we think of the Highland Galley and the influence of the Vikings and, and so on. But we must remember that um, boating culture goes a way, away back, and this is a lovely little item in the National Museum of Ireland, this little boat model, which of course when you see it is, must be a model of a substantial craft when you see the oars and the rowing benches and the mast and so on. And of course there is the, um, we must remember with, uh, with pleasure and interest, the voyage literature from, from early Irish and with the voyages of saints from 
from their monastic seats to, to the other worlds of, of the ocean. Donard, um, what is so interesting about this, although it's on a, in a defensible position, the excavations that have been done here don't show much sign of fortifications or struggles or battles or whatever, but this was a palace of royal inauguration, inauguration and the capital, as it were, of Dalriota in Scotland, linking it with Ireland. But more importantly for us, the hub of an international trading route bringing such items, as I've written here, as pottery and glass from the Mediterranean, and a redistribution centre for luxury commodities and a trade under royal control. So much to look at there and think about. The church, of course, a vital influence in early um, Gallic culture and a vital part of the history of the, uh, of, of the Gaeta and the past. And these are very important items which, which survive from then what I like about these is the way that they symbolize what the Celtic church seems to stand for as a missionary church, you know, which is, comes from Ireland through the Scottish islands, through the Scottish mainland, and then back to re-evangelize parts of Europe. And so wonderful how information in, in Gallic manuscripts survived in European monasteries and was um, discovered in the 19th century. Of course, the, you can't uh, avoid mentioning Iona and Columcilla, St. Columba, and his role in all this. And that, as I say, in, in, in looking at the, visiting the past in the islands, that is one of our big, big topics. And of course, I, I appeared to diminish the role of the Vikings, but I don't mean to by any means. The Viking era is so interesting, so important, invasion and colonization the legacy, the richness of place name evidence, and strata of names suggesting waves of settlement. And this is all information that has come to us through the fieldwork of Scandinavian scholars in the 1930s and the 1950s, and is in a way our, our framework for understanding the Viking influence, the Norse influence in the islands and in Scotland. Now, Richard, our colleague Richard Cox's PhD on Lewis place names suggests that the Scandinavian influence can be overstated. So certainly what we have is a mixed Norse Gallic society of the 9th to the 13th centuries. And um, this is, uh, is, is, is important to us and it, it, still in so many ways. And moving on, the Lordship of the Isles, no backward glance, no rebalancing can avoid the Lordship of the Isles. This is one of the most important factors and features in uh, island history. And I would say there's an interesting tendency for historians to refer to the late 13th to late 15th centuries as the era of the Lordship of the Isles. And I would suggest this underplays the emergence and portrayal of the phenomenon. The renowned Somerled appears on the historical scene in the mid 12th century, and Somerled is recognized in Gallic tradition as the founder of the Lordship of the Isles and his successors as kings of the Isles, Rir and Ishigao. We assume that Sorli Machilivrit was a mixed Norse Gallic stock, which by then was not, as we'd say, a big deal. Everyone more or less, in the northern and western Isles were of mixed Gallic stock. And uh, so Somerled himself saw no irony in pushing back on North, Norse over or lordship. And there are very interesting oral traditions about Somerled's emergence and Somerled's pushing back on uh, Norse over lordship and how it all started. These were traditions recorded in Ardnamorochan and Ardgaur in the 19th and 20th century. Well, um, the Lordship, of course, as I've said, had in my little text, is, um, is marked out by its stone monuments and it, these wonderful grave slabs. This is just an example recorded by a 19th century artist. And um, uh, just another of the Lord, the mark of the Lordships is in Gallic culture and music and so forth. And, one book which um, I've been rereading recently uh, before coming here, this book, uh, the Songbook of the Pillagers, Duaner and Asraker, produced by um, Wilson MacLeod and my uh, colleague Meg Bateman. 
uh, which is a wonderful source for revisiting the past from a Gallic perspective. And as it were, reading a book like that, and if you, if you shut your mind to everything you've learned beforehand, it's very, very instructive, I believe. Well, this other aspect of what we have behind the Lordship is um, a trade routes and co connectivity with Europe. And particularly from these parts, trade went through the Entrepot Centre in Ireland of Galway and also Limerick and Sligo and connected the Highlands and Islands, well, well the Western mainland and the islands with, with, uh, with Spain and France in a really big way, which I think is um, that part of Gaelic history is largely has been largely ignored in Scottish history. But this Atlantic littoral was very, very important and brought us, amongst other things, the influence of the Renaissance. And I just want to, as it were, tease ourselves with some ideas that um, we can look um, for the Renaissance, believe it or not, in architecture. We have a lot of wonderful castles on the west coast and in the islands, which um, are not really under the care of historic environment Scotland. In fact, very few of these sites are, like Homor, for example. Uh, these sites are, I would suggest, neglected. But if we look more critically at a, a, a castle like this, Castle Chirim in Moidat, which uh, whose re restoration in recent, in, in our own generation, had failed due to, I dare to say, purists who said that it was much better on the west coast just to have a ruin than to have a lovely uh, manicured monument. So uh, let's keep it as a ruin. So my own interest has been deeply frustrated in that this idea of showing what we have inside this um, curtain wall style of castle, which was so typical of the Middle Middle Ages, um, you know, do we, is it a stronghold or is it a palace? And I maintain that if we look, put Gallic poetry and song beside these buildings or think about them within the spaces of these buildings, um, we might find uh, it really quite easy to imagine that somewhere like Castle Chirum is as much a palace as anything in Fiesole or Florence and in Italy of the Renaissance. And this, uh, I, my attention had been caught by this song in the McDonnell collection, uh, where there is this sense of different spaces emerging in the castle, or in the, uh, I'm, I'm assuming uh, this, this might be referring to Castle Chirum since her husband, Mahdi's husband, was, um, was one of the clan Ranals, dying in 1618. But the long, long lament is really a very, very beautiful piece. And I just picked out this verse because I think, as I say, what we have here is a hint about these internal spaces. And so you have the blast of the pipes, the rattle of the dice on the boards, the gaming, and, and the noise of the bards. Uh, the bragging of the bards with their satire. And then it moves to the, if you like, the, the, the chamber of reflection and quietness where the, the widow uh, remembers, you know, why would I let you away from me? Uh, you know, why have you died? So um, I think these spaces should be reinvestigated. And here's another one, which uh, Glengarry Castle, another ruin, but it's, it's very, very impressive. And inside, what we know of the architectural spaces are very, very impressive indeed and uh, are much more to do with fine domestic living than they are with, um, with defence. Now, just picking up a, a late... I'm talking about this connectivity, a late reference from 1750 from this... Uh, a anonymous report for the government and the author, probably uh, Alexander McBain, it's anonymous in the way it's published. He, he was a minister in Venice and as you see from this on the side of the government. So he writes, you know, all these countries, Noida, the two Moros, Moida and Narasa, this is just across here, it's the Garakriochen again, the rough bounds, are the most rough, mountainous and impassable parts in all the highlands of Scotland and are commonly called by the inhabitants of the neighbouring countries, the highlands of the highlands. And then he says, the people in general of all ranks in this barbarous place 
are much better acquainted with Rome, Madrid, and Paris than they are with London or Edinburgh. Amazing. Why not? But, of course, for him, this was traitorous. You know, the, this was deeply hostile, that they were all uh, hugga with, with, with Europeans. Well, this is, in, in great speed, this is just a, a rapid and simple way of putting some uh, explanation onto Highland history. And we had a very good seminar the other day from Martin McGregor about, really, about this map on the left, which is really a map to illustrate in, in quite a um, sort of graphic way how powerful the Lordship of the Isles was and how it drew the ire of the Kingdom of Scots down on it and it was then obliterated by feudal law and uh, so on in 1493. But one of the points about this map is that it recalls this what I believe is a proverbial saying is that the, what the Lords of the Isles possessed was half of Scotland and a house. So they were, if you like, 51% uh, stakeholders in the Scottish Kingdom, which of course did not agree with the Stuart dynasty. So it was replaced with a, a, a different sort of set of power politics where on the right we are shown how the Mackenzies are set up in the north and the Campbells in the south and Clan Donald, as it were, the Lords of the Isles, are squeezed out in the middle. And this is just a summary of that, of that dismemberment and how it was uh, brought about with, uh, um, with the, the, the politics of the Crown. And then uh, just to um, mention that another aspect of this, perhaps, Gaeltach past is... Um, the granting of uh, charters and so forth by the Lords of the Isles. Um, the, um, the published acts of the Lords of the Isles, Scottish History Society, volume of 1986, illustrate the process of the Gallic Lordship taking on board or submitting themselves to feudalism and be becoming assimilated to the Scottish Kingdom. I'm not so sure that this is an adequate explanation from a Gallic point of view. Their adoption of the principles and practices of so the so-called feudal system was pragmatic and infers a preference for a level of organisation which is perfectly evident in the Lordship of the Isles itself. Well, feudal culture was spreading in Scotland from the 12th century and the country divided up as we know. Um, and charters were certainly adopted by the Lords of the Isles, but on their own terms, I believe. For example, the terminology might be different, and, and even the language, as in the surviving so-called Isla Charter of 1408, 1408, not in Latin, but in Gaelic, and we might assume there might have been others. And there's another beauty which is buried away in the Paisley Abbey Chartlery of um, a grant by Reginald, son, Rural, son of Somerled, Lord of Ishigaul, to the Abbey of Paisley, of eight oxen and two pence for one year from every house in his domain from which smoke issued, and thereafter one penny each year from every house from which smoke issued, and his heirs to continue the gift or be cursed for failing to do so. In a further grant to the Abbey, the monks were to be helped by sea and by land, quote, with the certain knowledge that by Callum Kill, whosoever of my heirs molests them shall have my curse. So in other words, the the, uh, the uh, terminology of these charters are, are different. And uh, the, uh, well, I should maybe just, I hadn't, I see I hadn't uh, translated the two of the verbal chart charters. Oh, these come down in, in oral tradition and were uh, recorded in the 19th century. They, I suppose, for the record historian, these are ephemeral and of no significance. But uh, they, they are significant for Gallic culture and I myself have tried to collect these uh, whenever I've been coming across them. So the, the, um, the, the, their terminology very typically is in terms of as long as the grass grows, as long as the grass grows green, as long as the water flows, as long as the shun, sun shines upon the earth. And um, there's, I just learned from published element from the, the um, McLagan papers about uh, the uh, lease of Kyle House, which was as long as a stream flows in the Kyle. And the top 
one on the right in this is as long as there will be a stone on Craig and Eich, or a drop of water running in Trig. And the one below, as long as black cow gives white milk, as long as McQueen's crocker stays on its foundations. And this was one of the um, collectors of, uh, of uh, the, this sort of material, one of uh, the Donald McPherson from the National Library, very, very important figure. And um, I just, uh, he was captured on daguerreotype, as it were, and it's such a, an impressive picture um, of this man who died young, but who did sterling work from our viewpoint within Gallic culture. So, um, the, um, by way of conclusion, I'm picking up on an earlier iteration of our conference today when the title was proposed as The Islands Past and Present and Future for People and Nature. And this reflects our concern about how nature figures in our lives, its restorative, restorative experience, and how concerned about it is a global issue, and how Scottish Government's nature emergency highlights that it is damaged and endangered dimension in our lives. But, and a science-led understanding of the long-term attrition of natural resources, such as trees and woodlands, is retailed in the Highlands and Islands, where all these features, good and bad, are starkly seen. Predicated, it seems, on a notion that environmental awareness is a relatively new concept. But no, the culture of trees was always very strong in mainland tradition and powerfully embedded in the Gallic mindset. Trees were linked into and symbolized the concept of the just ruler and the well-being of landscape and people engendered by the virtuous rule of the good king. The death or loss of the just ruler foresaw an antithesis of the blighting of woods and trees and crops and the onset of prolonged winters and the destruction of that natural world. So Gallic culture and tradition contradict conventional science-led understanding of attrition of natural resources and should come to contradict the inference that the Gale has been careless of natural resources. Modern environmental lessons were part and parcel of Gallic culture. And this is just a, um, a particular example to cite Oran the Kohi, the, the song of the owl, where this accord, as it were, been between people and nature is, uh, is at, at the heart of this song. And finally, I wanted to challenge our conventions of modern day academic scholarship by suggesting to you that a revisit to the island's past should also include a fresh burst of heroic history, which has been intellectually outlawed since the 1960s. That this is a useful enterprise, I believe allows us to capitalize on so much of the research of our late colleague, Dr. John McKinnis, with, for example, the panegyric code at its heart, and like Sir Lewis Namia's exercise for the history of Parliament, the assembling of bi biographies is a legitimate and useful exercise. Achieving this for the history of the Gaeltach would, I believe, open up new sources of information in the language. And my candidates for immediate redemption are John MacDonald, the 16th century chief of Clan Ranald, known to Gallic tradition as Ian Murtertoch, and um, Alexander Mackenzie, the Laird of Achelty, a, a poet of huge note, Alistair MacBurrohi of Gallic tradition. So um, that's, and just be, because I've meant the two I've mentioned are lairds and so forth, I wanted to remind ourselves from a view within, um, here we have ordinary guys, so to speak, in the late 17th and in the mid uh, 18th century, just to bring us still back down to earth and in the, in the spirit of our MSc here of Kulta Duhusor. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope that has produced an argument for going forward uh, with, 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 um, with courage into Highland history. Well, thanks. Thanks. thanks very much, Hugh. Very fascinating, challenging. Uh, I'm sure there will be some comments later in the day. Um, we haven't built in question and answers um, sessions for each of these individual papers, but there is a session later in the day for discussion and, and, and so on. Um, but the thing to do, I think, is that if there's a burning question or disagreement you have, speak to the individual during the coffee breaks or during lunchtime. Um, so we are having a coffee, tea and coffee break now, so if you could get back in around 15 minutes, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Join that.
Oh, thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be introducing this session. I'm Abigail Berniet, Head of Research here at Soma Rostec. And as Chris told us in the opening remarks, it's our, it's our 50th anniversary this year. Um, we're very proud that, that we've made it this far and that we're, we're looking towards the future. And as part of our work towards that future role in delivering for learning, but also for research um, on Gaelic and Gaelic-related matters. Um, we're delighted that we've got a wonderful crop of new postgraduate students studying with us um, who've started over recent years and will be, will be completing their PhDs over the next years. And three of them are going to be speaking to us in these speed sessions just now. So I'm very pleased to introduce, introduce our first speaker, um, Jörn McLeod, who is a graduate of Somor Ostig, um, also a, uh, somebody with a, with a long background of experience working in museums in the islands. And that's a, an ideal background and preparation for the PhD, which he's undertaking as part of a collaborative PhD jointly between ourselves at Somor Ostig and National Museums of Scotland. And he's going to be focusing on the role of Gaelic and Gaelic collections in the museums of the future. And the title of his PhD is Kulpa Dúchasoch, Materialising Gaelic Cultures in 21st Century Scotland. He's in his first year of his PhD just now, and he's going to be talking to us in this speed talk about some of the, some of the approaches and some of the, the case studies that he might be drawing on as his PhD work develops. So please give him a warm, warm welcome to address us on his topic of Caith Beha, Material Culture, Identity and Island History. Well, it's me, Joy Macalogis, how many great holidays to be no mask and you. It's very happy to be here. Thanks, Abby. The three sets of objects that I'll look at today, or the three things that I'll look at, they're all in their own way things of the past, of the island's past. And as aspects of Kulpa Dufasoch, or material culture, they each resist any one reading. Rather, they, can, they create countless paths, and through their exploration, we can better conceptualize an island kaipehe, translates roughly way of life, but encompasses the social, cultural, and historical. Collecting water from Toprichen, from Wales, a daily activity throughout the, the islands, or long a daily activity throughout the islands. In Topar, the well, an underground source of water, a shaft dug out, built up with earth, stones, wood, sometimes with a wooden lid or concrete top or stonework. This Gian the Toprach, protection of the well, kept the site clean and safe. Regular light maintenance prevented Lianenoch, a scum gathering on the surface of the water. The Burn Glan fresh water, it wouldn't keep for long in a bottle before becoming flotach, flat or insipid. Among the tools used to aid the collecting of the water was the kyarko, literally the circle, a circular yoke to which pails were attached, and from this activity comes the riddle, heich mi mach etter da yich, is heich mischach etter da loch. I go out between two woods, and I return between two lochs. And the answer, someone going to the well with a kyarko. The kyarko could be made from recycled parts of entai havi, or known in other areas as a tav, um, a large frame spoon net used for rock fishing. The name Kyarko was then also used for the rectangular design, so we can say that the Gales found no problem in squaring the circle. <laughs> Fuadain springs were usually used for a quick drink, traveling from house to house or working on coast or moor, and cups were often left beside both wells and springs. The qualities of the water were noted, the taste, smell, color, some as clear as crystal, others even on the hottest of days freezing cold. And in the healing wells of the Western Isles, Finlay MacLeod writes of 80 sites known for their healing properties, used to alleviate depression, stomach problems, to restore an appetite, or toothache. And many Lewis villages can still point to at least two local sites used to treat toothache. And given their centrality to life in the recent past, it's unsurprising that they're prominent, the wells feature prominently in place name and mapping projects across the island's communities. In Echterile Cartes' Cree, produced by Comunachtri Niche in 2020, 
around 100 wells and springs are listed. Another work is Jalathuka by Anne Campbell. In this map of Braga and Arnold, again, nine springs and one well are listed. The archives of the Comunhachtri, along with township poetry and prose, and written inhabitant histories, offer a discourse on the end of well use as an everyday necessity. This event can be seen alongside the widespread installation of electricity, the move from vernacular to new housing, as well as broader, broader socio-cultural and economic changes of the 20th century. And a, a handful of themes seem to me to be important when we talk about the end of the well use as an everyday necessity. First, we have acceptance, joy, recognition of the benefits that came from the technological shift. One thing's certain, no one would choose to go back to a reliance on the well. On the screen is Fal uh, a few verses from Fal Cherishkin and Pieben, Welcome to the Piped Water by Shoris Morriston from the Clachan Cree collection of Tolsta uh, Township Poetry, and the song speaks for itself. Katrina Mackey has shown that the calls for the introduction of piped water, sewerage, and electricity were led by women who would no longer struggle without the so-called modern conveniences. Secondly, there's the continued use of the wells. By 1984, according to Donald MacDonald in his book, The Tosta Townships, only one or two of the older wells were still in function. However, he writes, Kalyos and Botos, when they want to make a decent cup of tea, return to these wells. Additionally, common are accounts of people ill or close to death craving water from a particular source, and the collected water being brought to the home or indeed the hospital ward. Thirdly, the destruction of former wells, whether deliberate or accidental, is often met with a sadness, a key analysis. And where throughout Finlay MacLeod's healing wells, we find descriptions of former sites damaged or filled in. And where MacLeod's emotional response is implicit in his encouragement of maintenance and care of the sites, where records of the local response to the loss of wells exist, the sentiment is unmistakable. The following text uh, on the screen is but one example that I've come across in archives and in conversation. Fourthly and finally, there's the role of tradition bearers in passing on the location of a well, the technique of maintaining it, and the unspoken importance that they place on this continuation. To Fur and Vunigon in Braga, I was taken by Anne Konyhizak, and she filled two bottles for me to take to aging neighbours. To Fur and Sta and Ness, I was taken by Fjallnogi Ruakan, who brought a rake and taught me to clean out the site. And this is a transmission of material culture rooted in place and in language. And though these instances could be thought of as basically inconsequential, or at least so isolated that they're hard to place in a, a wider meaningful context, they still feel significant and radical. I'm not quite sure what to say about it yet, but um, so despite the welcome to the piped water. The next thing I'll talk about is the Chonachgak. And although normally associated with more exotic or definitely warmer parts of the world, my interest in the Konachat comes from its place in the collection of ob objects housed by Komnyakri and Tev Shear, where the uh, and they, they've served the west side of Lewis, where the Konachat was used from at least as far back as the 1870s and continuing in some form until around the 1940s. From Krochrai in South Braga and from Knochhiller in North Shobest, the blowing of the Konachat, Shejik na Konachat, took place at 6 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. This signaled the end of the working day in good time for the weekly prayer meeting. One informant remembers the horn being sounded on news of a death in the village, another that it would be blown an hour before a funeral, which at the time would be held in the house of the deceased. An alternative use is found in the autobiography of Norman Morrison, better known as Tadamit and Hjallitar, which was published in 1937. Morrison briefly attended the Shabbos Gaelic school and recalls of the school bell, or in his own words, what did duty as a school bell was a gigantic whelk which produced an ear-splitting, eerie sound which had a carrying capacity almost equal to a full blast from a ship's siren. 
But when, did, uh, when was the Konachkak first used in Lewis? There's no exact provenance for any of the shells that I've come across, although the common conclusion in written sources and anecdotally is that they were brought home by sailors. As a method of calling people to prayer, its beginnings may lie with Myrtle MacLeod, born in Habost, 1811. MacLeod was appointed catechist for the district of Loch in 1849 and was known thereafter as Keister Morna Loch. Travelling from village to village, he would sound the Conachat to call people to worship, with much of his teaching and sermons taking place outdoors. And I think it's worth mentioning one final subversive use of the Conachat from the West Side, related to me by Cal Mackay of Barvis. He says, There was a church elder in Braga. He began sounding a Conachat at seven on Saturday evening so that people would stop working and begin to prepare for the Sabbath. Then my grandmother's brother, a young man at the time, he made his own horn, and he started blowing it at quarter to seven. The elder would be furious, and he'd shout at people, pay him no attention, that's only Mach Kal and Annie Gulliam with a ram's horn. <laughs> and so what we have then is a historical object that's meaningful to the community of the West Side. It's a, as a representation of long distance travel by sea, as exotica, a symbol of religious belief, and as a solu solution to local needs. There's a of course, no clock tower, and while well, people would have watches, they wouldn't wear them while working, working outdoors. But first and foremost, it's an object remembered through real people and through their kai behe. It helps paint a picture of a specific community at a specific period of time. And it's also a symbol of the hyperlocal, of the objects that are held by Kamenyatri across the islands, um, to the material shibboleths of the distinct communities that make up the larger island and Gaelic culture. In conclusion, my final object, the island dresser in all its glory, a common household feature for at least the past two centuries, denounced as furniture of the past by some, yet now reclaimed and treasured by others. The dressers are practical and decorative, and this inspires assemblages of objects that say much about the individual owners and the cultures to which they belong. Items on a dresser at once place the individual or family within an immediate community, within an island culture and in a global setting, and they reach back and across genealogical lines and backwards in time. To me, in my short studies so far, some of the most evocative and thought-provoking texts on island history are simple lists of everyday items. You can see uh, Donald MacDonald's list here, and Evel Kainaka in Eshoik um, on the west side of Lewis here. I think by further study of these often ephemeral objects and tools, much can be learned about identity of islands past and present. And on the one hand, we can think about the kaipehe of islanders in the abstract, and on the other hand, we can look at what's on their dresser. So, Tafale. Tafale, the more you and I guess Glushin Rouge, Dinesh, we'll move on now to our next speed talk um, from one of our other first year PhD students. Kate Langhorn um, did a first degree at the University of Aberdeen in Gaelic and Archaeology, and then a uh, master's in uh, Ancestral, studies. Ancestral Studies at the University of Glasgow. And she's here with us now, uh, working on a PhD funded by the Scottish Graduate School for Arts and Humanities, Rewilding Finn McCool, The Cultural Ecology of the Gaelic Heroic Narrative in the Landscape of the Gaelta. Um, we'll get you out of there and into, <laughs> into your... Into my one. Uh, I guess I should have come up with an inching chair scale or about. Go back. Uh, <laughs> oh. There we go. Shall I check? Mine. Go on, huh? Oh. And just to move them out, just go like this. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Fantastic. Martin Bargay, 
agus mata in va grief sha gees jo khabor ge dat mi and la hon fest ket mata horgoda yet and as abby um said herself it's me jake langhorn i'm uh, yeah in my first year doing um, my phd here uh, i'm looking at scale och and gashgal scale och and gashgal ka je han scale och and gashgal well it's it's what's commonly known as the gallic heroic narrative these narratives that we share with Ireland and with the Isle of Man, kind of taking us back, yeah, several hundred years, and uh, with which we get some really, um, really fascinating connections. Stories the likes of Dermot and Grania, Deirdre and Nisha, Cuchulain, Fionn Machgul and his warrior um, the Fianna, the Fingalians, the Fianna, the Fiantichen, the Fane, they've got lots of names. And uh, I'll be looking at their antics as well, more generally, as well as their uh, wars with the Lochlany, with the Norsemen. <laughs> yeah, the Lochlany are quite popular just now. I don't know if you caught the Last Kingdom. There's, there's many, um, there's many a very bingeable Viking, Viking series out there just now. That's, um, yeah, very bingeable. So yeah, I'm interested in where do these stories originate, um, how did they circulate, and what form did they take in people's local landscape? How did, how did the local environment become, you know, embody these stories that? that we call the pan-Gallic narrative that we very much share across in the Gallic, um, the Gallic uh, nations. So, um, yeah, so I'll examine these narratives across the Gael talk, so not specifically to the Scottish Islands, but um, the Scottish Islands become particularly interesting when, yeah, the environment of those, of those islands begin to um, take on um, um, the stories and um, so in keeping with the conference's theme islands past I have chosen one I've chosen the following Lacar battle the school la blar can a school battle the school plan and tunichin battle of the chiefs um, and folks I've just sort of scoped this out and of course I don't have too much time um, to tell you about this um, so I'll basically tell you the basis of the story as it was recounted by, by the tellers. And um, yeah, it's the story of the Fianna and uh, Fionnachal and his warriors. And they were out working, when they were out working on the harvest one day, they had to um, stop what they were doing and defend themselves against the marauding Lochlanich when they came on shore in Chidig, on Tyree, on Colissa in Colonsay or on Ila, it's also in Isla. And, um, and, and we'll speak about that a little bit later. But um, from Dahl Cameron, in conversation, yeah, in conversation with John Gregerson Campbell in 1865, this is how he tells it. He says, the Fians were at harvest work one day in Kilmaluig and on Feed Lagin Hidig, Feed Lagin Hidig, um, the true hollow of Tyree. It was oats they were harvesting. The day on which they went to reap, they left their weapons of war in the armory and in Kistin and Arem and in Dun Gaulish. They saw the Norsemen coming ashore at Bista, and the Fians had neither spears nor any weapons of war. So they sent away Koilje, that's their fastest runner, and Kulge Machra Ikronain for the weapons. The Norsemen attacked them, but a sheaf of oats were driven to the waste of every Norseman that day. So that's how they, that's how they killed them, with, with a sheaf of oats. It's quite a thought, quite a thought. And uh, yeah, I've got a, a really a terrible image here, but on the left you see Dúna Chaulish, that's the photo I found for Dúna Chaulish up at the north end of Tyree. And I don't know if you can see, I've sort of dropped a pin at the different sites where the, you know, chartering the events of the story. So at Rua Forst Beast, at Bista, that's where the Lochlany came on shore. Just below that, at Karnak Beg, just above Kilmaluig, that's Lagnan Kruachan, roughly where Lagnan Kruachan is. That's where the Lochlany were buried after they were defeated. And over there at Ruag, there's also a pin where Dúna is. And between Kilmaluig and Dúna that's where Kouche had to run. He had to run, uh, he had to run east to get, to get the weapons in time for them to to, uh, to properly finish um, the Loch Lanich off. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a common theme throughout the versions I've looked at. Most of these versions I've found on Tobin and Dulhish, um, that, uh, the, that the Islanders or the Fianna, it's interesting, the Fianna are actually only mentioned in three of those. Um, and some of them, 
it actually becomes a story about how the islanders more generally defended themselves against the Lachlan and all by using um, yeah, sheaves of rye or sheaves of oats. Um, it would be a, a source of great pride, I think, actually, um, to be able to say that they could defeat such a mighty enemy that, in that way. And, uh, yeah, and uh, Dahl um, Sinclair is there. He was recorded twice in 1968, and uh, both him and Hector McLean um, used the proverb, as Dahl Sinclair called it, to describe the fate at which the, the Lochlanich met. Svaskuab Korke, Dogo Chris, Amen Chris, Lochlanich, in a Lashen. So, I mean, I'm posing it until I'm proven wrong, um, perfectly, perfectly happy to be proven wrong, that this looks like a narrative that kind of particularly belongs to these islands in Argyllshire. Um, I haven't looked at Irish versions yet, um, but, uh, you know, does that mean that it stands by itself? Well, I know. Because the Gaelic heroic narrative, as I say, it's, there's all sorts of um, really interesting connections and um, it's a very sort of fragmented tradition in many ways. So that brings me to Malcolm McPhail's recounting of this. Now, in 1861, I believe, he was talking to John Francis Campbell. And, uh, and uh, he recounted for him first the story of Doan the Kerstich, Doan the Kerstich, the lay of the smithy. And in brief, it's the story of uh, a race between a character, Durglas, and the fairy smith, and go she, he was another Lachlanach, the fairy smith of Lachlan. This fairy smith <laughs> has one leg and he's got seven arms. But interestingly, he doesn't use his seven arms to like run. So essentially his seven arms are kind of weaving about and he's hopping along on one leg. <laughs> but him and Durglas have a race and they race towards the door of this fairy smith's smithy. Durglas beats him, and because he's successful in, in beating him there, um, himself and the Fianna get access to the smithy, they make um, their swords. And uh, it's also a very interesting story because this story is almost how like Durglas gets to be reborn, forged in the heat of the smithy, he gets a new name. Because somebody in the Fairy Smith's party says, who's that dark, slender fellow? striking the iron so hard and somebody goes oh cool ha cool ha cool he's slender culture Gleva. so he became known as culture from then on but then mcfell after he's after he's told um john francis campbell this he says this was when they got the arms they had before but tunachin they were sticks with sharp ends so a bit of a deviation from sheaves there was a great battle between themselves and the Lochlaners, which was called Lan and Tunichen, the day of the stakes. And then the interviewer also says, this then um, fixes the period um, at the time of the wars with Lochlan in Isla. So there's quite an interesting connection here between, um, between the stories of Duan Kersi, the lay of the smithy, and La Battle Muskuab, the battle of the sheaves, in the character of the newly baptised Koilche. Let's scoot back to Tyree. And uh, in a conversation uh, with John Brown and John, McF uh, John McPhail in Balafuil, um, they're talking about Gilia Cool in the Fane. Gilia Cool in the Fane. Now, the interviewer, Eric Cregan, he says, he says um, no, was that, that was the slender man who was involved in the Battle of the Sheaves. They say, no, 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 there's no connection with him at all. There's no connection with him at all in this story, they say. That happened up at the north end of the island. But this guy was the fastest, he was the fastest one in their group and he was the messenger and he would run from fort to fort at times of trouble. But they, but they ascertained, they said, well, there was absolutely no connection there at all. But this is how they describe him though, this is how they describe him. It is said that this boy was so fast that in delivering his message, you could see him three times, which I would take to be a probable case at that time. It's very similar to the way um, that Dahl Cameron um, describes um, the slender, fastest messenger boy to John Gregerson Campbell in 1865. He says, um, he says this, is, this is a dialogue that happens between Phil and another one of the warriors. Look, if you can see any man coming with the armour. Ah, I see one man. It is thought, that it, it, it is as though he has three heads on him 
Ah, my child is at full speed. His feet are going as high as the top of his head as he comes. And Hector McLean in Ballin and in, um, in Tyree, he says, A village in ha 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 chain. I'm marking big three cast in it. It's like he's got three, three feet. And then, yeah, and then John Gregerson Campbell, he says, you see, the appearance of three was caused by the height at which he lifted his feet. That's how fast Kulche was running, that, that you could see him three times. I really like these stories for the sort of surreal imagery that's conjured with those kinds of statements. Um, so, I mean, um, I'm not trying to find a definite chronology in the events and lives of these characters. As I say, it's a very, very rich, very, very fragmented, entangled tradition. Um, and I also can't speak at this stage uh, to, to, to how popular do in the Kerstik was as a sort of precursor to this story of the Battle of the Sheaves. Um, but it's probably not too out there to um, imagine that Battle in the Scoob might be a sort of inaugural battle of the newly baptized Kulche. They've just, they've just uh, made the weapons, dumped them, gone to do the harvest, and he's sent back. He's just raced, just raced to the door of the smithy, but he's sent back to get the weapons. Away you go, Kulche, and get the weapons. Um, yeah. So, uh, in conclusion, perhaps a wee final word. Um, just, you know, at this stage in my research, it's just been very enjoyable to corroborate these different um, strands of telling and retelling and bring together um, the local environment, especially in Tyree with this one, um, which incorporates hills, local archaeology. It becomes a sort of arena, if you like, for a shared pan-Gallic dialogue about our interactions with these characters as invaders. But also, of course, they were settlers and they were also kings. Um, yeah, and as I say, it's a dialogue that takes us back and forth um, several hundred years and that we can share with our fellow Gallic nations. So, Shinu, and that's all Lachlan are eating chips. Shinchi. Thanks very much for those presentations. It's great to see younger people so enthusiastic and finding out such, just getting involved in new areas of research, and, and that, I, I find that enormously inspirational. So our next speaker is um, Professor Michael Anderson. <laughs> you might, might not believe this, Michael, but I was in awe of you for many years. This is, this is a, a very distinguished economic historian um, who, who um, has written a whole lot of stuff, and the best, the best I know of is, is the population stuff on Scottish population history. But he, was, uh, he also flew through uh, various ranks at the University of, of, of Edinburgh, uh, end, ending up at n near the top, near the top of the University of, of Edinburgh. Um, but subsequent to his retirement, he's continued to carry on research and done some wonderful stuff on population history, and particularly the period after 1860. I don't know if any of you have seen this monumental book um, on that subject, which came out three or four, four, four years ago. Um, and it, um, like, the, like, like one of the books we talked about yesterday, came so close to, to, to winning the prize for the Saltire, the Saltire Society Scottish History Book of the Year. But not quite, not quite, not no, quite. <laughs> but, 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 but very close yeah, by. Yeah. Anyway, we look forward to hearing what you've got to say today about Scotland's population history, particularly in relation to the, to the islands and large and small. So thanks very much, Michael. Thank you. Right, well, hello. And um, I come to this topic from a completely different direction, I suspect, to more or less anybody else who's speaking uh, today. I, I got interested in um, Scotland's population history and originally how Scotland fitted into the rest of the UK and uh, Ireland and, and Europe. And then the more I looked at it, the more it became clear that there wasn't a Scotland. 
there are multiple Scotlands. And in fact, the book that Chris just referred to is called Scotland's Population Histories. And it deliberately seeks to actually um, show the diversities and to link those diversities to economic, social, cultural, um, and indeed even to some extent topographical uh, phenomena. And islands, if you're working at, down to these small levels, islands are very useful because their boundaries don't change. Parishes, which are wonderful for lots of purposes, we've got data going over long periods of time, the only trouble is the boundaries change. Islands, broadly speaking, are the same. So you've got the same, num the, the same space into which different numbers of people do different things over time. That's, where I, that's how I got, got into it. Um, and um, so, anyway, so what for my purposes is an island? An island is um, a, a piece of land on which um, at least one person has been recorded at any time uh, since 1841. And up until actually 1861, there are quite a lot of small islands which kept combined with big ones. So, um, in fact, a lot of what I'll talk about today is the post-1861 islands, which also fits anyway with my wider knowledge. And uh, the other feature is it's completely surrounded by salt water for at least part of every day. So you'll be pleased to know Sky is an island. Um, as also is, for example, Oranze next to, Coron uh, to Colonze, even though you can splash across at, um, uh, 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 at low tide. South Ronaldze is, is, is an island because it's a causeway. Um, and having taken that definition, then some uh, places which have lighthouses on are also islands, even if they're actually uh, quite small. Um, so, in 1841, or sorry, since 1841, there have been about 230 islands um, populated at at least one census. And populated there um, up until, 18, uh, up till 19, 19, 1981, we have the number of people who were recorded living in a on a place on census day. Since then, it's the number of residents. But I'm not bothered about that distinction today, but that's quite important uh, for some examples. Um, more than 230 islands populated. Today, of the surviving islands, 87, um, they, add, they make up about 2% of Scotland's population. Compare... 5.4% of Scotland's population in 1861 on at least 184 islands. Now this highly misleading graph is total island populations. And as you can see over here on the left hand side, we get a rise up to 1841. Uh, that's probably actually a slight exaggeration. Then we get the potato uh, failure and it falls. And then really, right the way through until particularly 1911, um, we have it, things look pretty flat. 1921 is odd, it bumps, because the census was, was held in June when lots of people were on holiday. Lots of people from the mainland were on holiday, so we'll see this happening in a number of places, and sometimes it's very interesting. But the critical thing, really, is that after the First World War, island populations crash. And... Hmm? Oh, island population. doesn't matter. It will, it will manage. Uh, islands population crash. And then, in aggregate, they broadly speaking flatten out. And that, I think, is, 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 is actually really quite interesting. People talk a lot about island depopulations. We look at the whole lot. Actually, since um, 1951, well, certainly since 1971, there's not actually been uh, that much to change. But of course, there is huge variation in populated islands 
by physical size. And it, it's easy to forget just how small many of the populated islands are. I mean, over on the left-hand side, over here, we have um, six islands which are more than um, 500 square kilometers. On the right-hand side, we have almost 100 islands which are less than one square kilometer. And for those of you who like old money, that's about half a mile by three quarters of a, of a mile. Small. Some of them, of course, much, much smaller uh, even than that. And uh, the, so you have this huge proportion of total islands which are actually under um, five... Um, uh, are, are under... Um, uh, five square kilometres. In fact, uh, over 70% of the populated islands over time have been tiny. But of course, much more crucial to us than variations in size, um, variations in population. Now this slightly complicated graph actually is really very simple. The top line, the blue one, looks at islands uh, which in 1861 had populations of more than 15,000. And uh, you can see from the little number up there, there were four of them. And broadly speaking, they look pretty flat over the 19th century. They go down um, after the First World War, uh, right the way through to 1971. And then they, these four big islands, uh, the four big islands... Um, uh, the four big islands, um, 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 uh, uh, Shetland mainland, Orkney mainland, uh, Lewis and Harris counted as one island, um, and Skye. Um, that's what happens to them. The next ones, the red line, populations 5 to 15,000. And this is the 1921 census effect. Because in there, we have got Butte, and we have got um, Aran, and they were, as we shall see, big, big holiday islands. Broadly speaking, um, those islands um, change over time, um, and over time, they fall by about 4%. So by about, um, but so fall by about a sixth. The grey line, the next one, that's islands between 1,000 and 5,000 in 18. Uh, 61, there were 13 of them. There are, all of them are still populated in 2011, but they've fallen about half, by about half. And as we come then, and as Chris said earlier, the smaller the island, the, on average, the bigger the, bigger the problem. Um, 100 uh, to uh, 1,000, the orange line, start off with 45, end up with 39. Six of, even of those have become depopulated. And the final one, this is the islands, 118 of them, with less than 100 people in 1861. By 2011, only 27 have, are still populated. Um, if I'd cut it off, by the way, at um, uh, 20, I would have started with 80, and ended up with five. 20 is very, very crucial. If an island gets below 20, then there's a very high probability that it will not survive for another 20 years. And that goes on again and again and again uh, over, over time. However, there are obviously lots of different islands in different sorts of ways. And how and why, therefore, do the things actually change? And above all, the key point is to try and think about this sort of thing in terms of what I've called population potentials. And population potentials are things that encourage or discourage people to stay on an island, go to an island, leave an island, and they are different at different times. So, for example, slate was a huge boom in the 19th century for one or two islands, and, as we shall see later, virtually disappears. Salt fish sustained, salt and cured fish, sustained island populations until the big market for it, Russia, stopped buying it after the revolution. 
And islands managed perfectly all right without electricity, or rather they thought they did, when there wasn't electricity generally. But over time, the absence of electricity becomes a major factor uh, as well. So what I'm going to try and look at in the next section is what some of those population potentials are. And the first one is location and distance to start with. And notice that I've said distance from the mainland or distance from a big island. And this is very important, I think, because actually, by the time you get to the big islands, like Orkney and Shetland and uh, Skye and um, Lewis, uh, Lewis, a huge proportion of the things that people look for can be provided somewhere on the island. And that, that's why I, I'm not the slightest bit interested in how far um, Shetland is from the mainland. It's something that people always talk about. I'm not interested in that, because actually Shetland is its own almost self-contained island. Uh, sorry, self-contained community. Now this map actually, however, points out that while there are some islands, and actually it misses one uh, of the closest, oh no, there it is, just shown uh, the Cumbres, very close, um, and obviously the, 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 the tidal islands like the Oranzes and Ornzes, um, but some of them are very different. Right out on the left there, um, St Kilda. St Kilda, um, 45 kilometres to the west of uh, Uist. Um, over here, to the left of just above where it says Ben Becula, uh, is the Monarch Islands. And then uh, North Rona, it actually says Rona there, it means North Rona. Um, that actually that was, has hardly been populated uh, since 1841, but there are people who believe that two people, uh, two men, lived on it uh, for a short period of time. But interestingly, distance isn't everything. Um, Fair Isle, halfway between Shetland and Orkney, and Fula, I'll talk more about both of them later, are good surviving island communities, um, at least at the moment. And in some ways, therefore, um, accessibility is more important than distance. And accessibility is, well, we've talked already about um, uh, low tide crossings, causeways, um, the causeway around Kappa Flow, for example, or the causeway between Bara and Vatase, which actually saved Vatase uh, as an island. And then bridges, don't need to talk about bridges here. Um, and then piers, jetties, harbours. One of the great things about both Fair Isle and Fula is you can take boats in. Fula even has an airstrip. Um, but it doesn't always work. Stroma in the Pentland Firth between um, uh, Orkney and Caithness had a wonderful harbour built. And the people were paid to build it. And then, guess what? They all, virtually all, decided to use the money and move to the mainland. Um, and the island, in fact, subsequently became depopulated. And ferries, Great Cumbre, an eight-minute ferry, Kerrera, an easy commute um, across for some people who, who go to, um, uh, to, to Oban. Um, even Butte has weekend commuters and indeed a few people who go across to the mainland every day. But uh, how about that? Three working ferries in Oban Harbour. It's 2011. And what you've got here is you've got the Isle of Mull in the middle going off to um, Craig Muir. Uh, 45 minutes. Lots of people commute 45 minutes 
Um, indeed, um, it's becoming increasingly popular, according to yesterday's newspapers. The Lord of the Isles, sitting there over the, uh, over the, on the left, uh, off to uh, Tyree and Col, uh, four to five hours by, uh, hours by the time you've done it. And the Isle of Lewis, just coming in from Castle Bay, well, that's at least five hours. That's a very different business. But notice also that it isn't just the length of the journey, it's also where you get landed. Um, one of the fascinating things is Isla, which has actually not done nearly as well as you would expect. It's a two-hour ferry journey, and it lands you in the middle of nowhere, really. And actually, people come from Isla, and they get off at Kenna Craig, and then to get to the nearest big supermarket, they go to Oban. And so, actually, what happens at the, the, the terminal itself matters. So that's distance and accessibility. Crucial, but not entirely all, all the story. How about topography? Topography. Um, that shows you uh, hills and mountains. Obviously, very variable. There are some islands like um, Arran, um, and uh, that's... Um, Handa up there, sorry, not Handa, it's um, Hoi up the top there on, on, on Orkney. Um, and large areas of, for example, Mull and, of course, Sky, very mountainous islands. Now, mountains work two ways. They're very attractive to tourists. I don't need to tell anybody here about that. But equally, over time, people have less and less wanted to live higher up islands and indeed to competitively farm higher up islands and actually also you can keep sheep up an island nowadays and up, up a mountain nowadays at least in the lower reaches and in the past they always had to have shepherds and now you don't need in general to have shepherds at least living up there they can drive by car if they want to go um, so topography interesting and explains why some of our islands are so relatively unpopulated compared, for example, with the Azores, where I'm off to in two weeks' time, where the populations of the same size islands are anything up to ten times what they are in the Scottish islands. Our agricultural potential. Well, that's Barvis Moor. Not much goes on out there now, and indeed it was always only um, uh, summer pasture, large, largely. And along with it, um, lazy beds. That's an agriculture which supported people, but becomes decreasingly competitive over time. And indeed, it's a huge amount of work. Um, and indeed, even Macca, very pretty, but actually not particularly good yield arable. Um, and um, that actually deals with most of the outer islands. Contrast, yes, we do have some really good quality arable um, on our islands. That's gear um, off the um, uh, Mull of Kintyre. Um, though actually... By modern competitive standards, those are rather small fields. And so you, even there, um, and it's very exposed, it's not entirely as good as it might be, but how about that? And that's Butte. And actually, the interesting thing, of course, about Butte is Butte strong on mixed agriculture and particularly on dairying as, of course, also was Orkney. Orkney completely different from um, most of the other northern and western isles for that, for that reason. And in fact, this map uh, is the proportion of uh, land under arable and mixed cultivation for parishes uh, in uh, 2007. And uh, you can see, actually, that there is relatively little when you do it at this scale uh, anyway, the, the vast, the, the, the yellow 
is uh, under 10% of land area under arable and mixed cultivation. And that's the dominant. Um, incidentally, uh, Colin Tyree, which some of you will think that's odd, um, coal is not uh, the sort of island where you think of there being a high level of... Um, of, of and that's because Col and Tyree are one parish. Uh, it's, it's where you get into a, an interesting problem. But basically, a notice, however, notice Orkney and a notice Butte and a notice indeed, though it doesn't come up very clearly, notice Gear. That's a, a, an indication of what I would call um, agricultural potential. But it isn't just how agriculture, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the land, it's also uh, how land was organised. And this, from some work I'm doing at the moment, um, shows the percentage of household heads who were crofters or other small agriculturalists, because they didn't all call themselves crofters, um, in 1881. And this is showing you the result, in a sense, of, of clearances. Um, Isla down here, uh, effectively really Mull, even to some extent uh, Tyree, uh, Orkney, because largely there, because of its large, larger scale farming, a typical um, agricultural unit, even the low level ones there, tended to be oh, uh, 20, 30, 40 acres and similarly, fishing. You can't get fish everywhere. Fishing potential is um, really very uh, variable in terms of fish stocks. And as we know, some of them go away. But it isn't just the fish stocks. It's also what you do with the fish when you've got it. And therefore, there's not much point in being able to catch fish if you can't actually get it to market and that requires you to have a harbour or something uh, within reasonable difference. And actually, again, not just um, the, uh, the potential, but also how it's organised. And this is, I think, quite interesting. This actually shows the huge importance, this number of fishermen, the huge importance of um, fishing in uh, Harris and, uh, and Lewis in 1881, uh, otherwise Shetland, otherwise Barra, otherwise um, uh, Strath. Um, interestingly, 1881 is a very crucial year because if it was 1891, there would have been a very substantial reduction, uh, particularly in, um, uh, in, 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 in Barvas. Uh, and, uh, and, and Uig and Lochs because the fishing failed and the, the increasing size of boats and the fact that it wasn't local fishing uh, anymore, it was essentially um, big fishing from those big ports uh, on the Caithness coast and indeed um, around the Murray Firth. Right, some other sources of incomes. This is fairly straightforward. Uh, natural endowments, quarries for marble and slate and things. Uh, scenery, hugely exploited here. That's a natural endowment if ever there was one. Wildlife, which can also similarly be exploited. They're experts at this on, on, on Isla now. Uh, economic activities, tourism, whiskey, surfing, sea Tyree. Military activities, we'll come back from some examples of that in a minute. Lighthouses, manned lighthouses, um, as bases for commuting. Um, yes, we've talked really about this already. Some islands are significant uh, bases uh, for, commute, uh, for commuting. And um, administrative, professional, public services, big retail, holiday centres, they themselves can generate and support a huge amount of rural community. One of the fascinating things about Scotland now, is that as, a, as a country as a whole, is that the rural population it has been rising, mostly because people commute into the big, bigger towns. Not green, but that's how Inverness, for example, 
has grown substantially, and it's also the case, certainly, uh, on, uh, on Lewis. Drive back into, um, into Stornoway in the uh, uh, late afternoon, and the traffic will be pouring out into Lochs, into Barvas, um, in the other direction. And the size of the urban centres, I think, shocked me when I actually did this calculation. 72% of the population of Butte, of Butte lives in Rossi. 54% uh, of the population of mainland Orkney in, 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 in Kirkwall, and you can read the rest. Put, sky is interesting, because it's actually only 22%, and you may be able to explain that uh, better than I can. Now, now for some actual um, population uh, changes. Here we go. How has this diversity been reflected over time? Well, the larger islands, here we have them at the top. Harrison Lewis, that huge expansion of fishing. And also the huge investment by the Mathesons and Leverhulme, maligned people, but they were putting in huge amounts of money and supporting huge amounts of people, um, even if not where, exactly always where they would have wanted to live. But you get that huge expansion up to 1911, fishing collapses and uh, only a small recovery. Next one, Shetland mainland, that's oil. Uh, the next one, Orkney, um, there's a bit of oil there too, but there's some, something more uh, in Orkney, which I can't at the moment explain. And here's Skye in dread decline right down to 1971, the orange line, and then recovery. Well, it's not the bridge because it starts too early, but um, it's actually uh, must to a considerable extent, I think, be tourism. Very different picture. Uh, this is the Uists and uh, Barra and Benbecula. Ben um, they expand up to 1871, and then, well, South Uist, the blue line, North Uist, the grey line, go down and are still in serious decline. Bimbecula follows them, but then that's military installation, the airport and everything else. See, the different islands, they look the same, but you've got a completely different kind of population potential. And the, the orange one, that's Barra. Fishing, decline, and actually, recently, some recovery. The larger Argyle Islands, not much good story there, other than Mull. And Mull has actually been a great success as a tourist island, and actually, we'll see in a minute, attracting in older people. I've got the figure somewhere, wait a minute, we'll come, we'll come up to it in a minute. It's a huge proportion. Then, just to show you, well, sand day, very sad. It's my, I think it's the prettiest of the Orkney Islands, but it's gone from 2,200-ish to about 500. Um, interestingly, um, South Ronalds Bay looked very similar, but that has a causeway, and people now commute. And Unst, this flattening here, was the military installation, which subsequently uh, went into decline. And by contrast, just to have some good news, Wolsey, actually the only island that in 2011 had a larger population than it had ever had before. And that's because it has specialised in a fishing, uh, a specialist fishing facilities. And Barra West, um, that actually is bridges. They built bridges between Barra West and Barra East and a little island called Trondra, and all their populations have gone up uh, because, again, they are they're then connected to uh, the rest of the island group. Okay. Oh, and finally, well, there's Butte. 
That's the holiday trade. And then people start not going from Glasgow to Butte for their holidays. They start getting on planes and going to the Mediterranean. And Butte has never recovered since. Aaron has done better. Um, Aaron has fascinating geology and lots of other things. I think that's possibly tourism. And Great Cumbrae is actually, well, not been doing too well. And if indeed they triple the ferry prices or whatever they're going to do, um, that's not going to be very good either. So, how about the smaller islands? Well, we've talked quite a lot already um, about, um, I think, um, the smaller islands. Um, there's St Kilda. We know about that one. Pabe, different Pabe. I thought we'd have to have a different Pabe. And that's the Pabe south of Barra. Um, 26 people in 1881, 9 in 1911. Mingule, a bit, they, they were some of the people who actually left from there uh, and went, in fact, to Vatase. And just to show that um, it isn't just in that period, that's Scarp, seen from Harris. Scarp, an interesting island. Um, and uh, it, that's the landing stage. That's the one where they got so fed up with not being able to get their mail that they actually started trying firing it by rocket. It didn't work. So the question then, why are so many small islands inhabited for so long? Or indeed, uh, some are still are. Well, lighthouses are one. Land hunger following clearance from elsewhere. Shepherds with sheep. There are some islands that just have a shepherd and sheep. Um, close to fishing, close to bird cliffs. Conserving or observing nature. Uh, Gavin Maxwell in the little island under the, school, under the, uh, under the bridge. A desire for um, privacy. That's him too. And living life one's own way. And... I haven't talked about culture, but actually culture is very important in encouraging people to develop, particularly to stay, the, the culture of having access to land. But also, um, in Fula, um, Fula is a very traditional island where the men still have their meetings, like they did on St Kilda, and where um, they're still on the Julian calendar. Right, so why have some islands then declined? Well, you automate the lighthouses, um, kelp, local fisheries, the slate, office, the slate, uh, I, um, the slate um, business changed. Bill Nahua had a population of 146 in 1871. Eastdale had a population of 504 in 1871, the slate islands. Demographic imbalance, we've talked about that already today. Um, not enough um, women, because they have to, are, are usually um, come in. Um, and above all, a shortage of men to man the boats. Um, rising living standards, electricity, cr critical in that context. And then, well, we talked again, and we all know about unreliability of access to services, education, health came up this morning. And of course, simply, the small technologies on the small islands can't compete in the market. Bigger boats. Nobody has a proper big-sized tractor uh, nowadays uh, on any of the smaller Scottish islands. But some survived, and there we are. And the, if the economies become diversified, moving below, beyond agri-fish, what do you need? You need interesting tourist attractions, a long season. One of the problems that Tyree uh, had was it only had a tourist season of about two months, um, plus accommodation. And, of course, the prime example, with its influence also onto Mull, and it has staffer as well. And finally, targeted in migration. Get in young families. But also, get in the elderly. Um, Butte did it. And Mull, I found the figure, 27% of the population of Mull 
born in England in 2011. It's a really, 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 I think, significant figure. And finally, well, we know all about this, people determined to stay. So what happens? Well, actually, in this period, not much mass clearance. The young leave. Importantly, very, very, very few people come in, particularly to some of the islands. And whoops, sorry. And what that in, you end up with is a highly skewed uh, population pyramid. Um, Cumbrays, 39% of the population of the Cumbrays over the age of um, 65. So, conclusion. Most islands have lost many, if not most, of their past strengths, the past reasons why people moved there. Only some managed to acquire new ones for their presence. The legacies of the past, therefore, have left us with islands, with populations that the infrastructure and the, re and the, the potentials don't really adequately support. Diversity will always rule. And thinking then about population policies, what is crucial is that we don't allow the Scottish Government to go on thinking about an island policy. Unless their island policy is that it supports and recognises differences. And that's where we are. Thanks very much, Michael. That's why I'm in awe of him. He does these wonderful presentations. So there we are. Th thank, you very, thank you very much. You know, Michael said earlier um, this today he was very tired, didn't sleep well last night. Didn't look like it there. You've recovered very well. Okay, folks, so um, it's now lunchtime, and could you therefore be back um, by 20 past, 20 past one? So, see you then.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I wish I could say that in Gaelic, but I can't, so I won't try. Um, this afternoon's session, we begin with uh, Donald Stewart, who is a senior lecturer here at Solmore Osteg. He's, uh, he runs a course which um, I can't simply, it's a lot of words and I can't pronounce any of them, but basically ma material history. Material culture and high <laughs> That's right. But um, he's doing all sorts of interesting work, and I think the fact he's doing interdisciplinary work is something we actually... We try, try but we try. try. But it's brave, too, because it's not always approved of, as you, as you know, but it's great, it's great. And he's doing all sorts of things that fascinated me, like, for example, this life of, um, of uh, Martin Martin, who's such an important source for, for those of us interested in highlands and islands. Um, today's talk is... Well, it's almost... It's not, it's not quite there. It's... it's Dr. Johnson and Samuel and, jo and Boswell's tour, 250 years on. Yep. Why, why were they here? Yeah, yeah, why, why, why were they here? here? What, what were they, they doing? doing? And uh, what was everybody else doing when they were here? Um, well, I didn't take that much thought to, to choose a subject for today because this autumn, as you've just said, is 250 years since Johnson and Boswell made their momentous journey to the Hebrides. Uh, so I suppose it may be a modest reconsideration of a couple of weeks of their expedition might educate, entertain, and inform, and help to contribute to the topics, the debates, and the discussions raised by other speakers and by ourselves, the audience, uh, during today. Um, researching the history and literature of the Scottish Gale talk inevitably means investigating and analysing the, the plethora of eyewitness accounts of the Highlands by outside observers and weighing them up against local or indigenous sources, whether composed in Gaelic or in English. So I'm, I'm pushing a wee bit back against Callum, Callum MacLean here. Um, now, in, in, in British history writing, this remains a somewhat unusual uh, approach, though potentially it's extremely fruitful, uh, as demonstrated by the great success of Claire Jackson's excellent blockbuster, Devil Land, England Under Siege, 1588-1688. Uh, it leans heavily upon the accounts of, to quote the blurb, stupefied foreigners observing 17th century England and the English. So that's what we'll do today. We'll look at a couple of stupefied uh, foreigners and see what they thought about the Highlands. Uh, so before beginning, a uh, very brief tribute to my colleagues in Aberystwyth in Glasgow, with whom I was working on the Curious Travellers Project, researching the informants, guides and hosts who assisted, advised and informed the Welsh traveller uh, and author Thomas Pennant during his two tours to the Scottish Highlands in 1769 and 72, the year before Johnson and Boswell made their trip. And uh, this sort of research highlighted the significance and the critical agency of often overlooked local mediators, local cultural brokers in shaping Pennant's journeys and observations, often through their own independent networks. And also a very brief shout out again to colleagues in Glasgow with whom I was working analysing the life papers and literary circles of the late 18th century antiquarian and song collector, the Reverend James McLagan of Blair Athol. And I can't help but, without bringing this man in as well, the uh, voluminous archive, which I was working on for over 10 years, of the late 19th century folklore collector and editor, Alexander Carmichael. So I was working in my elbows, up to my elbows, in messy field notebooks and multiple rough drafts. And that really brings home to you the initial the, the sort of the contingency, the uncertainty, the ambiguity experienced doing fieldwork before everything is eventually magically converted into the smooth, neat certainty of print. So over the next few minutes, we'll take a wee excursion with Boswell and Johnson. We'll pick them up in Glen Morrison on Tuesday, the 31st of August, 1773, and we'll take our leave of them in Razi on Sunday, the 12th of September. So we've got nearly a fortnight to look at. The primary texts are Johnson's very stately journey to the Western Islands of Scotland and Boswell's much more lively journal uh, and the even livelier um, uh, manuscript uh, of uh, which was uh, ed edited see, by Portal and Bennett, a very, very interesting manuscript and a very interesting history. Uh, also bring to your attention uh, Ronald Black's very unjustly neglected by John Sonian's excellent combined edition of Johnson and Boswell there. It's an excellent read with excellent notes attached. Uh, throughout their journey to the West, Boswell and Johnson were constantly surprised at how Highlanders were already considerably more integrated 
socially, economically, and culturally into the wider nation than they had expected at first. Many um, Scottish Gales were not ignorant at all of the names and reputation of Dr. Samuel Johnson or indeed of James Boswell. And as we shall see in Sky, there was even a group of MacLeod gentry who had clearly been preparing for their visit for some time in advance. So let's begin with the surprise Johnson and Boswell felt when they were staying in the inn of Ernoch, Tainernich, in Glen Morrison on the way to Sky. The inn where they were staying was built partly of stone and partly of wattle and turf, and they saw that the landlord, Lachlan McQueen, he owned a small library, including a copy of some parts, at least of a very popular history of the Jews during the biblical era, composed by Humphrey Prido, Dean of Norwich, as well as a volume of The Spectator. Um, their surprise, not just at the fact that McQueen, a gentleman innkeeper who had married a laird's daughter, could not only speak and read English, but actually own some books, clearly elicited a sharp retort. McQueen not only had fluent, grammatically correct English, but he could also write Latin and, uh, and, and Gaelic as well, indeed. Uh, McLe McQueen's claims to civility uh, did not entirely put Boswell at his ease, as you can see. Uh, Boswell awoke early the next morning, terrified that the landlord was going to murder them for their money, then blame the detachment of soldiers, which were then billeted that night in his barn. Um, but if it weren't for Johnson and Boswell, we wouldn't have their eyewitness accounts of Lachlan McQueen, nor would we have this very informative note in the bottom left-hand corner about the innkeeper, Lachlan McQueen, compiled by Robert Carruthers, the editor of the Inverness Courier, in his Highland Notebook of 1843. Nor would we realise that Lachlan McQueen had composed two praise poems to military heroes, which you can see in the bottom there, um, impeccably following the Gaelic panegyric code, rounding off the major anthology of Gaelic poetry published in Inverness in 1806. So McQueen was a bard and an innkeeper. He lived in a house partly stone and partly a creel house, and he wrote traditional Gaelic panegyric poetry, and he also read The Spectator. So good different cultures coming together, much to the surprise of Johnson and Boswell. Now, as I've said, the names of Johnson and Boswell were hardly unfamiliar to the chiefs and to the taxmen of Skye. Johnson, poet, critic, essayist, editor, and lexicographer, the travellers met with a small copy of Johnson's Dictionary in Lachlan McKinnon's house at Corachatochan. But Johnson was also known at the time as a friend of the Gael because of his decisive intervention when he wrote a scathing letter to the bookseller William Drummond in Edinburgh on the 13th of August, 1766, supporting the translation of the New Testament into Scottish Gaelic and decrying opposition to the scheme in the ranks of the SSPCK. James Boswell was also well known, not just as the son of one of the most influential judges in the court of justiciary, that is, uh, Alexander Lord Auchinleck, but in 1769, Boswell composed a series of songs, newspaper articles, pamphlets, a novella, adjutory reviews of the novella, uh, which helped to influence and swing public opinion regarding the most celebrated, scandalous, and complex legal case of the decade, if not the 18th century, the Douglas Cause. And the defeat of the Duke of Hamilton's party and the victory of the putative nephew of the Duke of Douglas was widely celebrated throughout Scotland, including, as you can see here, in Sky and Razi, a newspaper report here saying that the, the, the people in Razi, they, they celebrated so much that they, they, they set fire to the entire top of Duncana, which burnt for three days and three nights, and they, they drunk the health liberally with many a bicker of whiskey, and the same thing happened at Dunvegan, where there's a great bonfire of whiskey, cinnamon, and sugar. So, uh, you know, integrated into the popular culture as well, uh, increasingly, economically and socially. Also, of course, there are James Boswell's ties with the McDonald's of Slate themselves, with whom they were going to stay in Skye. Boswell had known and admired the previous chief, Sir James, who had died tragically young while in Rome on the Grand Tour. 
and he was close friends with Sir James's brother and heir and eventual successor, Sir Alexander, who succeeded in 1761, and he was also friends with his wife, Elizabeth Boswell. Indeed, he jokingly claimed to be Elizabeth Boswell's cousin, and he had courted her himself before she married Sir Alexander MacDonald. Boswell and Sir Alexander, as you can see, were already writing. They were writing light-hearted letters to each other, and they were already, in spring 1773, discussing the proposed expedition to the Hebrides. MacDonald promised them all possible assistance. You'll come to my house, come there in high summer, in July and August, and I'll do all I can to help you out. Don't delay. You have to visit in high summer. But none of this came to pass. Let's leave the weather for the time being and briefly look at the arrival of Johnson and Boswell in Skye. During what was clearly an arduous 40-mile trek at the, the coast, they went on the military road down through Glenshield, then they zigzagged over Mamratakan, the, the Ratakan Pass, over into Glenelg, then they spent a grim night at the Glenelg Inn. Um, we can show that Boswell was doing his best to keep his 64-year-old companion's spirits up with promises of a generous hospitality and the food and the drink which he'd shortly enjoy at his friend MacDonald's mansion in Skye. But the two fell out, Johnson and Boswell, they fell out badly in the journey and this quarrel greatly affected Boswell. Mr. Johnson's anger had affected me much. I considered that without any bad intention, I might suddenly forfeit his friendship. So with many weeks of demanding, grueling travel ahead of them, Boswell must have been increasingly apprehensive that if this was how their friendship suffered in the first really challenging day of travel, then clearly it would be seriously tested numerous times in the days ahead. So they arrived at Armadale the next day, Thursday the 2nd of September, full of expectations. And despite a friendly welcome from Sir Alexander, clad in tartan, and his lady, the house was a disappointment. A very good tenant's house, having two stories and garrets, but it seemed very poor for a chief. Even worse, Mr. Johnson and I were to have had but one room, an arrangement Boswell hastily rectified. The stay at Armadale was a letdown. They had an ill-dressed dinner, there was no conviviality, and graceless manners from the host. Boswell haps on the meanness and unsuitable appearance of everything. And talking to Highlanders in the company, Boswell realised that Sir Alexander was remarkably unpopular among his clan. He went on to initiate two quarrels between himself and the chief, as well as setting Dr Johnson himself upon him. Boswell was clearly disappointed and embarrassed about his erstwhile friend Sir Alexander's rudeness and cold welcome. He also wanted to patch up his recently tense relationship with Dr Johnson, and I suppose the best way for, for, in his mind was for the two of them to join forces against a mutual adversi adversary. And it looks as if Boswell was prepared to sacrifice his long-standing friendship with the Macdonalds of Slate, and indeed his legal work on behalf of the family, in order to salvage his rapport, his good relationship with Dr. Johnson. And that's Sir Alexander finding out what Boswell had written about him when the tour was published, the journal was published in 1785. There's a, a lawsuit going on there. But anyway, let's leave our characters bickering in the strained little house in Armadale. And we'll take a wee step back and we'll look at the reasons behind the tensions and the disaffection felt by clan taxmen and tenantry in sky towards the chiefs. And this, of course, leads us to the environmental, the economic and the social poly crisis, which is a word I learnt yesterday, uh, which had been overwhelming the people of the Western Islands, Highlands for the previous three or four years. The late 1760s had been a time of economic optimism in the region. Looking back from the end of the century, the gifted social historian John Ramsay of Octotyre describes these years in the Highlands and indeed in Scotland as a whole as a South Sea moment. That is, a short-lived post-war economic bubble followed by a swift and painful crash. 
In the Western Highlands, the bubble was mainly due to a very steep rise in cattle prices. They had already been high in the decades after the 45 rising. Now, the droving trade, as you know, was the backbone of the clan system. It was encouraged by taxmen and tenants' needs to pay money rents rather than the food renders, which had been the case in the past. And as you can see here, the price of marketable beasts increased by nearly two-thirds in the two decades from the middle of the century. Um, as you can see here, uh, there was a, a, a rise of about 1760, and then the final years of the 1760s was a very, very sharp rise again. Of course, the reality of the profits being made from commercial cattle production and the anticipation of increasing yields from the droving trade encouraged the augmentation of rents at all levels of clan society. Most Highland estates, of course, were already heavily indebted. They needed money. When tax were auctioned off to the highest bidder, taxmen were willing to bid high for leases and pass on the rental burden to the tenantry. The process isn't so clear from the surviving MacDonald of Slate papers, but we can see it working through in the neighbouring MacLeod estate. That's uh, the, the red on the left there, the MacLeod and Vegan estate. Where in early 1769, advisors for the ageing absentee chief Norman MacLeod, a contemptible man known, to, known in oral tradition as Androch the, the wicked man, he posted newspaper advertisement, advertisements in an effort to encourage competitive bidding, or at least to encourage the fear of potential competitive bidding, and thus to screw up rents as high as they could go. We can only imagine how reading these, uh, these advertisements in the, the, the Scottish press went down at home. But the result was that the MacLeod estate rental, which was £2,595 in 1754, it increased in 1769 to £4,316, a two-thirds increase broadly parallel to the increase in cattle prices that we've seen over the same period. Now, this isn't only a case of sharply augmented rents, which can be measured quantitatively as long as the sources are extant, but there's also the less measurable but no less real effect of changes in chiefly, chiefly style, in chiefly behaviour, and indeed in chiefly character and self-identity. And this is what the social historian Ramsey of Octotyre, who knew the Highlands well, describes as an universal change in the views and dispositions of Highland proprietors of all descriptions. Here he's writing, had the business been conducted with temper and address, he would have got something handsome, that is putting up the rents without injuring the people or raising any ferment, uh, ferment. but the avowed contempt some of them showed for maxims once held sacred, and the little value set in hereditary attachments gave more offence than even the sudden rise of rents. And this is to do with, with what Robert Dodgson describes as the contrasting ideologies of tenant and chiefs, and Alan McInnes is phrasing the assimilation of the clan elite into the Anglo-Scottish landed classes. But it comes through con concretely when Boswell notes in Armadale when Captain MacDonald and Mr. McQueen came in after we sat down to dinner, Sir Alexander let them stand round the room and stuck his fork into a liver pudding instead of getting room for them, made for them. I took care to act as he ought to have done. Uh, the final crucial part of this polycrisis was the environmental catastrophe, the terrible weather conditions, and then the from, from 1769 onwards, followed by social disarray, food shortages, waves of acute epidemic diseases, and resultant mortality, mortality crisis uh, of cattle and of people, which burst upon the highlands and lasted for five years. Um, this particular period of severe weather is, is little studied in English historiography, uh, as England was little affected by it, thanks to its favorable geographical position, and the fact that England possessed at the time a relatively efficient poor law. It's quite different on the northern European continent, particularly in Scandinavia and certain of the German lands and in Bohemia. Um, there we see the same pattern of unseasonable coldness, storms, 
and unseasonable precipitation throughout the summer, which we see reported in the Western Scottish Highlands. So the wet summers and the terrible winters led to heavy losses of cattle and, of course, a shortage of cash and inability to pay food, uh, not to mention, you know, once the cattle dies, there's no more manure to put on the, 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 the tallow, the, 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 the ground for crops. Um, grain prices, which we have here for the Inverness, are fierce. Um, they're not enormously above the usual, but the point is, of course, that people are no longer able to afford it. In a region where people were still mostly dependent upon grain rather than the potato, the situation rapidly became desperate with a total breakdown in already shaky clan cohesion with tensions exacerbated within the clan elite, between the elite and the tenantry, and within the tenantry themselves. It's not surprising that among all the other epidemics, we have an epidemic of emigration, particularly in North Carolina, and this rapidly spreads across the Scottish Gaeltoch, all parts, all regions, beginning in September 1769, Nyla and the surrounding islands, from whence people had uh, emigrated North Carolina from 1739 onwards as a chain migration. But by 1771, the emigration epidemic has reached Sky, and the next two years saw a series of organized emigrations from Sky and throughout the Northwest Highlands, increasingly encouraged by favorable reports and letters back from emigrants who had made the journey in previous years. So, what happened here in the early 1770s is what we would today call climate-induced migration. Now, as a second son, Sir Alexander MacDonald had not been expected nor educated to be a chief, and it showed. Living for much of the year in London, he was unable to deal with the clan gentry or tenantry at home. He didn't know how to, he couldn't lead. And matters were worse by his always being compared to his talented and at least in retrospect, widely beloved elder brother, Sir James, who's on the, the right there. And we have an anonymous letter written to him on the 13th of June, 1770, just when this crisis was, uh, was taking off. A Highland chief must preserve the affection of his clan. He must look upon them as his kinsmen and behave like a father to them. If he does not, the best and most general principle may wither. And instead of being a respectful chieftain, he may find himself a puny tyrant. You have the honour of being a MacDonald. Don't let us see you a mock Donald. The situation was somewhat different on the other great estate in Skye, that of the MacLeods of Dunvegan. Norman MacLeod, the absentee Droch a wicked man, was widely despised, but his grandson and heir was a young man, also Norman. The MacLeod estate was heavily indebted, Clan gentry were losing their patience with the Drogheny. And in 1771, young Norman, who we see here in later life in India, you can see the, the elephant in the middle of the picture, um, he recently, he was dispatched to Skye with Major John MacLeod of Talisker, who had recently returned from the Dutch service, and effectively he was the, the, the main advisor for the estate administration. And in Skye, the young man tried to win over the clan with his, with his youthful charisma. He promised to reset chiefly relations with them. He summoned together people from different districts. He liberally treated the tenantry to whiskey punch. And he, said, I, he wrote later, I besought them to love their young chieftain, to renew with him the ancient manners. I promised to live among them. I threw myself upon them. I recalled to their remembrance an ancestor who had also found his estate in ruin and whose memory was held in the highest veneration. I desired every district to point out some of their oldest and most respected men to settle with me in every claim, and I promised to do everything for the relief which in reason I could. Crucially, a process was begun, resulting in a rent reduction of £785, 11 shillings, which is nearly 20%, a substantial sum. Following the death of his grandfather in 1772, young Norman MacLeod did as he had promised and came to live in Dunvegan with his mother and his three sisters. And while he was living there, Dr. Johnson and James Boswell came to call. Now, while they were with MacDonald at Armadale, Johnson and Boswell were uh, advised before calling at Dunvegan to visit Rasi. Uh, among them advising was Rory Roderick MacDonald in Sandig over in Glenelg, whose wife, Florence MacLeod, was none other than the sister of Malcolm MacLeod, uh, the chief of Rasi. So on Monday, 
6th of September, they set off to Corachatochan, where they were well looked after by Lachlan McKinnon there and his wife, entertained with food, drink and song for two wet, stormy days, and then ferried over to Rasi by a crew led none other than Malcolm MacLeod, Prince Charles's pilot, when he was outlawed after Culloden. And the crew lustily sang Jacobite songs. They talk about, this Boswell talking about Malcolm MacLeod here, he says, was a stout, well-made person, well-proportioned, a manly countenance browned with the weather, but a ruddiness in his cheeks, a good way up which his rough beard extended, a quick, lively eye, not fierce in his look, but firm and good-humoured. He had a pair of brogues, tartan hose which came up only near to his knees and left them bare, a purple kilt, a black waistcoat, a short green cloth coat with a gold cord, large blue bonnet with a gold thread button. I never saw a figure that was more perfectly a representative of a Highland gentleman. I wished much to have a picture of him just as he was. I found him frank and polite in the true sense of the word. Malcolm raised an air song, hatching foam, foam aethi, to which he gave Jacobite words of his own. The tune was o'er the moor among the heather, Highlandized. The boatman and Mr. McQueen uh, chorused and all went well. At length, Malcolm himself took an oar and rowed like a hero. So I did a wee bit of painting and this is what it actually looks like, colorized. It's pure Gallic kitsch. It's high camp. The intrepid travelers were met in Rassi shore by the MacLeod clan elite to with the, 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 the young chief of MacLeod who done vacant at their head. They knew exactly what Johnson and Boswell would enjoy and that's what they got. A hefty dose of romantic, Jacobite, patriarchal nostalgia. Once we begin to take this perspective, we can't but notice all the stage managing that's going on when Johnson and Boswell are in Sky and Rasi. In Rasi, they have a party every night, they have music, they have song, they have dancing, they have the ten beautiful daughters of MacLeod of Rasi serving them. The MacLeod clan elite knew exactly what they were doing. They were giving the strangers an idealised picture of clan society. And as we've seen, they knew fine well who John Johnson and Boswell were. The more I reflect on it, the more I think that Johnson and Boswell were deliberately taken over to Rasi in order to keep them away as long as possible from the Isle of Skye at a time when, as James Hunter writes in his great history of the MacLeods, island society was basically falling apart and the emigration ship Nestor was waiting in Portree Harbour to take hundreds of islanders on board for North Carolina. Clan MacLeod were royally entertaining Johnson and Boswell in a little secluded island where they could play at being chiefs. It's a kind of PR stunt. For some more extra evidence, just to finish off, um, how about a letter written by the clan lawyer, John Mackenzie of Delvine, to the young chief, Norman MacLeod, where you have the words, a steady perseverance in your good relations will win you more credit than Dr. Johnson's puffs. This wasn't written before Dr. Jo after Dr. Johnson. This is written before Dr. Johnson came, three weeks before he arrived in, in Skye. The clan lawyer knew what the MacLeod's plans were. He knew what the clan was going, to, uh, was going to do. It was going to spend an awful lot of money on Johnson and Boswell. In island tradition, Johnson and Boswell's sojourn was remembered because the terrible men that they were, they were doing nothing but drinking and partying all the time, leaving long-lasting debts behind them. In the words of uh, a satire uh, written on Johnson, um, he was expensive to look after and uh, the sense of betrayal was worse because what he wrote in the tour uh, was so wounding to girls. Good Traum and Heather, Fardich, De Hiller, Chamar, Sagoch. So I hope this has suggested the agency of at least some of the members of the MacLeod clan gentry in steering Johnson and Boswell and their narrative during the trip. At times it was like Laurel and Hardy wandering through a disaster zone, Johnson and Boswell. The primary aims, I suggest, would including boosting the good name, not only of the MacLeods as a whole, but in particular, the younger generation. They were giving them status, they were giving them credit, which might help them with professional and political careers. And of course, it gave them a romantic cachet for the late 18th century marriage market. But also, to finish off this brief glimpse, the frantic partying may not have been entirely to do with Johnson and Boswell alone. It may also have been an attempt by the clan gentry to, as it were, realign the young chief's ideology with their own by carrying out madly generous acts of traditional hospitality, a calculated but nevertheless extremely risky act of conspicuous expenditure. If you like, it's a clan potlatch with fascinating Jacobite undertones. 
in honor of the two celebrated visitors, of course, but also maybe to strengthen clan solidarity, to demonstrate clan resilience, and to integrate the young chief into his kindred during a challenging time of dearth, deprivation, and social tension. So in this talk today, I've been highlighting ideas that don't just relate to the island's past, but they have resonance today, and perhaps even more so tomorrow. Climate emergencies and climate refugees, community resilience and community stress under market volatilities and pressure, cultural shift and power differentials, absentee landlords, the significance of winning influential friends in high places, conspicuous consumption, tourism and the temptations of intentionally representing your own culture for outsiders, even the place and power of celebrity influencers. So I'm sure that you're having a few thoughts of your own just now, so let's take our leave of the two travellers in Rasi, and maybe we'll return to them later on this year. Thanks very much. Provocative, Marahush, Chris. Uh, yeah, so that, that was that was very interesting indeed. Um, now we're going to move on to a couple more of the of the snapshots of um, of work that our PhD students are undertaking, and it's a great pleasure to introduce now Dr. Court Gordon Cameron, who's just completed his PhD um, working. With, uh, as a student of Somorostig, working also with the Language Sciences Institute in, in, in Venice at, at UHI. Um, he's a graduate of the University of Aberdeen and also of our own Somor's own um, MSc uh, in Kultuduch Sochizarno that, that Don William was mentioning before, that Hugh Cheap and, and Don William lead. Um, and he's been working over the past few years on a PhD looking at Gaelic language and culture as societal assets, and it's on that topic that he's going to be speaking just now. So welcome to Gordon. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can all hear me OK. Um, my work was necessarily island-focused for the PhD because, as I'm going to show you in a moment, the bulk of the Gaelic-speaking communities still exist on islands. I spoke to and visited a number of agencies, individuals, businesses, organisations right across Scotland to try to understand how Gaelic language and culture can be viewed as societal assets and how they can be supported to allow Gaelic-speaking communities to face the economic, demographic and social challenges that they have today. So it's an issue to do with the past, but also the future, about vitality and resilience, about sustainability. How are decisions made in mainland centres affecting island communities and peripheral areas? What can we do to make sure that the lessons of the past can be turned around to boost the future sustainability of these areas? At heart, then, the research is about people and culture and economy. How can we trace pathways to future imaginaries, to new futures. Uh, I should also say I come from Applecross, which is almost like an island in and of itself. It's not always easy to get to. Travel is a challenge. The roads are often blocked. So the same issues affect a lot of the highland mainland communities as well as the islands. Um, there's been much in the press lately about Corran Ferry, for example, and travel issues and sustainability and economics, so um, it's a wide-ranging and very impactful topic. 
Uh, there was three elements to the data gathering for the PhD, a deep dive into the literature, but the two major um, elements were running concurrently, interviews with elite leaders in economy, governance, social development, language development, and a survey of participants in a purported Gaelic social economy, so jobs that might have been Gaelic essential or Gaelic desirable, organisations which had a Gaelic remit of some kind. So how does policy, national language policy for Gaelic, assist the Gaeltach speaker group, the Highlands and the Islands, to meet those challenges? We're at a critical point. The 2022 census uh, data is coming soon, we hope. And that's going to show us, to a great extent, how the policies since the Gaelic Act in 2005 have succeeded or not. So how does current provision work? How do people view it? It's going to be a very brief glimpse because the responses um, were quite nuanced and they need a bit more deep dive than just a quick 10-minute uh, talk. Presentation is important. So the map on the left is presented by local authority area, so it presents a much stronger looking picture of Gaelic vitality right across the highlands and the, the northwest seaboard. It's supposed to be 15% and over Gaelic speaking. That's not really the case. It's the map on the right hand side that's tinted in green that gives us a much clearer picture. When you look at, uh, at the map in real close detail in localities and local areas, we can see that the bulk of the Gaelic speaking strength is in the Western Isles still, sky to an extent and parts of the northwestern seaboard. Uh, my own area there, I always big up Alcross, it was about 35% in the last census. So um, in percentage terms of density, we were the, the strongest Gaelic speaking area on the mainland, even though the numbers were smaller. So how do you quantify the Gaelic speaker group? Um, this is a controversial topic. I looked at all the data zones in the census and I worked out how many people in each data zone spoke Gaelic. And as we can see, there are 44 data zones out of almost 7,000 in which 100 people or more speak Gaelic. And those 44 data zones are all islands. 36 in the Western Isles, seven in Skye, one in Tyree. So what you actually have is a very concentrated uh, it's about 12,200, you could say, is the active speaker group in the Western Isles in the north of Skye. Um, Scalpe and the North Harris data zone, almost 500 individuals. That's the highest by number. The biggest percentage is 60%. That's in Galson and um, Dell in Lewis. So the Gaelic speaker group, the people that use Gaelic most often on a daily basis, perhaps more often at home, they are in island communities. That's our recent snapshot of the past. The Gaelic workforce is also really instructive. What does the Gaelic workforce show us? This is not necessarily a Gaelic economy. This is people who claim to be Gaelic speakers who are 16 and over who appear in the census. And as you can see, there is a huge transformation in Glasgow. 68% rise across two census reports, 1991 to 2011. Edinburgh also goes up significantly, 16, nearly 17%, over a fifth up in the rest of Scotland. But Argyll and Butte, um, a little bit like Professor Anderson's talk we saw earlier today with the population decline, that's been hit very hard. Uh, the Western Isles have dipped slightly, just over 3%, and the rest of Scotland has uh, gone up by about a fifth so what does that actually show us? Um, in migration into the cities, out migration from the islands, um, institutionalization of Gaelic, so Gaelic being used in particular organizations and sectors, education, for example, in Glasgow, the growth of the Gaelic school, the growth of BBC Alapa. But we're not seeing much in the way of reciprocal migration. There are not many people learning Gaelic and moving back to the highlands or the islands. Solmore, perhaps, and Slate is one of the examples. There are some returners in North US and South US, but on the whole, it's not reciprocated. So we're still seeing a drift of young Gaelic-speaking, Gaelic-speaking skilled people south. So we have past trend, which is still continuing. 
how can we turn that around? Can we turn it around? We need to stop the, the siphoning off of talented individuals. Um, socioeconomic classification, this is a really interesting one that comes out of the census. So the higher proportions of managerial executive level jobs are found in civil parish bands E and F, which are at or around the Scottish national Gaelic speaking density of 1.1%. The more manual occupations, the lower grade occupations tend to be in civil parishes A and B. So civil parishes A are all the ones in the Western Isles except Stornoway, so Barra, North Uist, South Uist, Barvas, Lochs, Uig. Stornoway is in B along with all of the Sky parish except for Strath. And I think Tyree is in, in civil parish B. So it's, a, it's an interesting twist on the old get out to get on trope. This data now comes from my socioeconomic survey. So because of the strictures applied to the ethical research considerations, I couldn't ask people to identify themselves as individuals. I could only ask for postcode data. And I used the postcode data then to map that against the Scottish Government's eightfold urban rural classification. So I can work out who's urban lowlands, who's urban highlands, and who's in the Gaeltach, which is basically all the postcodes in the Western Isles and the postcodes on the Northwest Seaboard. And as you can see, under 12,500 pounds, half of those people are in the Gaeltach. When you start to get up to the 25,000 to 45,000 bracket, it equalizes. And I think that's teaching. I think that's people on teaching bands. So it's much more, um, there's a greater equanimity among these different locations. But once you get up to the executive level again, 45,000 and over, half of those jobs lie outside the Gaeltach. So you can s effectively see that whereas we had the old trope of Gaelic's no good once you cross the Minch or leave your Gaelic at the Sky Bridge. Now it's Gaelic helps you when you get down there. So maybe you build your skills here and you go. So it's a big challenge for island communities and Gaeltach communities. Um, how do language and culture contribute to community identity? Again, perhaps from the survey, this is not necessarily a surprising result. If you're in the Gaeltach, overwhelmingly Gaelic language and culture are major community identifiers for you. In uh, lowland Scotland, despite the fact that the bulk of the executive jobs and the big salaries are contracted there, it doesn't necessarily mean as much, 82% saying it, it, they strongly disagree that it's a cultural signifier. So these are all social and economic demographic challenges that we're going to have to face. The past has given us this um, trajectory that we're on, so how do we turn that around? This is a photo that I was able to find from Alistair MacLeod and Scalpe, and Scalpe and Eriske were hugely boosted in the post-Second World War era by ringnet herring fishery. It was essentially uh, an environmentally sustainable two-boat operation. The boats could only carry nets of a certain size and they could only carry a certain quantity of fish. It sustained 12 men, six on each boat, and you had islanders and highlanders working together in pairs, so boats from Sky would be paired with Applecross, Kishar and Karen with Uist. So it was a network that brought all of these island and highland communities together and it made and sustained connections those islands, especially Scalpe, were known as Treasure Island because so much money was flowing in that they were able to sustain their populations and build the material wealth and the, the social benefits and economic benefits that come with that. We can't bring those pasts back, but hopefully future events like this will guide us to new imaginaries. How can we get to a point where Gaelic is a societal asset as it was in the ringnet herring fishery? where all the Gaelic-speaking islanders and highlanders were on the radio communicating in Gaelic because they knew that the boats from the East Coast and from Ayrshire who were tracking them couldn't understand what they were saying. So the skills, the language-speaking skills, were utilised in jobs that were not Gaelic jobs. They were not the Gaelic economy, but they were the living social economy in which Gaelic was a key skill. So maybe taking the data from the past, how can we start to go towards that future again? 
Thank you very much, Warren Pang. Um, this is the last of the short talks. It shouldn't actually be the last of the short talks. It should be that we should have one other one. Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to give a shout out to Liam Krause, who should be with us, PhD student in um, Somorostek, jointly with Tobin and Dorhesh, who isn't here because, as we've all heard in many of the talks today, the ferries aren't running and he couldn't get here and get back in time to, to, to return to US for, for things he needed to be there for on Monday. So we're missing Liam, but we're absolutely delighted that that means that we're going to have a little bit longer to hear from our next speaker, Catherine McPhee, who is the archivist for Sky and Loch Alsh Archives based in Portree. But she is uh, an archivist of the exemplary new sort who isn't, who isn't found um, <laughs> poring over bits of paper in a back room, but she's found out in communities and working in collaboration with artists and arts development groups and with community groups and with kids and with all sorts of people who have interests in the wonderful materials that are held in the archive. She's been a, a, a fantastic catalyst for research, for exhibition production, um, she's a great curator in her own right, um, and we couldn't ask for anybody better to be in charge of the wonderful riches that, that, that we have in, in, in Highland Archives, and she's going to tell us a little bit about some of the things that, that come from there, both in terms of the things that she's been able to draw out and, and research herself, but also, I think, in, in terms of work that other researchers have done and might be able to do in the future. How did I get that on presenter mode? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me along um, to chat with you. Just, just getting my notes up because I won't remember everything. See if you put it back on play. Yeah. See when it comes up. I sort of try that one. Oh, I don't know if it was the same as mine. Um, sorry, that doesn't seem. No. Yeah. yeah. Cool, thank you. Cheers. No, no, it's perfect, thank you. Coming back up. Cool, okay. Um, so, yeah, hi from the Sky and Local Archive Centre. So yes, um, it's been really good listening to everyone today and spending some time last night sharing um, some information on projects. So a beautiful view of Elgol behind us there. Um, spent a lot of time down there last weekend. Um, so I joined the Highland Archive Service back in 2019 um, and it was through a traineeship through the Highland Archive Service. And these were done as a service need. They saw the need to fill positions, but there wasn't people here with the skills in the community. And I was really lucky to get the job and then completed my master's um, distance learning through the University of Dundee. Um, so there's four archive centres in the Highlands and Islands. Um, we are the one at the top there with the wee round building. Um, the big large one with the orange terracotta structures, the one in Inverness, um, and that whole orange section is records. That's record stores. Um, so it kind of gives you a scale of the volume that we hold in Inverness. So the other two are in Loch Aber, Fort William, another one at Caithness is the Nucleus. Um, and across all four of them, we hold a very wide and unique record of the Highlands and Islands past. They're a mixture of official bodies, individuals, societies, um, giving us a real mind-bending selection across 
the region. Um, so in addition to this, we also have the Ambala website, which I don't know if many of you have used. Um, this is our digital archive, um, capturing the history and culture, and comprises of material which has previously been difficult to access. So it's got things like sound recordings, um, some documents, thousands of image images, and these come from libraries, museums, private collections, and ourselves from the Skylock Alch archive. Duncan McPherson collection is one of the biggest on there. He was a chemist in Kyle, and it covers almost 50 years. So it allows researchers to weave your way through community life and the family's leisure business concerns, and also the development of his photography techniques and interests. Um, the images on there, there's one from the Second World War, and there's also one there from Urbiseg, which was one of his um, favorite villages. The other two images are a recent addition. Um, of previously unknown film that he had taken, and we've had this digitised. I'm working on getting this out into the community as soon as possible. It has been had, has had a sneaky preview down in Kyle because I felt it was important to take it back to the community there first. Um, so, a little bit about me. So behind me is a map um, of Loch Bracadil. Um, all the names in Gaelic, it's not that clear, but I can show it to people in person if you're in the archive. This was drawn by a family member of mine. I come from a fishing family and every rock is named around the coast. So growing up here, I was very, very fortunate that I was given stories of fairies, witches, pipers, caves, rebellion, and round the dinner table stories about protest, Sky Bridge protest, what's happening in the wider world. Um, my family links to historic land reform um, were frequently shared, and definitely if you know me, I'm still at it today, um, and also the shifting of our people from village to village to village from Warrigal to Ramasig to Easy, back to Brackadale, um, and always asking, why? Why did this happen? Where did they go? And I'm sure if you ask my family members, I'm still asking questions to them all today. Um, so my role as an archivist, I'm frequently asked questions relating to migration, empire, clearance, and of course, folklore and mythology. The collections in our care capture the richness of our shared histories, memories, and that's an identity woven between artifacts, documents, photographs, and for me, they help us deepen our understanding of our island, our people, and our past. A few months in role, I was feeling I was right in the right place, loving what I was getting to do. But I started questioning who was coming in, what was happening with this. It seemed to be a revolving door of ancestral journeys, people from the diaspora, and a handful of dedicated locals from Skye. I felt this urgency to get out into the communities and start capturing what was going on, what, how can we help, what do you know, did you know we're here? Um, and glaring back at me were these boxes of landed estate owners and I just thought, where are the ski enoughs? Where's the crofters? Where's my people? Because all I could read about was he owned this or he owned that, he did this. So I started going out and then suddenly I was like, where are the women? Because there was very, very little history recorded about the women from the islands. Um, so I set about doing some new ways and learning from people that have done projects across Sky and Locales to engage with folks. So there's a mixture you can see there. I've run some youth groups um, through Broadford Youth Club. Um, they have a girls group that meets every Wednesday. So we started exploring history from their own area. Um, and they were great, great crack. Um, it was taking a, bit, a little bit different from them baking cakes and doing artwork. We started writing plays and writing poetry and they really started questioning where they lived. Um, we've done events with Margaret Bennett, we've got an exhibition on with an artist, and we quite often have various meetings. Um, so engaging with community groups can really help us can reimagine and shape the future. What do we want in a community? People wanting to learn about the history and the community they moved into, and also maybe sharing stories um, from somebody they haven't seen for a while. So inviting people in for a coffee, a blether, or offering up a space in the archive for people to meet and share is working and it's gathering more people in. Um, working with community organisations and trust has been key, not only to build relationships and capture more of the past, but also to add to the archives. So communities are realising their voices are important and they're adding into the archive, but still retaining ownership and can use that um, artefact or item or recording. Um, last year, over, maybe over a year ago, I joined up with the Culture Collective through Shell with an artist called Louis Barbaris, who's a fireman and also a really good musician um, from Dunvegan. And we set about going around doing free community gatherings in 11 village halls. An archive Cayley, you could call it, where people spoke about experiences, 
what was going on in their community and also sharing some really funny stories, but there were similar threads of discussion kept popping up. So drawing on these personal experiences and shared memories of the people in Sky, Razi and Lachalsh, this has been created into a body of work that celebrates community spaces and the talents of people living around them. So they've created an album from stories, pulled in musicians, singers, everyone from the community. Um, in Kilmuir Hall, I was handed this photograph of Anne Beaton. Um, and this was a joy, people were bringing in loads of things. Um, and a relative shared her story with me because he's still trying to find out more. So Anne Beaton was born in the township of Grulin um, in Kilmuir around 1842. She was the child of Angus Beaton and Mary McSwan. And this young girl had already witnessed by around about the age of 10, people in Grulin being removed and shipped to Australia in 1851. Around 1861, and we still haven't narrowed down the date for this, but we know they don't show on the census in 1861 in Grulin. The township erupted in the early morning as the factor and his employees came with metal bars, removed the family, broke the lintel over the door and set fire to the house. Alongside her brother and mother, the family were cleared from the house she'd lived in her whole life. So they walked up to Harbista where her older brother was living, about three miles just further north. And the next morning, young Anne Beaton woke up, borrowed a horse and rode back up to her village. And there she dug out the vegetables that had been in the soil and picked up any remnants from the burnt out home. On her way back, she was spotted by the factor who then took the horse and her back to Monkstadt. Um, her brother came back to pay a fine because the horse had now been grazing on Monkstadt's land. Um, by the time she was 21, the remaining inhabitants of Grulin had emigrated to America. Anne left Skye to work in domestic service in Edinburgh and finally became a head housekeeper at Luger House. She retired back to Uig and then spent the last years of her life at her brother's home back in Herbista, where she passed away in 1945 at the age of 103. I got all this from one photograph from a guy in the hall and I just thought, wow. Um, <laughs> Anne's story being shared from the family in a community hall just added another layer and the archive of liveness in the hall. Um, she was very brave, um, and I imagine it must have been quite a scary thing to go and do. The landowner at the time was a chap called Captain William Fraser. Now, his papers sit within the Clamour Estate Papers. He purchased the land off Lord Macdonald in around 1855, and in time, using these records, um, the Beaton family are going to be able to add more layers and confirm a few extra details to this. I, I'm not going to do that myself. I could. I could sit and look through these records, but I really want the family to do it and I can help them find what they're looking for. Um, it's not my story, it's theirs. Um, so the Kilmuir Estate Collection is one of my favourite. Um, it sits within the solicitor records of Christine and Ferguson. Um, the bulk of these derive from Alexander MacDonald's practice um, from about 1873 to 1900. MacDonald was a factor to several estates during the 1800s. He was Sky's only lawyer and for many years is a list here. He worked as a bank agent, a principal collector of rates and taxes, clerk to six school boards, a member of seven parochial boards, captain of the Patrie uh, Rifles Volunteers Association, many other things. He also owned chunks of land from time to time. Um, some other CDs held within this estate are Glendale, which is what the map's from. So my own family come from Glendale. Um, there were poets, agitators, um, so that's where they all came from. So close, a place that's very dear to me. Um, there's also Bernisdale, Strathaird, Don Macdonald of Tormor, Scalpy, and Threeslin, amongst many others. So in these, you can find cases of crossers agitation, eviction, land league meetings, shooting rights, the Great Flood in Uig um, in 1877. But the list is really endless. You can look in at what's been planted, what people are getting fed. You can find um, school rates. You can really, really good mixture of letters. I think Chris described it earlier on. Sometimes you get gossip between the community. There's a lot of back and forth um, between people. So the story of Anne Beaton's family is one I've heard of and I've seen frequently within the collections in books and in oral histories. Um, I think this, what Anne's family were experience is a form of internal displacement where you're moved from one village to another. Um, and these can be traced using estate records. Um, people found themselves like perpetually homeless, getting made homeless over and over again. Um, so in common with other landlords, Captain Fraser set about to increase the income from his estate in Skye. He did this by raising rents, rearranging tenants. New crofting townships were created on poorer land. 
and more arable farms were made into single holdings for sheep. One example of this was in Glen Conan or Glen Oog. Documents from the Kilmure estate papers suggest at least part of these removals took place in 1864, so not too within the same time frame as the Beaton family's house was set on fire. Um, so in 1864, when the grazings of Penacoinach, now I might be pronouncing that wrong, and North Cool were let to John Stewart of Duntullum, he was a prominent farmer. So by comparing the rent rolls of 1863 and 4 and 1866-7, we can see a small tenants disappearing from one side of Glenconnen and reappearing over at Sheadar. Um, so that's the two rent rolls there where you can follow these um, the kind of migration of people on there. So you've got a commuter estate rental showing Malcolm Nicholson at 8 Talentane. And Malcolm gave evidence at the Napier Commission in 1883. And then you can see Malcolm Nicholson at 5 Sheadar. And some of his neighbours were also removed to the other side of Glenconnen in 1864. And they appear in the documents on here in Penacoin and North Cool, Talentane. Um, and these were all in the hands of Captain Fraser and part of um, the Glen Oog or Glen Conan. Um, so it ties in with various other records, um, so evidence given in the Napier Commission to hear the testimony of crofters, cotters, factors and landowners. Um, at the hearing in Oog, Malcolm Nicholson, then living at Sheader, on the opposite side of Glen Conan, spoke about the enforced removals which had taken place in his lifetime. And other neighbours backed up the evidence um, and the struggling to exist on the poorer north-facing land were being blamed for, and the blame for these difficulties was laid at Fraser's door. Um, many believed that natural justice was served on the landlord when in 1877 a massive flood went through Uig in the autumn. Um, essentially, the flood tore through the local cemetery, opened up graves, destroyed the major's residence at Uig Lodge, and the Highlander newspaper reported is it strange that nearly all the dead buried in Uig during the last 500 years should be brought up as it is, were against the house, as if the dead in their graves arose to perform the work of vengeance which the living had not the spirit to execute? execute. Pretty grim stuff. Um, so the, this sharing of stories at events, I mean, I really enjoy it myself, but I find it so important to add the voice of community in, but then let community members come in and research and add... Um, to their own identity and their own community. Um, but also for me with this one, it's adding women's history, women's resistance. And although comprising slightly over half the human population, women have never achieved parity in the archives. Our stories, perspectives, perspective, sorry, activities seldom receive adequate attention from male-dominated political, academic, intellectual and social institutions and discourses. Women can be found throughout our collections but their narratives are harder to find. Individuals I've been working with, some artists and a couple of academics who are from Sky are working on reclaiming the voices of women, not just in Sky, but across the Gaeltic. Um, and hopefully with some of their work, it will address some of these imbalances and represent an inclusive history of everyone. In 2020, a woman's name jumped out at me from the court records, and this was her Slonyach. And thanks to staff at Salmore, um, I was able to get her name, because I'm not a Gaelic speaker, and just check also the name of the village to make sure I was looking at the right place. Um, so her name was Catherine McKinnon. She was accused of being a witch. So Catherine McKinnon died in 1747 after being attacked in a house in Camus Cross, allegedly by Rudy McKeon MacDonald, a taxman of the clan MacDonald of Armadale. He's accused in the court records of her barbarous and cruel murder. MacDonald claimed that the woman had earlier poisoned his men and sought to cause mischief after arriving at his property. The taxman claimed that the allegations against him were false and malicious, and it's understood he was not convicted of her murder. The cruel treatment of Mrs. McKinnon, she's also described as an old beggar woman, and looking at records of women in this time, this could be anything from 28 to 88. Um, and she may have gone to his house for help, and it's set out in the court papers, in August 1754. And the McKinnon case came almost two decades after the witchcraft of 1735 make it, made it illegal to accuse somebody of possessing magical powers or practicing witchcraft. So a woman in need, when, once MacDonald released her, she crawled up to Dewsdale Bake and she was taken in by Donald Grant, day labourer, whose family gave her care in her final days. When I went public with this on the Witches of Scotland podcast in 2020, it was so important to be able to give a woman her name and not just be a witch, a healer. You know, she was a woman. That's, she was a woman in need 
in a community, not just not far from here. Um, so giving her humanity to an, an, to an individual of her past. Um, her story is not over though. This fragment that I was able to pull out has been used by a researcher recently um, and also in a creative way by healing Harrow musicians Rachel Newton and Lauren McCall. They're paying a humanizing tribute to these women while also exploring historical beliefs in the supernatural and modern day parallels in our society. Each piece of music is based on a commissioned work by Offer Mary Kidd and their tales inspired and remembrance of real women persecuted as witches and also from some folk tales and mythology enriched in our oral history. Right, fairies, because we've done witches. So, um, fairy bridge. <laughs> um, so we're talking about fairies, but we're not going into the fairy hill. We're going to be looking at Waternish. So I can't remember what age I was when I was told stories about this. I've been given stories about blue fairies who would appear on the grass and could cause horses to dance. I was also given stories about the Free Church preacher, Reverend Roderick MacLeod, who held a large prayer meeting at the time of the disruption. And then one of my favourite rogues, Reverend Don McCallum from Waternish, um, he held land reform meetings here at the bridge. He arrived in Skye around 1883 when he accepted a call to the parish of Waternish, and it was here he became involved in the crofter struggle and in the humane conditions that everyone was living under. He found that most of his people had left the church, and he could only muster about a dozen souls for service. The building of the church itself was in ruins and the condition of the parish parishioners' houses were even worse. Um, McCallum was interestingly imprisoned um, on Saturday, November 13th, 1886, which prevented him from conducting the Sunday service, so quite an interesting tactic by the police at the time. Um, so I've been working on the Waternish estate. It feels kind of started it before lockdown, then had a lot of time off. Um, so I'm back at it at the moment. So the Waternish Estate is it's such a rich collection. Um, it dates from around 1780s. Now these dates might change because I'm cataloguing it and I keep finding, it's keeping them further back in time. The McDonald's of Waternish family and estate collection um, provides quite an insight into the life of a small West Highland estate over almost 200 years. So between landlords, tenants, family leisures, business concerns and the crofting system, it had been um, in really bad storage. You can see um, some repair work that we've had done on these ledgers. Um, we're really fortunate to receive a grant from the National Manuscripts Trust, so this will become accessible um, for researchers and individuals in the future. Um, there's maps, plans, bound volumes, also a series of photographs. Um, the one at the bottom here is the workers for the estate um, at Ardmore. This is actually one of my friend's crofts, um, this one, so it's still an active croft. Um, and then... The family records, so the family itself is really fascinating. And the letters and relationships between them, there's so much that could be written on that. But within there, you also see them, the evidence of the impact of the famine, the clearances, and then providing grain and meal to the families that they've moved on to less favorable lands to make way for sheep. So while I've been cataloging this, um, it took me to Uist. Um, so that's another picture um, from the clip, McDonald glass slide negatives of, it just says Uist workers, it's all we have on it. So Captain McDonald had been the tenant um, of an agricultural unit comprising of Killen, Grimsey and the adjacent island of Roney. Um, eventually he was able to sell his stock um, at Killen and confined himself to a few on Roney. He was re recipient of this letter, protest letter in 1884. Um, from North Uist, and it says, I don't know if you can read that, probably not. Um, we, the inhabitants of Grimsey, have gathered ourselves together on this day, the 5th of November, on the purpose of taking possession of the land of Kalen and Rona. These places, which were inhabited, scrolled up too far, um, and cultivated and also being the dwelling of our forefathers, were taken from them in a disorderly and silky way, given to men that were not in the need of, like yourself, which caused these poor men to leave their native country to foreign and strange lands to meet with difficulties and hardships of which you and your like are not aware and are too numerous to mention here. Therefore, we agreed to take between ourselves and write to you a warning to take charge of your stock before your next Martinmas. And again, you've confessed that your only need of these places was for hunting, sporting about for otter and seals, and of which we can draw a strong complaint against you for preventing seaweed from us so that we can have manure for our lands. Was this not a cause to keep the profit of the earth back from us? But the like of you never took on such things. It's too low for you, but the poor must do it. 
So, woo, quite a letter. Um, I've used it a few times. I won't go too far back. Um, yeah, I'm going to see some cartoons next. Um, and we've been using that letter with school groups talking about you know, migration, movement, and how would they respond today if that happened to them? What, what method of communication would they use? But there is a few more letters. This protest continues on within the collection, so we, anyone's welcome to come and see them. Um, so links to empire um, are woven throughout the collections. And while I've been cataloging Waternish, I've been finding some links to the East India Company. And I'm not, I'm not a historian, and I, when I'm working, I try and learn more about that. So I've been reading up about the East, em empire, East India Company um, podcast books. Um, but this collection is the McDonald sister. And this was recently highlighted in the blog by one of our um, volunteers, and she's now doing a PhD in Glasgow, Grace Wright. Um, and it's an artwork collection by Katrina and Myrit McDonald. So two sisters whose artistic practices were informed by international travel and their Scottish roots. Both Gaelic speakers, um, their parents were from the Isle of Skye, Margaret McDonald uh, McKinnon and from Staffin and Dougald MacDonald, their father, who was a banker from Portree. So they were both born in India, and they lived there until about 1929. And the sisters kind of saw the steady decline of the British Empire firsthand. And India became independent in 1947, South Africa in 1961, Malta in 1974. And the influence of this can be seen throughout their artwork, from cartoons exploring political issues of the time to the designs in their clothing. So it's a lot of clothing, textiles, artwork, print work. Um, in there. So Gaelic-speaking household, their work was heavily influenced by their connections with the Highlands and Islands. So for example, we've got Myrid's Dream series commenting on contemporary changes and events in the Highlands and Islands. So this one, Giggleswift Tours, it's got a tour bus being held up by two Highland cow cows with the Tom Castle in the background. So I think this says, the cows are saying, the cows are primrose and daisy, and they're asking the tourists, who did you, where did you arise from or who did you arise from? Maybe get somebody after to tell me. Um, and then there's additionally someone, some where they've blended Hebridean legends and you can see the influence of the empire within them. Um, so there's ones like this that are kind of held within the collection too. Um, so just reflecting on our histories for me is really about understanding my identity, helping people do that, community, culture, environment, and um, getting power from the archives, whether that's some social justice, getting certain change for the community. Um, it's also about our collective memory, national identity, and how we know ourselves as individuals. So for me, the archives are a place of identity, memory, and our history is rooted in them. Thanks very much, Catherine. That was full and informative, and I can commend you as a brilliant, brilliant archivist. I've used your materials, and we'll be back this summer for more. So um, we've now got time for a tea break, coffee break, but please do, do, be, do be quick about it because we're, time's going on, and we're still we're more or less sticking to timetable, but we're slipping a wee bit. So 10 minutes back here, please, if you can, possibly. Bring the cup with you if that's acceptable. <laughs>
Okay, folks, are we settling down for... Very good. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is um, Bob McMillan, who I've only just met, um, but a fascinating individual who was uh, spent a, had a career in the police force. Uh, <laughs> are we supposed to? You don't want me to tell him about that. <laughs> he was a, a graduate, or not a gra yes, I graduated at un in the University of Dundee, which always delights me uh, to hear that kind of thing. Um, he was a very, very successful police officer, um, but he's got, had a lifetime interest in birds. And one of the reasons that we've invited him here is because he did a rather splendid book on the birds of Skye. So, Bob, well, over to you. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. I realise this will be a little bit of a diversion, you know, from some of the previous presentations, but it's quite interesting, actually, to see a lot of the linkages that exist. Um, and, and I'll just admit right away that I'm a lowland Scot uh, who's lived in Skye now for 20 years. Uh, I first came to Skye about 60 years ago with a, a guy from Dunblane who was my birdwatching mentor, which takes you back, gives you some indication of the length of time that I've been interested in, in wildlife. Uh, and he had uh, relatives, his mother was from Skye, from, Trot from uh, Staffan, and he had a great interest in birds and wildlife, and he also had an interest in collecting minerals and crystals, and I, I think made a significant contribution with a 28-pound hammer to giving the Trotternish Ridge its current profile. <laughs> uh, so these were in the days when you could collect specimens and not worry too much about it. But since then, I came back to the sky on a regular basis, climbed in the Coolins, and then eventually retired here. And the bird side of it is purely voluntary. Uh, I've never really been a professional ornithologist as such. It's a lifetime's interest. But I'd like to try and show through this that most of the contribution to the ornithological record of sky uh, is a voluntary contribution, depending on lots of different people, and there are people in the audience today who've contributed to that. And there's others who come and visit, and the tourists who come regularly. And it's all done nowadays through websites, WhatsApp groups, and stuff like that. But we try and document everything so that it's there, so that in the future we won't have the same challenges with archives that there seems to be nowadays. But some of the history of the birds and sky is actually drawn from people like Johnson, Boswell, and others, you know, who would make observations on the natural history, and you'd pick up little gems and just hope that they were reasonably accurate. But the first individual who recorded bird life as such on Sky was this gentleman here, and I'm just wondering if he's known to a local archivist, because this was a, a gentleman called the Reverend Hugh McPherson. And Hugh McPherson, and it's a coincidence in a sense that uh, in 1886 he presented a paper to the, the Royal Physical Society of Edinburgh. Now, I don't know whether that's the same as this organization or a different organization, but he pre pre presented a paper to them on the birds of sky with special reference to the parish of Durinish, which is up in the, the northwest. And in that, it recorded 153 species, including a bird called a barred warbler, which at the time was the first record for the UK, uh, and another species, great shearwater, which was uh, very early on in that. Now, McPherson's mother was a MacLeod, and his uncle had the Glendale Estates, and McPherson actually, as a young man inherited the Glendale Estates and the issues that went with it. And it was interesting, uh, in a preamble to one of the papers that he produced at the time in 1883, in justice to the fauna of Skye, it is right to say I had even less time to examine it than last year. 
owing to the presence of the Crofters Commission and many other demands on my time. Now, those of you who are familiar with the Glendale martyrs and the riots and the incarceration of several Crofters from that area uh, will be well aware of that. And uh, in a sense, it was a, an indication of how an individual with a very narrow focus on wildlife and in a, a total ig ignorance of what was going on uh, round about him, you know, uh, was, uh, it was seen as a, a relatively mild uh, distraction. But most of you will know the history of that estate anyway, and it eventually came back in uh, to, I think initially, the MacDonald estates, and then it was taken possession of. So that's going back to that time, and if we bring forward to 2023, uh, Sky's part of the Highland recording area as far as birds are concerned and that is managed by the Scottish Ornithologist Club, SOC branch in Inverness and we've now recorded 269 species in Sky. Uh, 30 of these species are red listed and about 50 are amber listed and that's listed in relation to uh, their conservation position. So we have in the island uh, quite a large number uh, of species that are either uh, at immediate risk or at general risk. And I think throughout that time, there have been a number of different individuals. Some have been teachers, some have been visitors who've contributed to the knowledge of the avifauna and sky. Uh, one of them well worth mentioning, uh, Andrew Curry, who worked with the NCC, and was based in Broadford for a long time. And, and Andrew was co-author of a paper uh, called The Birds of the Inner Hebrides, and that was in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 1983, and that presented a systematic list uh, on, on the birds of sky. And there are other individuals as well, and in terms of Chris's links to the island of Pabi, uh, after his family was involved there, there was a gentleman, Ted Gerrard, who lived there for about 11 years and who ringed. He was the first person who ringed any birds in Skye, and he ringed about 12,000 birds in Skye during his time there, and he's still on the go, and I bump into him in the cope on a regular basis. And if we look at species which previously bred in the island, We'll have the white-tailed eagle, and we'll come back to this later, but it left us in about 1916. Uh, the black grouse was probably extinct by about 1954. Snow bunting probably bred uh, in 1958. It's unfortunate that Des Thompson's not here because Des Thompson's father, Desmond Nethersel Thompson Sr., Wrote, wrote a number of monographs and species uh, in Scotland, one of them being the snow bunting. And I don't think he actually had knowledge of the fact that snow buntings bred in the Coolin, but certainly snow buntings did breed in the Coolins uh, in the 1950s. Species like corn bunting were still recorded, for example, in the 1988-91 uh, BTO breeding atlas, but are no longer with us. And even the yellow hammer, which many people here will remember, it still breeds in Lohalsh, but as far as I can establish, it's no longer breeding in Sky and breast, last bred in Slate, not far from here, uh, in about 2004. So we're still losing species, and there's a correlation in some respects with some of the species we're, we're losing with the land use. So the two are inextricably linked. And the same problem that you have down south with intensification of agriculture, you have a similar reflection here in the changes in crofting practice. So we're no longer having any crops of any kind, even root crops growing in, cro growing in crops. You don't have winter seed to keep certain species going. So they're reliant on going to bird tables, 
And Yellowhammer is, in some respects, a classic example of that. But on the other hand, the positive side is that we now have changes. So Siskin colonized in about the 1960s, and that probably correlated to the introduction of coniferous plantations. So with coniferous plantations, you were able to draw in some of these species, and uh, Siskin is probably one, and another species, uh, uh, common crossbill was another. Uh, collared dove has colonized since about 1963. Great spotted woodpeckers, which some of you who live in Slate will be familiar with them, you know, on your bird tables, probably started coming here just about the 1960s. The black cap was certainly here in the 1988-91 BTO breeding atlas, and it's now widespread. If you walk out the door here, you can hear a singing black cap. White-tailed eagle, of course, came back in 1989. Great school in 2009. And we're in among the rogues now. Uh, magpie <laughs> has attempted to breed in uh, Elishira. And one of the reasons it's breeding now here is that I think there's only one keeper now uh, on the island of Skye. And there's very few keepers now in areas where they once were. So as a consequence, species like magpie and jay, which were just extinguished, basically, are now colonizing. Uh, and jay is probably now breeding uh, in sky. It's breeding in Loch Arbor. Uh, black grouse is now in Loch Alsh and hopefully might come back into sky. And nutthatch is breeding just over the, the, the sound here in Arisig and is cropped up in sky. So there are some species that are moving with us. And if we look at corn crake just as an example of a bird that's hanging on, again, many of you will recall corn crakes calling everywhere. Uh, and they're really now just hanging on. And you'll see that 2012, you had something like 32, up to 38 calling birds. 2020 is a bad year because of uh, COVID. 2021, 11. 2022, 14. So it's the one area where there's a significant investment in the sense that we have a person who works part-time, employed by the RSBB with various grants to look at that. She's, she's exceptionally dedicated, does tremendous work, but the numbers are remaining you know, on a little bit of a decline. So that's a major challenge to try and get uh, numbers increasing again. And I think we're going to be up against it because the picture's the same elsewhere. This is a species that people aren't necessarily familiar, so familiar with, and it's the Greenland white front goose. And if we go back to, you know, just 12, 13 years ago, this is a wintering population uh, that comes from West Greenland, and at that time there was wintering flocks of 20-odd birds. Prior to that, there had been up to 40 birds in two different groups, one at Skabest and one in, one in Broadford Bay that also spent time in Pabby. So the Pabby link comes in again. Uh, and their numbers have just steadily decreased, and the Broadford uh, wintering flock disappeared just a matter of five or six years ago. And the, the flock, which is now uh, at Kilmuir, it's down to about four birds, and that will disappear soon. The, the reason for that is probably more complex in the sense that there seems to be competition for, on the breeding grounds that these birds have in Greenland with other species, and their productivity has just disappeared. But it's not helped by occasionally people shooting them because they can't tell the difference between them and grey-lag goose. And that's where education has to come in, because most people looking at grey geese in a distance can't tell the difference between the two species, but one of them is critically endangered. Great skua, or the bonksy, and I can't remember the Gaelic name, uh, it first bred in the Staffan Island in Fladdy, around 2009. 
and the original colonists we knew from ringing were from Handa. Uh, and by 2021, there were probably something like 50 to 100 pairs, which were mainly on offshore islands, but a few in the sky mainland. And you'll certainly, you'll get them on any coast just terrorizing everything that moves. If all the birds go up, you know you've got a bonksy nearby, because there can be brutes of things. Um, but the impact of avian flu uh, was first found in St. Kilda in 2021, and by 2022, there were very few young fledged. And we can show this on some stats I've got here that are probably a wee bit higgledy piggledy, but these are highland records of great skuas, and you'll see them peaking here July, August, peaking here July, August. And then last year, suddenly they peaked in May as birds arrived. And then after that, the reporting rate just steadily declined. Uh, and basically, any breeding colonies of great skuas uh, were being affected by avian flu and birds were fail failing to produce. So major concerns regarding that, and it's the same this year, and we come back to Pabi again, where there's come, the last year, the year before, four to five pairs of breeding great skuas on Pabi, and this year there's maybe one pair. Similar problem at Staffen Island, where there were five or six pairs, and this year maybe one pair. So great skua is reaching the stage now of being internationally an endangered species because of the impact of avian influenza. And, and basically, they're, they're obviously uh, focusing on birds that are sick. And if you have a bird suffering from avian flu, it tends to be going round in circles in the water. So it's an easy target. But one of the consequences is uh, that some of the species that predate it have, a pro have an issue. Uh, golden eagle in sky, one of the key birds of the island, something like 30 pairs in Sky and Rassi, and they were monitored for 35 years by a couple who live in Glen Brittle. Uh, and this book, uh, In Eagle Country, is the second publication that they've, they've had, and it's coming out um, in probably the next month or so. But golden eagle productivity has been declining rapidly. And this is linked into white-tailed eagles. And what, what I'm going to say among some uh, raptor ecologists isn't particularly popular. But the reality is, uh, on the basis of Kate and Ken's uh, research, is that you see the number of pairs here are remaining quite constant. Uh, over this huge period of time. The number of breeding attempts is similarly fairly high, but the actual number of pairs that are successfully rearing chicks is declining constantly to, to the extent that if it goes beyond 10, then the population is not likely to sustain itself uh, without other birds coming in from elsewhere. So if this trend continues in another, when my grandson is my age, you might have one or two pairs of golden eagles breeding in Sky and Lachalsh. And that might seem a bit of an overkill, but that is the reality of it. And the, the, the view is that there is a link with this introduction. And that's a view that's shared just by a few of us, and it's certainly not shared by uh, Des Thompson and other people in authorities. But the, that's certainly a view of some of the field observers, and these are people who spend years uh, in the field. So this is a fellow, the, the flying barn door, as he's called. And... Uh, this is one of the issues. And I'm not going to talk too much about it, but, but that's the kind of perception, and that's what causes uh, a lot of the problems. 
uh, of a, a lamb being taken uh, by a white-tailed eagle. And white-tailed eagles can breed in some funny places. And although there was a nest in a tree here and another nest in another tree here, I think after a storm, uh, the nests were blown out because they tend to nest in fairly crazy places. They weren't exactly blessed with good sense when it came to finding a home. Uh, and this one ended up laying a nest here on top of this knoll. So this is a white-tailed eagle incubating an egg, you know, with a friendly sheep quite nearby. Now that's unusual. I don't think ground nesting has been record too, recorded too often, but it, it, it is symptomatic of the issue. But then if you look at uh, white-tailed eagle productivity, you'll find here that the young fledged is pretty constant. That's just the last four or five years. And this is data provided by uh, the monitoring team uh, from the, the Raptor study group who, who, who follow them until last year. And last year, white-tailed eagle productivity dipped completely. And the linkage to that is uh, avian influenza. So again, this is a bird that's predating on geese like the Bonksy. Uh, and clearly at the top of the food chain, this accumulation uh, is, is causing uh, major challenges. And then at the other end of the scale, we'll have species like lapwing. Uh, and this is just a little bit of data uh, from Andrew Curry, who had something like 35 pairs of breeding in the area of Loch Christ, which is fairly rich uh, grassland. Uh, 35 pairs in the 1960s, early 2003, five breeding pairs. I'm saying one breeding pair in 2023, uh, but in actual fact, in my last visit, I couldn't see anything. So the, the birds are basic, there are still lapwing breeding on sky, but I suspect it's just a matter of a few years before they disappear completely. And the problem there is probably a combination of predation by foxes and by hooded crows. Uh, some other species that do well with us, and they certainly do well in areas where there's good crofting ground, is a species like twite. And this shows you some of the ringing data. It's a little brown job that comes, it will come to your bird table and take seed at this time of the year. Uh, and, uh, but it's also a, a, a species that is in significant decline. So it's a red-listed species, breeds around here in the sky in good numbers. And uh, the ringing activity uh, of uh, one of the local chaps, uh, Jonathan Jones, who's based in Portree, and he's ringing birds there, and he's ringing birds that are coming from a, these are wintering sites. So you'll see that these birds don't stay in sky in the winter time. And the, the reason for that, they stay in the use in the winter time, they stay, stay in Lewis in the winter time, and it's just the availability of winter food. So they're forced to migrate and that migration, especially in young birds, causes quite high mortality. So because of that, the population uh, is in steady decline. And, and again, this is just another indication of birds that are ringed at Portree that are going out to different locations uh, for the winter time. Another species which has increased in number quite significantly, the goldfinch, and again, you'll get it in garden feeders. And they are reliant in garden feeders, but a lot of them migrate. Uh, and this is a bird that's been around Sky for a time, but not in the numbers there are now. And you'll see again that it's a pretty long distance migrant in the winter time. And again, a lot of that will be driven by lack of winter food. And, and that's where feeding birds becomes uh, pretty important. How's my timing going on? Ten minutes. Uh, this is a species that's been close to my heart, the, the hen harrier. 
And this year, it's a national breeding survey of hen harriers. It's a species that we have in Skye in relatively small numbers, probably 15 to 20 pairs at most. But it's clinging on in other places because of persecution. Uh, and nobody can tell me anything about estates. Uh, I was brought up in Persia, so I know the estates in Persia, Angus, and places like that, that are absolutely notorious in terms of the management of vermin. And hen harrier, <coughs> golden eagle, white-tailed eagle, a lot of protected species are right at the top of that list. And on Skye, the, the, the beauty of Skye for me uh, the, there's hardly any gamekeepers. There's no grouse moors. Now, that's not the case 50 years ago, 100 years ago. There were grouse moors right down through Slate. Uh, and if we look at the local archive, we can see the number of grouse that were actually shot on these estates. So, uh, grouse shooting was obviously a sport of the privileged at that particular time, uh, and everything else was eradicated to allow for them to exist. They're still here in small numbers, and it's probably a fairly natural balance. The problem with the hen harrier population in sky is this little cutie here. And uh, it's mum and dad, because I, I did a study a number of years ago uh, in the north of the sky. Um, I, I got a grant from various bodies and put camera traps in at nests and found, in fact, that uh, fox predation of nest sites was one of the biggest problems. Uh, so probably about 50% of the young that were produced were predated by foxes. Uh, and you can tell when a fox predates a nest uh, because you find that the, the ends, these are pin feathers out of a young bird, and you find the nests the, the ends of the feathers are chewed. So it chews off the wings of the birds when they're, when they're relatively well grown, so the fox can drag it away through the header e easier. The only difference here, this isn't a young harrier, this is actually a young golden eagle. So there was a golden eagle about six, seven weeks was removed from a nest in Kinloch. Uh, and the, the, the feathers were chewed off the wings, and this was a reconstruction that was made by Ken Crane, uh, which just as gives an indication of the amount of damage that a fox will do. There's not a lot of natural prey here. We don't have rabbits as we had in the past. There are clusters of rabbits around, and at one time, and that's maybe one of the factors for the golden eagle, that each golden eagle territory would probably have a, a cluster of rabbits near it, and that's no longer the case through mixy and various other diseases. And the challenges of muir burn and wildfires. And this is the kind of thing that happens annually, and the Scottish Government are now planning to introduce legislation and probably not before, not before time. Uh, this is an example of a burnt area in the north of the, the area, the, the north of the, of, of the island. Uh, you can't really see the difference here, but this was a 10,000 acre fire that was started by crofters towards Bernersdale, and with a following wind almost reached the west coast. And in doing that, piled its way through woodland grant scheme areas uh, and just was unstoppable. And, and the problem with that now is that you have fire crews that are struggling. You know, my, my friend's just retired from the, the fire crew in Broadford. They can't recruit people. So if you've got a big fire on the island here, the chances of you getting fire crews out to to try and deal with it. And what annoys me is that the fire service and the free press and everybody else calls them wildfires. You know, it's almost as if we're away out in Australia with 50 degree temperatures. They ain't wildfires, they're deliberately started. Uh, and they're not deliberately started by hen harriers or golden eagles. 
Uh, and we really need to get this sorted out because any habitat that is showing a little bit of diversity and a bit of natural regeneration is just going to be removed completely. And I'll have another, not a rant, but those of you who drive back and forward to Broadford, if you, there's an area ground up in the right-hand side, uh, which is fairly rich in breeding waders. It's got breeding dunlin, golden plover. It's got breeding green shank. It's got breeding red-throated divers. And one of the challenges when you are trying to collect data and you have access to data, you always think that people know to contact you and that you're very happy to provide it. I have a website that goes back about 20 years, uh, simply due to the fact that I've got a son who's a bit of an IT whiz kid, and he produced a... Uh, if you go onto that website, you can find an archive that goes back 25 years of what's there, 20 years of what's there. But you end up getting a local landowner and uh, a grazings committee uh, getting into bed together and operating in secrecy and telling you that we've actually been working on this proposal for 10 years. And you say to yourself, if you've been working on this proposal to have a wind farm for 10 years, why don't you come and speak to me? The data is freely available. It's all online. We're very happy to help and make suggestions to you. So you then have a proposal to have 20 wind turbines in an area that's got a designated site on one side, so they can't move that way, a designated site on that side, so they can't move that way, and then they've got habitation this way, and they've got to provide a two-kilometer buffer before, you know, they can't be any closer than two kilometers to habitation. And I think my, one of my gripes is that you know, sometimes when there should be obvious consultation, there's none taking place. And I know that the ecologists who are working on the ground have probably had to sign non-disclosure agreements, you know, so that they keep all this commercially in conference, uh, which is a bit of an irritation. So that's another challenge that's happening. And it's on a, a migration corridor for Wildfell. So this is what I call the Kinloch Gap. And we have whooper swans uh, flying through this area, sometimes hundreds of them, uh, and they're going to be right on the line of where the turbines are going to be. So of course you tell them about that, and then they'll immediately say, oh, well, we didn't really know about that. But we've known about it for a long time. And that's the Calaverlock uh, population of the uh, whooper swans. And then the other challenges which I've already talked about, avian influenza, uh, gannets have been, suffered tremendously last year. But, but this was a, a white-tailed eagle, adult white-tailed eagle that was found in Glen Hinesdale in 21, December 21. In December 21 when that was found, uh, I notified RSPB, I notified British Trust for Ornithology, I notified Nature Scott, uh, I notified everybody who I could notify, and what did they do? Uh, unfortunately, very little. Uh, and it wasn't until about July or August last year before a task, form, a task group was formed by uh, Nature Scott. And in the meantime, it was left to individuals up and down the country to go out and try and collate these. Hundreds of birds were found in the west coast of Skye, mostly from seabird colonies in, on Canna. So sometimes we need to be a bit more agile and respond to these things a bit more quickly and not leave it to individuals and volunteers to try and sort it out. And the future is stimulating local interest. So here we have a sky twitch on the left-hand side. And this is in behind sky candles and a yellow-browed warbler 
from the high Arctic uh, has appeared and is migration, migrating south. So th there's now a, a group of individuals in Skye who are very active. Some are local, at least they live here anyway, uh, and, uh, but we, we generate records from a whole range of different people. And we get young people involved uh, who unfortunately uh, live in Georgia and the States, but whose grandfather has a croft just up the road here. And him and his brother and his sister are absolutely dedicated bird watchers. And we just hope that the future lies with people like that coming in so that old fogies like me can hang up their binoculars. <laughs> Thanks very much. Stuff, Bob. Another, another challenging paper. Something for us to think about. Uh, lots of things for us to think about. Um, so the final paper, not of the afternoon, but of this session, is is uh, Dr. Alison Cathcart, who is associate professor in early modern Scottish history at the University of Stirling. She works in in the areas between islands, but she works very much on the west coast of Scotland and the seas in between, so to speak. And uh, her talk tonight, or this afternoon, sorry, is going to be, uh, uh, yes, the scattered isles in the polar ocean, Scotland and the isles in the early modern period. So we very much look forward to hearing you, Ali. Thank you very much, Chris and um, RSC, for organising this fantastic event. Uh, thank you very much, especially to Becky, for organising me, which is much appreciated as well. I do have um, some slides. Some of them are more relevant than others. Mostly they're maps. There's also a handout going around. So if you get bored listening to me, you've got something to look at and something to read. I will come to the handout later. Um, but, but the maps, most are, are contemporary, late 16th century, just to give you a sense of how contemporaries perceive the Isles. Um, and the Isles I'm talking about go from, I'm, I'm going to touch on Orkney, not so much Shetland, apologies, and all the way down to the Isle of Man as well. Um, largely, I'm taking you back to the early modern period. If you were here this morning when Chris sort of not quite periodised the, the, the history, but talked about that period between the forfeiture of the Lordship of the Isles, so um, end of the 15th century, early 16th century, through to uh, before so-called improvement, um, really up to before the Jacobite era. I'm looking at sort of 16th, very early 17th century, largely James VI, um, but I'll go back a little bit earlier than that. Um, and I'm going to pick up a little bit on, on some of what Hugh said as well. Uh, we talked about the, this kind of the historiography. Um, and I'm not talking here about studies that focus on the highlands. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of, if you mentioned Mark McGregor, Ernest McCoyne, those studies. I'm talking about the broad brush narrative histories of Scotland that look at the Isles, and often the Highlands, the West Highlands, Seaboard and Isles are, are lumped together um, during the 16th, 17th century as problematic. That, that's how it's described. That, that period from the forfeiture of the Isles um, is characterised as the age of feuding or the age of forays, as it's popularly called. Um, historians, when they touch on the Western Highlands and Isles in, in broad histories of Scotland, tend to focus on those rebellions that, 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 that break out after the forfeiture of the lordship. Now, some of these um, arguably are attempts to restore the lordship of the Isles. Other times, mostly, they are disputes over land. Uh, there was a long-standing dispute here regarding the lands of Trotternish between the Macdonalds of Skye and the Macleods of Harris. Um, a later feud between the Macdonalds of Isla and the Macleans of Duart had repercussions across much of the Highland region. At the same time, across the Highlands and Isles, you have men being recruited and sent across the North Channel to Ireland, where they fought in the armies of Irish lords, either against each other in their, their um, rivalries with each other, or largely against the English and their efforts to extend English authority in Ireland. So you get this sense of, of a, a disorderly place, um, very militarised. 
Um, and then we get James VI coming in at the end of the 16th century, and he's regarded as having more, more sustained efforts to pacify the region. Um, and I continually argue that, yes, they were more sustained because he lives longer than most of his predecessors. We kind of forget that. Um, and he brings in these so-called civilizing policies, and they range from the policy of plantation, and Ernest McCoynick has touched on the plantation of Lewis, um, which saw the dispossession and displacement of the McLeods of Lewis in the early 17th century. Three field efforts at that result in the Statutes of Iona that was mentioned earlier, which was a negotiated settlement with some of the Highland and Hebridean chiefs, admittedly negotiated while many of the Highland chiefs were um, detained in lowland castles. Whatever stability the Statutes of Iona brought to the Isles, um, and there are socioeconomic ag agenda there as well, but whatever stability was short-lived, we get rebellion breaking out in 16. 14. Um, the rest of the 17th century I will brush over very quickly, characterised by increasing crown disinterest and I would argue actually crown hostility on the part of Charles I. You get the, the Highlanders and Irish involved in the civil wars um, and then later efforts to deal with the Highlands under James VII and II and then outbreak of Jacobite rebellions, Glencloe. That, that's all the very big, broad brush narrative regarding Scotland. Um, so what you get is this sense that the Western Highlands and Isles needs to be governed effectively. They are a problem. Um, and that's also uh, lo comes from the language that James VI uses. And we've touched on this before. The, the, the bar he talks about the inhabitants as being barbarous and inhumane. That language of civility and barbarism. I'm going to unpack some of that a little bit. Um, and I don't think any of this is very new at all, but I, I, I just want to discuss it in a little bit more depth, that the Crown views the Isles in a much more nuanced and also completely contradictory way. Now, no doubt the Isles are regarded as problematic, um, but that's a characterisation born out of a sense of frustration on the part of the Crown. Um, they're regarded as lawless, the Highlanders don't obey the Crown, um, Yes, there's feuding, which they regard as lawless. There's a socioeconomic agenda behind some of that. Um, and it's also frustrating because their rents aren't being paid, and, and the Crown is always determined to try and recoup as much money as it possibly can. Yet, Scottish monarchs, I argue, really saw the Isles as part of their kingdom. Um, too often, I think, we get the sense that they saw it as, as a realm apart. I, I, I don't buy that. I think they really saw them as part of their kingdom. They wanted to incorporate these islands into their kingdom fully, largely because they want to exploit them economically, and I'll, I'll come on to that. But that aim of really trying to extend royal authority across the isles into that region too often falls down that long list of crown priorities that, that come, and, and so the Highlands and Isles come behind or below relations with other European powers, marriage negotiations, royal finances. They never quite get to the Highlands. Um, over the course of the 16th century, arguably, that begins to change. There's concerns over security, but there's other factors at play as well. And as I said, when we talk about governance of the Isles, we often turn to James VI and his civilising policies. Um, he wanted to ensure the loyalty and obedience of his Highland and Hebridean chiefs while also pacifying the region and reaping full economic returns because James regarded the Highlands and Isles as being, quote, most commodious as well by the fertility of the ground as rich fishings by sea. And then in the next breath, he talked about the inhabitants of the region as being barbarous without any civil or honest society amongst them. They were to be reduced to a godly, honest, and civil manner of living. Now, I'm not justifying James's actions in this, but he's adopting rhetoric that was very common at the time. Um, we absolutely know that Hebridean chiefs were not barbarous. Uh, Hugh brilliantly uh, discussed that for us as well. That's the view from the outsider. They are, they're barbarous, they're uncivilized, um, and Hugh detailed their culture perfectly, so I don't need to go into it then. But what I, usually what I do is I point, we've seen this slide a couple of times before, my students to this um, image. This is the tombstone of Alexander MacLeod in Rodell in Harris. Um, MacLeod dies in the 1540s, but he designed this in the 1520s. Um, this is not somebody who's barbarous. This is somebody who is very consciously projecting an image of himself. Sorry, these are my photos, so they're not brilliant. Uh, 
there's a mix of scenes of religious imagery, but also Highland, there's Highland hunting scenes. And of course, uh, as you've seen before, we get the galley, which is one of my favorite slides, and I'll come back to that later. These are not uncivilized people. These are not barbaric people. But that language of barbarity and, civ and civility, I, as I said, was dominant at the time. The English in Ireland are using that, and the English, along with the Spanish and Portuguese, those European powers that are encountering the other across the Atlantic and justifying their treatment of indigenous peoples by emphasizing their lack of civility. Um, as the English argued in relation to Ireland, it was their responsibility, it was their duty even to bring reform to these areas. And bringing reform meant not just pacifying, but also developing agriculture, trade, and thereby realizing a civil society. So in expounding his um, theories or his policies for plantation in Lewis, James utilised a similar language. Now, the Highlands, I, I'm not done it, we, we saw John of Forden's quote back in the 14th century, the Highlanders had always been characterised as lawless, as difficult, as, as different. But you get this, this increased emphasis on this language of civility during James's reign. Um, but the Isles were part of James's kingdom. He regarded them as part of his kingdom. The, ha the inhabitants were his inhabitants. He didn't need to go to the lengths that other European powers had to, to justify their policies somewhere else. But he did, because his policies were displanting, displacing, dispossessing the inhabitants from their land. And he justified his actions by explaining that the inhabitants were void of any knowledge of God or his religion and naturally abhorring all kind of civility and have given themselves over to all kind of barbarity and inhumanity. James saw the region as in need of reform, absolutely, because he wanted his rents paid, um, but he was adopting that contemporary language, um, that, that rhetoric, really to reinforce that and to justify his policies. And those arguments went hand in hand with efforts to exploit the natural resources of the region. But the, all this emphasis on James VI, I think, and, and his efforts to implement these so-called so civilizing policies in a more sustained way, argues, uh, sorry, um, ignores, I think, what is happening much earlier in the century and what is taking place during the reign of James V. And I'm going to go back to the late 1530s and 1540s here, where you start to see, I think, earlier efforts. They get cut short because James dies early. Um, that's what I mean, James VI doesn't die, he lives longer. Most other Stuart monarchs of the 16th century get cut off a little bit too early. So it was James VI's grandfather, James V, who um, was one of the, the kings who actually went to the Isles. He embarked on this voyage to the Northern and Western Isles in 1540. It's been argued um, that this was the king's daunting of the islands because there was no rebellion, no, no rebellion broke out again for another three whole years. Um, I'm not convinced that actually amounts to a successful daunting. I don't even know what a daunting is meant to look like, but I don't think that was the point of James's voyage. Yes, there had been a rebellion in the Isles in 1539. Donald MacDonald of Slate had um, uh, led rebellion and, and then moved on to Ross, but the situation north in Orkney was concerning also. The uh, 1529 Battle of Somerdale was evidence of a family dispute there and the situation uh, had not yet been resolved to James's satisfaction. As such, the voyage that James embarks on in the 1540s was about shoring up crown influence across the islands and that included the Northern Isles. Um, but there was an element there that was also about financial and, and finances and security concerns too. A lot of historians have, have argued that James's 1540 uh, voyage to the Isles was a show of strength. They talk about it as James embarking on this circumnavigation of his realm and a display of imperial monarchy. I don't really buy that. I think it's a, if it is a show of strength, it's a show of strength from a place of vulnerability um, and weakness. But James leaves Leith on the 13th of June, and he goes first to Orkney, where he spent some time with the then bishop, stayed then with Robert Maxwell. While he was there, he granted crown lands to Oliver Sinclair and made him Justice Sheriff, Admiral, and Bailey of Orkney and all its lordships, um, but at a significantly increased rental, which Sinclair agreed, uh, agreed to pay. He left Orkney and then journeyed on to the Western Isles. 
And he was there for a short time. He left behind uh, William Cunningham, then the master of Glencairn, and he stayed behind for a further year to undertake a crown survey of, uh, to undertake a survey of crown lands. He, uh, James V sent him the ship, the Little Forfer, for his use while he was there. James then sailed back to Dumbarton and was back in Edinburgh by the 6th of July. So the, the voyage really had, had been a little over, um, just, sorry, less than a month. Um, but he, he had taken a number of hostages while he was in the Isles and he took them back to the Lowlands and warded them in a number of castles. But it doesn't stop there. If you continue to look at James's behaviour after this voyage, it's really interesting. In Parliament in December 1540, so the end of that year, six months after the voyage, he passed the Act of Annexation, which saw the North and South Isles, Kintyre, Orkney and Shetland, now annexed to the Crown, so firmly in Crown hands and, and to pass on to male heirs. And in the following year, in May 1541, James wrote to Paul III, Pope, sorry, Pope Paul III, regarding the Sea of Orkney, which was then vacant. The Sea of Orkney, James wrote, comprises the scattered isles in the polar ocean. And owing to neglect by the bishops, little has been done for the improvement of manners or for religious development. He went on to nominate his friend, uh, Robert Reed, then the abbot of Kinloss, for the position, arguing that he was a person of sagacity who will easily meet these needs. The same day, he also wrote to Jerome, Garden, Cardinal Ducucci and described the Orkney Islands as being almost under the pole. And he continued that proximi proximity to Norway, Denmark and Germany and official neglect by the bishops are thought to account for unsatisfactory observance not only of true religion but also of the laws. An opportunity now arises for remedy. The remedy, as far as James V was concerned, was uh, let's nominate Robert Reed for the position of Bishop of Orkney. And, and James was writing to garner support for this move. Now, uh, by this time, James had been to Orkney. Uh, so he was fully aware that the islands were not located under the pole. Um, contemporary maps, yes, they may have located Shetland between, accurately between Scotland and Norway, but Orkney is hardly... Uh, comprised of scattered isles to suggest they were in the polar ocean as opposed to just across the Pentland Firth, tricky tidal, turn, tidal currents notwithstanding. This is something of an exaggeration on the part of the king. Now, admittedly, in talking about the polar ocean, James may have meant the North Sea, absolutely, but I don't think he did. Um, James's letters to the Pope and the Cardinal, again, appeared to suggest a concern with true religion, much in the way James VI always emphasised the, the Highlander's lack of true religion. Um, and he equates that also with the problem of governance of the islands that are remote, located in the north. But there's an altogether different agenda going on here on the part of James. His reference to Orkney's um, proximity to Norway, Denmark and Germany was a result of the involvement of Lübeck in what amounted to a civil war in Denmark, Norway during the 1530s, upheaval that at times had direct implication for James. But the 1540 voyage and James's actions in the aftermath of the voyage may have been influenced by the publication in 1539 of this map called Carta Marina by Aulus Magnus, an exiled Scottish, Swedish priest, sorry, then living in Italy. Now, um, I've become absolutely fascinated with this map. It's lovely. It's a detailed map of Nordic countries from Iceland to Finland and included both the Orkney and Shetland Islands. If I can, this is Orkney here and Shetland's up here. Um, you have the east coast of England and Scotland. You've also got various vessels, sea monsters, uh, ocean eddies. It depicts a sea battle between the Hamburg and, and the Scotty. I think that's it up there, which was said to be reflective of commercial tensions. I think it, it's meant to be commercial tensions between Hamburg and England, but either way, it's reflective of the time. What I find most interesting about this now, I have absolutely no evidence that James saw this map, right? No direct evidence. But I do know this was published widely across Europe at the time. But it's this detail at Orkney that I find really interesting. Um, this is a Norwegian coat of arms. You have vessels and you have fish in around the, the Orkney Islands. Um, I could be putting two and two together and coming up with 67, but you know, I think there's something in this. Um, 
Now, whether it's deliberate aggravation on the part of James V is unclear, but the map is said to reflect the political history and the political aspirations of the North in the late Middle Ages from the perspective of, of Scandinavia. If he did see this map, his actions on his return from the voyage in 1540, I think, suggest that James is, is, is prepared to do something. In, 15, in August 1540, so just a month after he came back, um, James wrote to the authorities of Bremen and other imperial officers and to Charles V, the emperor, concerning the fishing around Orkney and Shetland. He referred to an incident that had occurred in 1530, whereby a number of fishermen were run down and drowned while fishing in Orkney seas by certain Hollanders, apparently for no other reason than that they were Scots. Because the Scots had suffered so long and so much in their own waters, James has decided to take firm action. He asked the authorities to ensure their fishermen did not invade his waters and bounds with the intent to deprive Scots by illegal methods of the fruit of their toil on the coasts, arguing that these regulations were necessary to preserve the immunity of the Scots by land and sea. James evidently is regarding these lands and these seas and the resources of them as his. They're Scottish and he wanted to preserve them for the enrichment of his own kingdom and thus controlling who fished in the waters around his kingdom. As I said earlier, his unexpected death the next year in 1542 put an end to all of this. It would be James VI who would go on, go on then to later lay claim to territorial waters and the rights of fishing, but that's a whole other story that I'll, I'll not come to right now. But James V wasn't just interested in islands, uh, control over them and the rights to water and the resources of the water. Um, he also wanted greater navigational knowledge of this water. Now, I think this was less to do with his concern over the maritime power of the Highlanders and Islesmen, which I'll come to later, but more about the wider international context. Again, I think James is, is as always, massively in, uh, influenced by the international context. Uh, following a treaty between France and Spain in 1538, now they had, were traditional enemies, absolutely traditional enemies, um, but given Henry VIII's recent divorce uh, from Catherine of Aragon and also uh, splitting from, from Rome, um, when Spain and France make a truce, Henry starts to feel incredibly vulnerable um, and scared um, in the face of external threats. His dissolution of the monasteries in 1536 had filled the English royal purse significantly, and it provided him with the finances um, to commission surveys of his southern coast and to build and replenish defence fortifications, which he does. He, he fortifies an awful lot of castles around the um, southern coast, and there's a number of really beautiful maps um, that show where fortifications need to be made. Now, there was no immediate um, threat to Scotland, but Henry's actions, uh, the wider Reformation context on the continent and unrest in Denmark-Norway in the 1530s had made James perhaps more aware of the need for navigational knowledge of the waters of his kingdom. And following his expedition in 1540, uh, the first Scottish rudder was produced by Alexander Lindsay. Now, a rudder is literally a sailing manual, um, and it tells you how to sail from one headland to another, gives you compass um, points in the compass, wind directions, what to look out for. Um, it, in other words, rocks that might be submerged. It was compiled from earlier 15th century material, Scottish material, but it was the first navigational aid to focus on the coastline of Scotland, and it provided detailed information um, and, and detailed sailing instructions from Leith anti-clockwise around the north of Scotland, through the Isles to Kintyre and onto the Solway Firth. Um, this map is based on the rudder. Now, this wasn't published at the time. This is produced later in the 1580s, I think, in a French work by Nicolas de Nicolet. But Alexander's rudder had made its way to England, which is then picked up by the French and published later along with this map. And it's likely that James's voyage in 1540 provided the opportunity for a lot of the detail, the sailing instructions that were included in this rudder. Um, other historians have suggested that, that the rudder was produced for the voyage. Um, I prefer the other argument, but, but um, I can't be sure of that. It might have been. But the rudder emerges out of this voyage one way or another. The rudder, however, doesn't stop at the Solway Forth. Um, it provides more general information concerning passage onto the Isle of Man. 
Now, the Isle of Man has come under English jurisdiction since 15, sorry, 1333. Uh, it had been under Scottish jurisdiction prior to that. I don't think Scots ever gave up their claim to man. It's probably not a very overt claim. Uh, in the early 1300s, Thomas Randall had held the title Lord of Man, and once the English had taken jurisdiction of the island, that title continued to pass through, the Scot through his line. I haven't traced it all the way, um, so don't ask me about that. But it ends up with John Stuart, uh, Regent, Duke of Albany, who's regent during the minority of James V, has the, the Manx arms incorporated into his coat of arms and still held, holds the title Lord of Man, despite the fact that it is under the jurisdiction of the English crown. And I think you can see that um, claim to man, that, or at least that lingering claim to man in ecclesiastical terms as well. Uh, the Diocese of Sodern Man, which you can just make out on this tombstone, um, which is, again, one of my photos, so sorry, it's not brilliant, uh, at Peel Castle in Man. Um, the Diocese of Sodern the Man had formerly, as, as we've heard earlier, come under the, the jurisdiction of the Norwegian Archbishop of Trondheim. In 1472, the granting of metropolitan status to St Andrews meant that all Scottish bishops were brought under the Archbishop of, of St Andrews, including that of the Isles. Um, and, but the Scottish Church was reluctant to see Soder and the man split. In 1498, James IV petitioned the papacy for Iona Abbey to be erected as a see of the Bishop of the Isles until, and I quote, his principal Kirk in the Isle of Man be recovered from Englishmen. In James V's reign, two of his leading island chiefs, Alexander MacLeod of Dunnevague and the Glens and Hector MacLean of Duart, attacked the Isle of Man the English had prior intelligence of the attack, but it still happened. They captured the English ship, the Mary Willoughby, which later um, was one of the flagships of uh, James V's 1540 expedition. The aim of that attack, I have no idea what it was, but James V was, um, let's say, not displeased with it. Um, and uh, as I said, the, the, the ship, the Mary Willoughby, became one of the flagship of the Scottish fleet. Either way, it, it suggests that the Hebridean, chief, the Hebridean chiefs were part of this maritime world that stretches from Orkney and Shetland right down through to Man in the south. But the inclusion of Man is also seen in another contemporary work, dating, it has been suggested, from around 1549, and that was the description of the Occidental, i.e. the Western Isles of Scotland by Donald Munro, and the handout you have is an extract from that that relates to Skye. Now, Donald Munro was made, made Archdeacon of the Isles around that time. Now, there's, fortunately, there's little evidence to suggest why he undertook this work beyond providing vital information for future Bishop of the Isles. In his work, Munro mentions every parish church, but much of his description is also given over to detailing the extent of fertile and fruitful land which is inhabited and manured while also providing specific information on livestock as well as fish. His description covers over 250 islands on the western seaboard, so just a little more than was mentioned earlier um, of the 230 islands in the census of, of three centuries later. But Munro starts his account with the Isle of Man, um, adding that in the Isle of Man is the Cathedral Kirk of the Bishopric of Man of the Isles dedicated in the honour of Peter Apostle. But Monroe's work didn't just end up being some account for clergy. Monroe's account then was incorporated by George Buchanan, the renowned European humanist, in his History of Scotland, published in 1582, while Buchanan's account was later used in John Blau's Atlas of Scotland, Volume 5 of his Atlas Novus, published in Amsterdam in 1654. He took his description, Blau took his description of Scotland and the Western Isles from various sources. His section on the Western Isles came from Buchanan, who had taken his work in turn from Munro. So uh, what's the point to all this? What I'm saying is the 1530s and 40s saw a demand for greater knowledge of the region. You have a survey of Crown lands, and after that, you see significant rental increases in the highlands. James really hikes up these 
the, these, the, the rents that he's charging for his lands. You also see Kintyre, I, I, uh, the Lordship of the Isles, former Lordship of the Isles, Orkney and Shetland annexed to the Crown. You have efforts by James V to control who had right to navigate the water and also who had the rights to the resources of the waters around Scotland, that included Orkney. And there's also his desire for greater navigational knowledge of the waters around his kingdom. And yet, you see the ongoing frustration on the part of, their account, of the crown with their own ability to exploit the natural resources of the isles. James's reign is cut short. Skip a generation, we come to James VI. And when James VI expounds his belief that the highlands and the isles were most commodious as well by the fertility of the ground as by the rich fishings by sea, this wasn't just some abstract hope of filling a really very empty royal purse, but he had knowledge of the rich fishings by sea um, and of the fertile land in the highland region that he could exploit. The problem is he wanted to exploit those resources for his own ends, not for the benefit of the people who were living in the Isles. So finally, um, one of the last things I want to touch on, and what I haven't touched on before, is, is the water that connects all of these islands together. Now, I know I'm stating the obvious, and I probably don't need to say it to this audience, but sometimes I, you do sometimes need to state the obvious. We need to see the sea not as a barrier, but as a bridge. I know you all know that. I just sometimes always feel I have to point it out. The sea is something that connects. It is a form of communication. It is a form of transport. It, it brings people together. It does not divide. And that is very much the case for the, the, the islands of Scotland. The sea was not just something to be traversed, something you have to cross to get something else. But as I said, it was trade, communication, and a resource. Many clans held estates that were divided by water, the most obvious being the McDonald's of Isla. Um, you have the McLeods of Dunvegan and Harris. You have the McLeods of Mull, who also held lands in Isla. Uh, lands later um, held by the Campbells of Codder. And across the western seaboard and isles, um, there's a very strong maritime tradition. Um, we've already seen the galley from McLeod uh, of Harris's uh, tombstone. There are so many of these. Um, Colin Martin has done some wonderful archaeological digs in, in relation to the maritime tradition, but we have so many beautiful carved headstones with, with galleys on them, testament to that really rich maritime tradition. And it was a military strength um, that was both respected and feared by monarchs. During James's attempts to pacify the Western Highlands and Isles, and during part of his, when he's developing planta or trying to develop plantation in Lewis, he passes legislation calling for all Berlins and galleys in the Western Isles to be destroyed. Uh, a policy that he quickly realizes was completely unworkable, and then decides, well, no, no, it's okay, we won't destroy them, just hand them over to the Crown so that we can use them, but you can't. Um, again, a, a policy that didn't really meet with much success. Despite wanting to harness this maritime strength for its own purposes. It was a maritime tradition that was significantly looked down on. The vessels were regarded as backward and primitive. The inhabitants, again, regarded as barbarous and inhumane. The maritime tradition, backward. And this stems from that characterization of the Highlanders by outsiders um, as backward, primitive, lacking in development. They looked at this maritime tradition that had descended from the Vikings. Yes, it hadn't developed from the 13th century, but that's because it didn't need to. Berlins are absolutely suited to the tidal conditions and the waters of, of the islands around this coastline. Um, they can be shelved on, on, on uh, shallow beaches, and, and we see evidence of that all around. There was no need for it to develop anymore, but it's looked down on because it was regarded as somewhat separate from European shipbuilding traditions. And yet, um, and I know some people will disagree with me on this, that the view is that when James VI succeeds to the English and Irish thrones in 1603, he then has a much greater navy at his disposal, and he's able to challenge the dominance of the Highlanders in these waters. I, I just don't agree with that. I, I don't see that at all. I think it takes I don't think uh, the Crown is ever really to meet that, able to meet that challenge at all. Those vessels and the skill and expertise of the Highlanders and the Hebrideans in, in these waters was paramount. I don't think any Scottish monarch was able to overcome that, certainly not in this period. 
So the broad brush narrative that I started with suggests that by the early 17th century, James VI and I had gained the upper hand against the Highlanders and the Islemen. As I said, I'm, I'm not at all convinced by these arguments. Rudders and maritime maps don't provide the practical knowledge needed to understand the tides, the currents and the harbours of these waters, or indeed the vessels suited for navigating them. Much like his policies on land, so too on sea. And yes, James achieves victory um, despite very many failures. Is that, you know, you have to fail so many times to get success. But sometimes I think with James VI, it's almost a case of snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. And yet we acknowledge his successes more, I think, than his failures. But regardless of how these inhabitants are described, Regardless of how their customs and maritime traditions were viewed, successive Scottish monarchs recognised the importance of the Isles for the wider kingdom. And by the early 17th century, they had significantly more knowledge of the region, both by land and sea, than they ever had before. They knew the Isles were not just the scattered Isles in the polar ocean, but that's a nice rhetoric to justify their exploitation of it. The problem was that they wanted to exploit the region for their own benefit, and not for the benefit of the region itself. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Brilliant, very good. And I like the way that we didn't design it this way, but these papers are connected with each other. There's, there's echoes and strands that, 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 that marry up. So we'll maybe say more about that in, in the next session or after the next session or the end of the next session. Sorry. You have apparently eight minutes comfort break, but have ten if you must. But please uh, take no longer than that because we want to get on with the next speaker. OK, thank you very much.
glad to see a lot of people have stayed because we're in for a treat. Um, I heard Steve once yesterday and I understand he spoke twice, so I'm, I'm kind of, and I know the response he had, so I'll kind of introduce him by saying the legendary Steve Brissetti, um, who has this wonderful, this wonderful title of Professor of Paleontology and Evolution at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and of course, he's well known, uh, a specialist on, in, the, in the area of Jurassic and dinosaurs, has written that classic book on the, on, on, the, on the dinosaur, the rise and fall of the dinosaurs and the rise and reign of the mammals, uh, and so on. So um, without further ado, um, we're, this, is, this, is, this is Island's past. This is the serious past. Uh, so Steve, over Thank to you. you. Great. go. All right. Thank you, Becky. All right. Well, thank you uh, again for <laughs> letting me speak. Um, I know some of you, uh, you know, would have uh, seen my talk last night, and uh, I'll just tell you right away, it's the exact same slides, uh, but I'll do it a little bit differently. I'm going to do it a little bit shorter, a little bit sweeter, um, uh, and uh, I just want to give you an overview of the island's prehistoric past. So I've been, it's been uh, very enjoyable for me to hear the speakers uh, today talking about the last few hundred years uh, here in the islands. Very interesting. I'm going to go back 170 million years to tell you about the dinosaurs and the other animals that used to live here back in the Jurassic period. Uh, although uh, there's already been a dinosaur talk because the burn talk, so uh, you will get a little snippet, uh, just a little bit of how um, we actually have fossils here on Sky of the ancestors of birds, which were dinosaurs. Okay, so um, we're here on Sky. Uh, I come from a long way away. I grew up in the middle part of America, and about a decade ago, uh, I was hired at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, over the last decade, I've, I've really uh, enjoyed tremendously living in Scotland. I've, I've felt very welcome uh, in the community here. I've become a dual citizen. I have a young son now who is very much a Scottish boy. So uh, I, I just once again, just to, you know, as kind of trite as it sounds, a big thank you to the people here across Scotland, uh, including here on the Isle of Skye, who welcome me because uh, over the past decade, I have led a lot of different fieldwork trips up here to look for fossils and to dig up dinosaurs because the Isle of Skye uh, really is a sweet spot for paleontologists because there are rocks here from the Jurassic Age. That's a time that dinosaurs lived. Uh, and these were rocks that were formed in rivers and beaches and ponds and lagoons, the kind of places where dinosaurs lived, so we can find their fossils there. And really, the Isle of Skye is it, pretty much the only place in Scotland where you can find dinosaurs. We have started to find some dinosaur fossils on egg and on muck and a few other places, but really, Skye is Scotland's dinosaur island. And it's because, again, a lot of uh, the rocks on Skye, especially along the east coast and Trotternish, north of Portree, a lot of those rocks that uh, are sculpted into that beautiful landscape around Staffan, Valtos, around Kilt Rocks. Some of those rocks are volcanic, but a lot of them are rocks made of sand and mud from the Jurassic period, and you can find fossils there. And these are important fossils. They're important, of course, for us in Scotland because they're Scottish dinosaurs. I mean, that's really neat to have fossils of the things that lived here 170 million years ago. But these fossils are also very important globally. Paleontologists around the world know about the Isle of Skye because the dinosaurs here are unique and they're particularly important because what we know about dinosaur evolution, we know the first dinosaurs lived in what's called the Triassic period of Earth history. This began about 250 million years ago. This was the time of the supercontinent Pangaea when all the land was gathered together into this one giant landmass that stretched from the North Pole to the South Pole. And it was on that landmass that the first mammals 
evolved, so our ancestors, and alongside them, the very first dinosaurs. And these first dinosaurs were not T-Rexes and Brontosauruses and the types of dinosaurs that we're most familiar with. Uh, these first dinosaurs were mostly small. They were pretty humble. They were not particularly important animals in their ecosystems. They were not at the top of the food chain. They were not the biggest meat eaters. They didn't shake the earth as they walked, nothing like that. But they were mostly the size of dogs, up to the size of humans, the size of horses. The biggest ones were maybe about the size of a giraffe. So that was the humble start of dinosaurs. Then, of course, we know that dinosaurs changed. And later on, in the late part of the next period of time, called the Jurassic period, and then into the Cretaceous period, this is when a lot of the famous dinosaurs lived. In the late Jurassic, you have the really big ones with the long necks, Brontosaurus, Diplodocus, Stegosaurus with the plates on its backs. In the Cretaceous, that was the time of T-Rex and Triceratops. And so throughout dinosaur history, there, there was a change really from these first small dinosaurs to the giant ones. And that change happened in the middle part of the Jurassic period a 10 year, a million year interval, about 175 to about 165 million years ago. And it just so happens that there's very few fossils of that age from anywhere around the world. It's just the bad luck of geology, of what kind of rocks are available, what kind of rocks were formed during that time that might have fossils in them. There's very few anywhere in the world, but it just so happens that these rocks here on sky come from that black hole in our understanding of dinosaur evolution. So that's why paleontologists around the world are very interested in them. Strangely enough, though, it was only in the 1980s that the first dinosaur fossil was found here and recovered and studied and identified correctly as being a dinosaur. And that was a single footprint that was in a block of rock that fell off of one of the cliffs at Brothers Point, north of Portree. So it was just around the time I was born that the very first dinosaur was found here. But since then, people have been finding a lot more. And over the last decade, I've been very privileged to be able to work here on Sky and get to know Sky very well uh, and to bring my students here and find a lot of cool new fossils. Now, I'll give away a little bit of the answer here. These are the types of dinosaurs that we know lived on Skye back in the Jurassic. And there's more as well. And there's things that, of course, it wasn't just dinosaurs. There were mammals that lived here, and salamanders, and lizards, and crocodiles. And there were different reptiles living in the ocean and flying around the sky. And I'm going to uh, paint a picture in this talk of what the world here was like back in the Jurassic, when all of these different animals were living here. And I'll give you a few snippets of some of the fossils that we found over the last decade that helped tell the story. And in order to envision this, um, I'm going to have to ask you to suspend <laughs> what you know about the reality of Scotland today. You know, put your senses aside and go back 170 million years ago when Scotland was part of an island but a very different island, a much smaller island, actually. It was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, but the Atlantic Ocean was very narrow back then. The supercontinent had just started to break apart, and it split across what's now the Atlantic Ocean. That's why you know, South America and Africa look like puzzle pieces. They were. They were once joined. They split apart. The Atlantic came in. So the Atlantic was just forming in the middle part of the Jurassic, and so this Scottish island was in the Atlantic, but the Atlantic was this narrow little sliver. That island was a little bit farther south than it is today, a bit closer to the equator, but the temperature uh, around the world on the whole was much higher than today. There were no ice caps, there were no big glaciers, the global temperature was higher. So this Scottish island that these dinosaurs frolicked on was a subtropical island. So it was something like the Canary Islands or parts of California today, if you can imagine that. And I know that's just unfathomable when you look at <laughs> what it is here today. So this is Sky Today, of course, a beautiful place, and a lot of fossils lurking in these hills and in these cliffs that tell that story of when this land was the subtropical island 170 million years ago. And how do we know it? We know it from real fossils. 
We know it from real fossils. And I know we've heard a lot of talks about history today, and we've seen uh, talks you know, about the archives, talks about maps, talks about uh, books, about all of the records that historians have to tell the human history of these islands. Well, our records are fossils. Those are the clues that tell us about what this land was like millions and millions of years ago. And we have to go out and look for these fossils. And pretty much every year, uh, I bring teams up to Sky, uh, including many students at the University of Edinburgh, and we look for these fossils. And it's a whole lot of fun, a little bit challenging, of course, given the weather. Uh, we're always battling the rain and the wind, and uh, most of the fossils are found along the coasts, so we always have to pay attention to the tides, but it's well worth it because we find some pretty neat things. Uh, none of this is possible without uh, a dear friend of mine and really a hero of mine and a friend of many of yours too. Uh, Doogie's name has come up so much uh, in conversation this weekend, including today. This is Doogie Ross here, uh, who many of you know. Uh, he, he runs the Staffen Museum north of Portree. Uh, he built that museum himself, literally. He built it uh, from the ruins of a 19th century schoolhouse. And in that museum are a lot of the fossils and also a lot of the archaeological and human artifacts that Doogie has collected over the last few decades. He started collecting when he was a teenager, and he's built up this amazing collection, but also he's somebody who uh, really is the eyes and ears on the island, and he's a great liaison between scientists like me and locals and tourists, people that find fossils, hikers that find fossils. He's really the nexus of all of this. And without Doogie, we wouldn't really know any of what I'm going to tell you today. And Doogie grew up here on Sky, grew up in a Gaelic speaking household. He's become an internationally recognized expert on dinosaurs, which I think is just thrilling. And the only person I know who's built his own museum, <laughs> which is incredible when you think about it. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, give you a few snippets, just a few of our discoveries uh, that, that uh, show, that will show you what kind of fossils we have that tell us what this world used to be like. One of them is this discovery we made up at Duntulum, not too far from the ruins of Duntulum Castle. Now, when the tide is high, the waves, you know, lap up against the beach. When the tide goes down, that coast turns into this rock platform that juts out about 100 meters into the water. We went out there uh, once because a geologist friend of ours found a little jawbone that got us very excited, and we were hoping, oh, maybe we'll find the rest of the skeleton. Maybe it'll be a new dinosaur species. And we looked all day. We didn't find any bones. It was a really quite disappointing day. Uh, but what we did start to look at, uh, just almost randomly, as, as we were walking back to our cars late that uh, afternoon, early evening, were these tide pools. And there were a lot of tide pools. There were over 100 of these circular depressions in the rock, you know, full of algae and seaweed and barnacles and all the normal things. Uh, and at first, we just started looking at them, just looking at what was, it, what was inside. And the more we looked, the, the more this kind of seemed strange to us. So there were so many tide pools. They were all about the same size and shape. And we could start to make out what we thought were some patterns. They weren't just randomly aligned, but there was a bit of like a zigzagging left-right linear sequence of some of these things. So that was odd. And we could see that uh, some of them were filled in with a harder rock that actually brought out some shape to them. They weren't just holes, but they had you know, bits sticking out uh, at the end. So, you know, one, two, three, four. So that's interesting, that's weird. And some of them were paired together. We could really see that there was a, a consistency of these things. There was a bigger horseshoe-shaped one, a smaller crescent-shaped one in front. And after a few moments, it dawned on us that what we were looking at here were actually fossils. Dinosaur fossils, but not bones or teeth or skeletons, but the fossilized marks that they left behind, their handprints and their footprints. And this was such a fun revelation. It was myself and Tom Challens, my friend who's a fellow paleontologist uh, in Edinburgh, when, when we just realized that we were looking at these, these 170 million year old footprints and handprints of dinosaurs, records of these animals going about their everyday lives. And it's these kind of dinosaurs that made the tracks, the long neck dinosaurs, the ones with the tiny heads and the big bellies and the arms and legs that look like Greek columns, uh, what we call the sauropod dinosaurs. 
they were uh, the size of about three elephants put together. And they were actually fairly small. Later sauropods, later on in the Cretaceous period, would become like heavier than a jet airplane, like an easy jet plane or a Ryan airplane, which is, which is stunning. These were merely the size of three elephants, but they were some of the first dinosaurs in Earth history that got to be really big. When these things were just stomping around ancient Scotland, they were the biggest things or among the very biggest things that had ever lived in the history of the Earth. And we keep finding new track sites. We keep, we keep go, going out, we keep looking. I have great students, um, one of whom is Paige here, who came from the US to study with us. And, and Paige has led a lot of work in describing these track sites, and in particular, using drones to fly over these track sites to make really high quality maps. And those maps help us understand you know, how many footprints and handprints we have, how big they are, how many different dinosaurs made them. They help us identify the makers of those footprints, having really good models. We can basically do the Cinderella thing and fit dinosaur feet to those footprints and see which ones match. And that's what helps tell us you know, it was a big long neck dinosaur that made those tracks, for instance. Um, and those dinosaurs here uh, in this artwork by John Hode from Perth, a great paleo artist, uh, this is what he imagines one of those dinosaurs would have looked like. So just imagine something of that stature. You know, this was an animal that would have struggled to really fit inside of this room. I mean, it could because the ceiling here is quite high, but you probably couldn't get two of them in here very easily. Um, and again, when they were living, they, they were some of the first true giants in Earth history. But it wasn't only these long-necked dinosaurs. There were other dinosaurs that left their footprints and handprints in the Jurassic on Sky. And some of them were meat-eating dinosaurs, like this one here in the foreground. This was only about the size of a human, but it had sharp teeth and claws. It's what we call a theropod dinosaur. These things were the ancestors, basically, of T-Rex and of birds. Both of those groups would come from the theropod dinosaurs later on. Uh, this site at Duntulum, we had a lot of fun uh, communicating it uh, to the press, and we, it was really fun to see uh, some of the newspapers and tabloids pick it up, and we gave it this nickname of the dinosaur disco, just having a little bit of fun, but trying to convey that message that here we have about 150 footprints at Duntulum and handprints of these dinosaurs just doing their thing back in the Jurassic. And I think that's really neat, that that is a record of dinosaurs living their lives. And you can go see it, because when we find footprints like that, we don't dig them out of the ground. You know, we destroy the landscape. And where would we put them? So they're there. They're in situ. And you can go to Duntulum. You can park just alongside the road, make sure it's low-ish tide. And you can go walk with those dinosaurs. And we're starting to find even more track sites now at Brothers Point, which is also along that Trotternish coastline. And we're seeing even more types of dinosaurs that left their footprints. And these are beautiful sites to work at. We fly the drones over these sites. Some of these footprints match the feet of stegosaurs, those dinosaurs with the plates on their backs. Other ones match the feet of even bigger long neck dinosaurs with really clear toe impressions that really help us do the Cinderella thing and fit the feet of dinosaur skeletons. And then others are these big tracks with only three toes, no handprints. So an animal that walked only on his hind legs, and these seem to match the feet of what we call duck-billed dinosaurs. And these were plant-eating dinosaurs that had big beaks, kind of like a duck. So we really have an entire ecosystem that's emerging from these footprints. Giant long-necked dinosaurs, which were plant-eaters. Stegosaurs with the plates on their backs, also plant-eaters. Duck-billed dinosaurs, also plant eaters, but probably they all specialized on different plants. Those long-necked dinosaurs seem to have made their footprints in the lagoons. We find a lot of their tracks in rocks that were actually formed in shallow water, so it seems like they actually lived a little bit in the water, or at least would go out in the water. The stegosaurs and duckbills probably kept more to the land, and then you have those meat-eating theropod dinosaurs too. So you're seeing here on this subtropical Scottish island 170 million years ago in the middle of that narrow but ever-widening Atlantic Ocean, basically a whole food chain of dinosaurs. 
And we can tell that from the footprints, but we do also have fossil bones. We do. We just don't have as many bones as footprints, and the bones don't look so good, so I don't have as many photos. But you'll see some good bones in a minute. So that's what's happening on the land. But you might also be wondering, what was the Jurassic world like here uh, in the water and in the air? And you had other animals living offshore and other animals flapping about that were not dinosaurs. And we have fossils of some of those animals. We have fossils that come from Bering Bay right near the uh, power station. And some of these fossils were discovered in the 1950s by this man, Brian Shawcross, when he was quite young. And he showed them to us, and we recognized that they belonged to a type of reptile, not a dinosaur, a cousin of the dinosaurs, a type of reptile called an ichthyosaur. And these were the things that ruled the waves when dinosaurs dominated the land. And they were reptiles that looked like fish or like dolphins. And that's because they lived a similar lifestyle. They were really fast swimmers. They swam with those flippers. They had a long snout with lots of teeth that they used to catch fish and catch squid. And so we determined not only that we had an ichthyosaur based on those bones that Brian found, but it was a new type of ichthyosaur never seen anywhere else in the world, a uniquely Scottish ichthyosaur. So Doogie Ross actually came down here to the Gallic College and talked to some of the lecturers and came up with the name, a Gallic name, one of the only times this has been done for a, for a species, and we named this Yarkovara, which means something like marine reptile or marine lizard. And the press caught wind, and of course, they played up the Loch Ness Monster angle, <laughs> as they always do, which, you know, is maybe a little bit silly. But we took the opportunity uh, to uh, try to connect with people and say, hey, uh, whatever may or may not be lurking in Loch Ness right now, what we do know for sure is that in the Jurassic period, there were real sea monsters that lived in Scotland. And when we announced the discovery of Brian's fossil, some other fossils came out of the woodwork. And here was a letter uh, that uh, a copy was sent to me. It was a letter uh, that was sent to the, what was then the Royal Museum uh, in the 1960s, now the National Museum of Scotland. And a guy named Nori Gillis, who ran the power station back in the 60s, he actually had found an ichthyosaur, a bunch of backbones sticking out of the rock in this old photo, which was sent to me by his son. And the National Museum collected it, and it was in the collections, and we didn't know about it, but we tracked it down, and we cleaned it up, and a few years ago, we unveiled it. And this is a, probably another species. We haven't given it a name yet. We're still studying it, but this thing was about the size of a speedboat. So these were big, ferocious animals that lived offshore while the dinosaurs were on the land. Now, living slightly more near shore in the lagoons and in the shallow water, were some other animals, and we found some fossils of them at Valtos, as you can see, pretty close to Kilt Rock. There's the waterfall down there. So a lot of this stretch here is formed of these blocks of sandstone that have fallen off these cliffs. And those blocks of rock can have bones in them. And here's one tiny bone that Tom Challens, who I mentioned, who found the footprints with me, that Tom saw this bone somehow. It's this tiny little thing, just an inch or so long, and it turns out to be the jawbone of a crocodile, a tiny little crocodile just the size of a lap dog, and it was these little crocs that would have swam in the shallow water of the lagoons. It probably would have been snapping at the legs of those giant dinosaurs as they waded through the water. But what about the sky? What was in the sky on the Isle of Skye back then? Well, we didn't know anything really until very recently. There were no birds back then, we don't think. Birds evolved from dinosaurs a little bit later in the Jurassic, we think. Although who knows, maybe we will find the world's oldest fossil bird sometime here on the Isle of Skye. But what was flying around back then? There were things that were flapping over the heads of dinosaurs. And one of our students, Amelia Penny, made this incredible discovery out on one of our trips in 2017. And Amelia saw this thing in the rocks at Brothers Point. That's what she's scrutinizing there. And it was something that was a bit darker in color. It seemed to have a shape to it. It seemed to have a different texture to it. This is what it looked like up close. And as you can see from the title of that slide, it's the skull of a pterodactyl, a flying reptile, what we technically call a pterosaur. And these things are 
sometimes mistaken as dinosaurs. You see them in the dinosaur toy sets and in the dinosaur posters, but they're actually close cousins of dinosaurs. They were the first animals with bones to ever evolve flight in the history of the Earth. And this fossil turns out to be one of the very best pterosaurs that's ever been found in Britain, and by far the very best one that's known from the middle part of the Jurassic anywhere in the world. And what was amazing about it is that when Amelia found that skull, we thought, wow, we have the head of a pterodactyl. This is amazing. Let's get this out of the rock. So Doogie came down with his saws. We started to remove the rock. And as the rock split, we saw there were other bones there. And that head led to a neck, and that neck led to a body, and that body had wings sticking out and a tail sticking out. And we basically had the skeleton of this pterodactyl. And Doogie worked hard with his saw to cut it out. We were battling the tides. The tides actually came up and encroached on the fossil. I told the full story last night. I won't go through it again. But we really feared we were going to lose this fossil to the waves. And as the water was coming up, we really only needed about 10 or 15 minutes to get it out. We couldn't quite do it, so we dumped all the glue we had on the bones. And then we had to wait for the next low tide. We came back almost at midnight that day, just hoping that the fossil would still be there. And as the waters receded, we could see that it was, that the glue held. And we really only did need about another 10 or 15 minutes to get it out. We hoisted it up onto the beach the next morning. This thing is very heavy, this slab. Um, and you know, about 400 pounds or so it probably weighs. We got it up to the beach. We put it on this. Uh, this motorized wheelbarrow for that long, slow journey up. If those of you that have been to Brothers Point know, you're down by the water. You have to get up, basically, to the level of the cliffs in order to get to the road. And so we put it on this wheelbarrow. We got it up. We brought it back to Edinburgh. We cleaned up the fossil. We conserved it. Uh, and we saw that, yes, indeed, we have this beautiful skeleton. And this is much of the skeleton. Some of the other bones are on that other part that split off. So you're not seeing everything, and you're not seeing the whole wings here. But there's the head that Amelia first found, and there's the neck. There's the body. Here's this beautiful little hand with claws. And what's sticking out there is the ring finger, and it's the ring finger that was super long, kind of like a, you know, E.T. finger <laughs> that stuck out and supported the wings of these pterosaurs. Their wings were made of skin, not of feathers like birds, but they're giant sails of skin. And then the body, and there's a little foot, and there's the tail. So another PhD student of mine, we actually developed a PhD project, and Natalia Yigelska, uh, came to do this project with us. She moved to uh, Britain when she was about 9 or 10. She, she grew up in Poland. Uh, she's an excellent scientist. She's also a great artist. And this is how she envisions this pterodactyl. And about a year ago, we unveiled it at the National Museum. Uh, and we published a scientific uh, paper on it where we established it as a new species, a uniquely Scottish species. And of course, as a uniquely Scottish species, it needs a uniquely Scottish name, which of course means a Gaelic name. So Doogie once again came here to the Gaelic College, talked to some of the lecturers. And they came up with this name, Yark Skianach, which means basically, and again, forgive my <laughs> pronunciation in Gaelic, but basically a winged reptile from Skye. And it plays off the Gaelic name of Skye as the winged isle, which I think is really cool. And it is the wings of this animal that are truly important. This animal has a wingspan of over eight feet wide. So that's wider than a king-size bed. And up until Amelia found this fossil, nobody thought that these pterodactyls ever had a wingspan of more than about five feet for the entire Jurassic period. So this is a record breaker. And this animal, when it was flying over the heads of the dinosaurs 170 million years ago, it was the biggest thing that had ever flown in the history of the Earth that we know of. So again, we unveiled it last year at the National Museum, which was a whole lot of fun. And there's Amelia next to me. There's Nick Fraser, who some of you know, who's a, a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, eminent paleontologist. There's Natalia in the background doing an interview for television, which is really fun. It hit the news. It, it was a global story. And uh, as I was saying last night, you know, that day my parents called me up. In, in Illinois, back home, and said, your student's in the newspaper. We saw a picture of your student in the newspaper. It, it, it's, it was just incredible to see it have that kind of global reach. And it is a very important fossil. Now, we keep finding more fossils. 
And um, I keep coming back as a scientist, but also with my family. So there's my little boy. This is in 2020, the summer of 2020, right when the first lockdowns ended. As soon as we could, we got out here to Sky. We needed to get out of Edinburgh. And Anthony was, was uh, you know, just about nine, 10 months old at that point. And there he is crawling in one of the dinosaur footprints. Last summer, we came back with Anthony and with my parents, actually, to show them some of the footprints, which was just really a, a very touching thing. And Anthony's, you know, much bigger now. And there he is standing on one of those sauropod dinosaur tracks. That gives you a sense of the scale of those animals. And bringing Anthony to see these tracks, that's uh, really inspired our whole family. There's my wife, Anne, who some of you would have met yesterday. We did a schools event here uh, in the morning. And these track sites inspired Anne to write this children's book, Doogie the Dinosaur, the first and only, and therefore the best, uh, children's book on Scottish dinosaurs, uh, which is a storybook about these dinosaurs and pterosaurs and crocodiles and ichthyosaurs living in Jurassic Scotland. A fun story, but one, I can assure you, <laughs> is factually correct, is based on all the fossils that we have. So we keep looking for more, we keep finding more. This is giving us the story of what Scotland was really like 170 million years ago, the island's prehistoric past. And I just wanna say, when I write about fossils, and I've written these books for adults as well on dinosaurs and mammals, Sky is integral to these books. I, I tell stories in these books about working here on Sky. Doogie Ross is a big character in the dinosaur book, for instance. Uh, so it's become such a special place for me. Uh, and I just hope, may it long continue. And the last thing I will say is there's a whole lot more to be found out there. There's a lot more to be found. We are really just scratching the surface. Uh, it's been great seeing a lot of younger people here, especially yesterday with the school group and then some younger fossil enthusiasts, kids who collect fossils, who brought their fossils to show me that live on the island. It's great. And those kids and everybody should know there is a lot more to be found. Most fossils are not found by the paleontology professors and PhDs. They're found by hikers. They're found by farmers, construction workers. Even kids can find amazing fossils sometimes that turn out to be new species of dinosaurs. So keep your eyes open. Thank you very much. <laughs> No, I heard most of that yesterday. I didn't hear. <laughs> you cut it down wonderfully well, but but I hate to hear it again. It was just great. So inspirational. So folks, that's the end of the presentations. Um, we have a final session, um, which will last no more than half an hour. Um, what's is what? Where are we, Kate? With time, fifteen minutes. Okay, no more than fifteen minutes. <laughs> where can I ask all the speakers to come down here? This is called a Q and A session. So the questions will need to be short, and the answers will need to be even shorter. <laughs> and then we'll try and wind up and say, say a few closing remarks. So Be heard. Yes. Good again. Right. Um, we, we do have some questions from the online um, attendees, so to speak. Some of them are going to be lectures in themselves, so I won't ask them. But here's an easy one, or it might be an easy one for, for Ali. Um, it's anonymous, uh, but it's, it's perfectly respectable. Is Plantation Road on Stornoway named after the introduction of new settlers by James VI or a plantation of trees by the Mathesons or something else? Yes, yes, that's, that's it. it. Uh, I have no idea. Um, okay. I suggest uh, whoever an honest does ask Ernest McQuaynie, because he's the expert on the plantation of Lewis. Right. It could okay. be plantation, but 
yeah. you know, it could be trees, it could be people. Right, good. You don't, don't know. know. That's, that's a short answer. I like that one. Um, okay, floor's open. Anybody from the, from the attendees here who'd like to ask a question or make a point or disagree with something? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just ask the, the, the folks, sorry. Uh, the, the plantation that you mentioned there, had that got anything to do with the Fife Adventurers? It, w it was the Fife Adventurers, that's um, what they were called, the Gentlemen Adventurers of Fife. Uh, James VI gave a commission to them to go up to Lewis to undertake that plantation. Yeah, that's exactly who they were. So it was about people? Sorry? Not, it was about people, not trees? No, in the 16th century, plantation is about planting people. That, the idea behind it, um, it started in Ireland, uh, James picks up the idea, is that let's plant these civilised lowlanders into this barbarous region and they will develop trade and industry, um, develop ag agriculture and then hopefully through some process of osmosis, whatever, I'm not a scientist, you know, that their good behaviour will rub off on these barbaric highlanders, that, that kind of idea. But it is about planting people um, into the highlands to develop trade, agriculture, um, yeah, and reform the barbarous highlanders. Last summer, um, this is Animascha McCoy. Um, last summer was the first time we didn't hear the corn crake in the upper call on Lewis. Is this due to avian flu? Uh, I don't think there's any evidence of avian flu in corn crake. I think most of the avian flu has been in species that breed colonially. So it's affected things like terns, gulls, seabirds. Uh, and then it's affected the predators that would prey on any of these species that, uh, you know, succumb to the disease. So you've then got a range of species like great, greater black-backed gulls, buzzards, a whole range of raptors, you know, right up to your apex predators such as uh, white-tailed eagles. And what happened last year in particular is that white-tailed eagles were obviously bringing back prey, dead prey, to their young. And then the young were, feeling, you know, were surviving. So there's no, we weren't surviving. And there was a lot of mortality in white-tailed eagle chicks in Skye and Rassi. And we don't even know the extent of that. Uh, but certainly in terms of breeding productivity, uh, it was only about 20% of what it normally was. And, and the, the suspicion is that it was avian flu that was the problem. But no evidence of it in corn crake, but some evidence in, in wading birds. Uh, and it's just difficult to know what it's going to affect next. The other thing, I'll just say this briefly, was that there was a dead otter found at Kamasunri which was uh, removed by the, the IOSF and I think sent to, they use a university for post-mortems I think in Wales, I'm not sure what one it was. And initially it came back that there was no sign of avian flu and then about six months later I got a, an email from Ben Yorkshire to correct, to correct that, to say that in fact uh, the author at Kamasunari did contain evidence of uh, avian flu. Uh, and there's a strong suspicion that uh, DEFRA uh, weren't exactly being honest with everybody. And subsequently, there's been, uh, you know, they did disclose that in fact it had <coughs> moved into mammals. And of course, the consequences of that are quite significant given that every beach in sky usually has about 15 dugs. Okay, thanks, Bob. Anything else that anyone would like to ask about? We did hear about we have challenging papers. I want to hear the challenge or some of the speak of the cha the speakers who challenged being challenged. But I don't have any challenges. <laughs> um, but we don't have to. We don't. We don't. We don't. 
We don't have to. It's been a long day. So I think, I think I'll, just, um, I'll just wind up. I've got a few things to say. I've got notes over there, but um, I'll know I can, I can probably remember what I wanted to say. First thing is, on behalf of the Ross Society of Edinburgh, I do want to thank our partners, UHI and Solmore Osteg in particular, and even more particular, uh, Abigail Burnett for her contribution to this planning of, uh, of this conference and, and, and the, the work she's done in the last couple of days. Um, I would like to thank um, especially the, my colleagues at the RSE, Kate and Becky and their colleagues who have been so helpful in bringing this about. It's been a hard job. This has taken several years actually to get this, this, this initiative um, off the ground and here we are and it's a wonderful thing that, 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 that we've done it. I think there are going to be some, um, some, some it's not going to end today. For a start, we run, we've got our present and future uh, events to run. Um, the first will be probably September, October this year. Hopefully, well, it will be in the Outer Isles somewhere, um, depending on accommodation and what we think about the ferry service at the time. Um, early next year, we'll do the future session, and we're hoping to do that in Orkney, so please, um, if you're interested in, in, in attending those or taking part, you know, let us let us know, or, or, or watch the RSC website um, or any other uh, places do you you find information about these kind of things. Um, there will be other, I think, developments from this, and that is speaking personally, the number of new people I've met, um, and I think it's the same for all of us. Actually, we've met people from different backgrounds, different parts of the country wonderful postgraduates, um, and I can see all sorts of new, and well, the, the initiatives has been taken in terms of talking with people. I think I'd see new work happening um, in terms of new relationships, creative relationships, in terms of the various projects we're interested in. So I think that's great, and that's one of the reasons the RSE was keen to get out of Edinburgh, get out of the central belt, and, and, and connect with other people, learn from other parts of Scotland, but also try and bring people together in a kind of, as I say, creative kind of fashion. So um, finally then, I want to thank our speakers, um, all of whom I think have done us proud, uh, excellent range of contributions. I learned a lot myself. Um, my brain is buzzing. I'd like to say something profound in terms of things we've learned, but I'll have to do that. I'll have to watch the, watch the, the, watch the, the, the video we've got or the, the, the recording we have of this and make sense of it all. But most of all, I want to thank you for coming. Um, it's been, we couldn't have, this would have been an empty session without you. So thanks for, for coming for wherever you've come. Um, and we hope to see you again at our future events. Uh, safe journey home. Thank you.